Listen while the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. evening. This is your Rexall family druggist with a welcome from the 10,000 independent druggists who have made the word Rexall part of our own store names. We've done that because we recommend and sell the 2,000 or more drug products made by the Rexall Drug Company. Like Rexall Milk of Magnesia, for example. Here's the milk of magnesia that's so pure and creamy smooth, so free from that unpleasant earthy taste. Even children spot the difference. Ask for the Rexall milk of magnesia at Rexall drugstores everywhere. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Now your Rexall family druggist brings you a transcribed half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency. With camels who know their detectives best, it's Diamond, two to one. Ricky? I won't admit a thing. Last person who called me Ricky saw me stock in a bubblegum factory. Whole deal blew right up in my face. Ricky, this is Pat. I'm in trouble, bad trouble. Somebody steal your last name? This is Pat Stenz. Pat Stenz. An old friend of several years standing. Blonde, attractive, and the owner of a plan to eliminate cranium luster. To the aging juveniles of the world's biggest city, she might easily be called the mother protector of hairlines. In other words, like the sign says in the front of her uptown salon, she grows hair. You've just got to come down to the place. Honey, I've graduated, you told me so yourself. Another treatment and I'll be wearing a snood. Ricky, I'm on the level. I'm in trouble. Something's happened to one of my customers. What's the matter? Did he sprout feathers? Well, almost. He sprouted wings. He's dead. Now, phone games with Pat weren't a hobby. She might kid a customer about the condition of his scalp. But when she called me to say she had a corpse on her hands, I knew she hadn't been sampling her hair tonic. I told her I'd be right down, call Helen, broke my date, locked the office, set a few traps for impatient clients, and 15 minutes later, I was in Pat's office talking to a pretty frightened little blonde. Oh, Rick, I just don't know what to do. Oh, now, honey, first calm down. Now, who's dead and where? A man named Wiley. John Wiley's on the vibrating table. Why didn't you call a doctor or the police? Because I think he's been murdered. Murdered? Looks like his neck's been broken. I didn't know what to do. I was afraid of calling the police. Well, baby, if one of your customers got his neck broken in here, you're going to get mixed up with the law sooner or later anyway. The publicity will ruin my business. Honey, murder always ruins something. You got any idea who might have done it? No. Who was in the place when you discovered the body? My usual three girls and two customers. Anybody leave or come in? No. How many people know about it? Just the girls. Neither one of the customers. Oh. Well, first we lock your front door. I don't want anyone to leave. Then we'll take a look at the dead man and find out if his neck really is broken. If it is, we call homicide. We lock the front door and Pat let me down a hall with booze on either side. In two of the booze, I spotted the customers relaxing as girls in white uniforms worked on their receding foreheads. At the end of the hall, we stopped at another booth and closed by a white curtain. In there, Rick. Okay. The vibrating table was centered in the middle of the room, an enclosure about six by 14 feet. The table was built in an angle so that when a patient climbed up and stretched out on his back, his feet were elevated a good 16 inches above his head. The angle and the vibration increased the flow of blood to the scalp, and under normal conditions, it's considered very healthy. But the man lying on the table now wasn't getting the full benefit of the treatment. His shoulders extended over the end of the table, leaving his head hanging down at a grotesque angle, rolling from side to side with a monotonous rhythm of the vibration. Oh, Rick. Not very pretty, huh? I forgot to turn the table off. I think I'm going to faint. Just take it easy. Was I right? You had to be. A circus rubber man would need vulcanizing if he turned his head that far. Busted neck, all right. Guess we better call the police. 
Can you keep the customers out of here? What if one of them gets inquisitive? Tell them the table's out of order. I'm going to call homicide and tell them Mr. John Wiley's in the same condition. As frightened as she was, Pat played it pretty well. She tipped off the girls and started swapping jokes with her balding clients to keep them happy. I went in the office, put in a fast call to the 5th Precinct Homicide, and ten minutes later, Lieutenant Walt Levinson and Otis, his trained anthropoid, were looking at the late John Wiley. Sure looks like murder. I guess it would be better if he had a knife in his chest with a sign on it. Who was in the place when it happened? Pat, three girls, two customers, and a dozen assorted gay gypsies. Oh, for Pete's sake. Pete has an alibi. What was the dead man doing on the table, anyway? Trying to grow hair. Oh, that's silly. Who ever heard of anybody growing hair on a table? <laughs> Sergeant Lovelorn. Well, I thought it was pretty funny. Go out and round up everybody in the place and take them into the office. Then call the precinct and get the coroner down here. Then, if you're a good little boy, you can go out and play in the traffic. Well, a murder is a mess any way you look at it. A man lying on a table with his neck broken. Four women and two men, the only ones around when it happened. Bad publicity for a nice little working gal named Pat Stenz. But you can't hide it when it happens. Someone gets killed, someone gets hunted. And everybody concerned gets mixed up in it. Walt herded everyone into the office and the questioning started. The men were very unhappy. That bad publicity, it couldn't be helped. Mr. Robert Wells, songwriter. Look, I don't know anything about it. I never saw the man before. Surely you can't possibly suspect me. Why in the world would I want to kill him? It's ridiculous. And the other, Mr. Jacob Green, jeweler. Oh, my goodness, my head is still wet. John Wiley? I never saw him before in my life, not in my whole life. Hey, Pat, give me another towel, will you? Kill him? For why? I got a mother-in-law. First things come first. Yes. <laughs> now, you see? You see? My death I'll catch from Jersey. Yes. <laughs> two prosperous men, two prosperous denials. The girls came next. Three girls who worked for Pat. First, Mary Carroll, the girl who had worked on John Wiley. The one who had helped him up on the table and massaged his neck and forehead for five minutes. Sure, I put him on the table, but I left him, like always. We let them lie in there and relax for about ten minutes, don't we, Pat? That's right, Lieutenant. That's the way it works. Mary left him and went over to start on Mr. Wells. That's right, Lieutenant. She did. Mary's a pretty strong girl, isn't she, Mr. Wells? Yeah, she could break... Break your neck? Oh, now, wait a minute, Lieutenant. You think she could, Mr. Wells? She's pretty strong, I guess, but... You wouldn't do that. Any one of us could have gone in that back booth at one time or another, Lieutenant. You found him, didn't you, Miss Stenz? Yes. Do you usually go back to see how your customers are? Sometimes. Sometimes they go to sleep and the girl who left them is too busy with someone else, so I wake them up. Next girl, Lillian Wooster. Yes, I went back by that booth several times. Why? Wants to make Mr. Green some coffee. You're black and strong. She brung it to me. And the other times? Wants to get some hair formula later to get a clean comb. A clean comb for him? Don't laugh. I got a few left. Look, it up here on top, you see? You're fairly new here, aren't you, Lillian? Three weeks. How'd you know that, Rick? Oh, I completed my treatments last month. Lillian wasn't here then. You mean you? <laughs> now, now, now. People laugh at psychiatrists too, Walt, and some of them end up playing canasta with Lady Macbeth. Uh we were rejuvenating his spit curls. Thank you, Patricia Stenz. They've been spitting better than ever. All right, all right. You, you're the last girl. What's your name? Nancy Cummings, Lieutenant. The last girl in her story was no different than the others. Yes, she had left her customer and walked down the hall past the last booth. No, she had not slipped in and popped Mr. John Wiley's neck while he lay resting. The coroner arrived, and the whole party went down to the precinct to sign formal statements. They were then all released and sent home, pending further investigation. I took Pat home to her apartment. Don't you drink, Rick? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Water? Mm-hmm. Uh, you didn't kill him, did you, Pat? Don't be silly. He was growing hair. Kill off my advertising? Here. Thanks. You got any ideas? No. How long has John Wiley been coming to the shop? Oh, about six months. What do you know about him? Not much. He was a wolf. By your standards or Kenzie's? He got grabby occasionally. 
Put him straight. Know what business he was in? Well, whatever it was, he had a lot of money. Big tippers. Oh, excuse me. Yes? Oh, yes, just a minute, Lieutenant. See you, Rick. Thanks. Hello, Fatty. I got something on the dead man. Got a record. Blackmail. Oh? Know where he lived? We're checking. Now, wait a minute. Pat, you wouldn't by any chance know where John Wiley lived, would you? Well, I send a bill to him every month. I've got a duplicate set of books here in the apartment. I'll uh, get the address. Walt, Pat's got his address. I found something else in his personal effects. Key to a safety deposit box. Otis is checking to find out which bank. Well, we should at least have the answer by doomsday. Here's the address, Rick. John Wiley, 709 East 45th Street. <laughs> I told Walt I'd meet him in Wiley's place, down my drink, gave Pat a pat, and a half hour later, we were tearing Mr. John Wiley's apartment to pieces. Nothing. No? Well, I, uh, I at least turned up a kazoo, grab a comb and some tissue paper, and we'll do a fast course of Swanee. Hey. No tissue paper? No, here's a date calendar. Good, good. Maybe we've been working on a holiday. Uh, here's a name, Nancy. That comes after April, doesn't it? Same name on some of the other pages here. The 28th, Nancy, 6 o'clock. Again on the 22nd, Nancy, 8 o'clock. Again on the 18th and, and, and the 12th. Hey, one of the girls who works at Pat's is named Nancy. Yeah, I know it. Well, do you think we should go over and see her or sit down around a card table, hold hands and make her pop out of the wall? You know, someday I'm going to get very mad at you, Rick. Only when you find somebody prettier. Come on, Grouchy, let's go over and see Nancy Cummings. <laughs> Ah, here's her apartment. She lives with that new girl. Lenny Newster? Yeah, and stop flexing your claws. Who is it? Ah, please. Yep, open up or we'll huff and we'll puff and we'll... My, what big noises you make, Grandma. The better to scare the men out of your closet, my dear. We'd like to talk to you, Miss Cummings. Certainly, Lieutenant, come in. I was just making some lemonade. Would you like some? Oh, thanks. It's pretty hot out. Maybe you'd like something stronger? Uh, lemonade's fine. I I'm on duty. Uh, he's on duty. You better give him some torpedo juice. Miss Cummings, uh, you didn't tell us that you had dated John Wiley. Would you like your lemonade, sweet lieutenant? Uh, medium. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks. You never asked me if I dated John Wiley. The lieutenant found your name written on Wiley's date book. I've been out with him six, seven times, I think. You know what his business was? He never discussed it. Ever meet any of his friends? No. Did he ever mention any of the other girls in the shop? No, I don't think so. Hmm. You, uh, you live with Lillian Wooster, don't you? That's right. Huh? Hey, who's, uh, whose picture is that on the piano? Lillian's father. You still don't have any idea why anyone would want to kill Wiley? No. How did Lillian Wooster happen to move in with you? I asked her to. When she went to work for Pat, she was living in a terrible place. One small room. I told her she could come in with me and share the rent. Well, how well did she know John Wiley? She'd seen him at the shop, seen him here when he came to pick me up. Where's Lillian now? Shopping, I think. Well, thanks, Miss Cummings. We'll be talking with you again. More lemonade? Or later, maybe, when things start getting a little hotter. Before we continue with the adventures of Richard Diamond, private detective, here's your Rexall family druggist. Here's an important fact about Rexall aspirin I'd like you listeners to remember. It's simply this. There's no faster-acting aspirin made. Oh, but what do you mean by fast-acting? Well, ma'am, aspirin itself is too fine to hold together in tablet form, so it has to be bound with an ingredient that will quickly disintegrate, that is, break up the tablet. So the aspirin itself will immediately be free to do its job. Well, you mean the aspirin can't go to work until the tablet breaks up? Exactly. And that's why Rexall scientists developed a binder so low in moisture content, it begins to break up the very second it touches water. Now that means that when swallowed with water, the five full grains of pure aspirin in every Rexall aspirin tablet are ready to go to work for you even before they reach your stomach. Well, that's fast enough for me. And it's fast enough for 10,000 family druggists, too. Quality like that is what we're talking about when we tell you you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. And now back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, private detective starring Dick Powell. 
Three in the afternoon, out of Nancy's cool apartment and down in the blistering street. The thermometer crowding night here and the humidity sticking to us like a steaming blanket. I feel awful. A terrible day to solve a murder. Yeah. I want to go look through some newspaper files. What for? That picture on the piano. Lillian Worcester's father? Mm-hmm. I've seen that someplace before. News story connected with it. Uh, I'll drop you off. I got to get back and see if Otis has found the safety deposit box that fits John Wiley's key. Walt dropped me off at the newspaper and I went down to the morgue file to do some hunting. The air conditioning made the job easier and by four o'clock I walked into Walt's office with an interesting bit of information. We found the bank and the safety deposit box. Oh, anything turn up? Wiley was doing some pretty fancy blackmailing. Here's a bundle of evidence and a list of names. Mm-hmm. Well, I can understand why someone would pay to keep these out of circulation. Lousy photography. Uh, what did you find out? Well, here. Newspaper clippings. Mm-hmm. Oh. Picture of Lillian Wister's father. Same picture as the, the one on the piano. Ah, prominent banker leaps to death. William Baker. William Baker? The girl's name is Worcester. That's what she calls herself. William Baker. Give me that list we got out of the deposit box. I've just been looking at it. William Baker's name is on here, all right. That clipping I just gave you mentions that he left a daughter and a wife. Well, let's go pick up Lillian Worcester or Baker or whatever her name is. Well, it might not have meant a thing, but at least we had found one person who had a strong connection with John Wiley other than socially. The girl who called herself Lillian Wooster was the daughter of one William Baker, deceased, and one of John Wiley's blackmail victims. We climbed to the squad car and hurried back to Nancy Cummings' apartment where Lillian Wooster lived as roommate. Let's go. Hey, hey, wait a minute. What's wrong? Hold it. Lillian Wooster coming out of the building. All right, we pick her up on the street. Uh, the doorman's hailing a cab for her. Let's see where she's going. Wouldn't it be easier to just ask her? Oh, stop trying to ruin my afternoon. There's nothing more relaxing than a pleasant drive through quiet, peaceful little old Manhattan. We started tailing Lillian Wooster's cab across town, along the river, and across the George Washington Bridge. She's headed for Jersey. Ah, oh, you looked at your compass. That's not fair. We kept going through Hackensack, past the outskirts, and on out Route 17. Pretty expensive cab ride. Pretty expensive. It makes it pretty important. We kept following like that. Lillian's cab a good quarter of a mile ahead, so she wouldn't notice us. They're turning off on that road. Oh, you're absolutely amazing, Fatty. I probably would have missed it completely. Oh! We took the road to the right off the highway and spotted the cab up ahead, pulling into the entrance of a large white building. The sign over the tall iron gate read, Woodview Sanitarium. She's getting out of the cab and going in. Uh, wait till she gets inside. Then let's go up there and find out who Lillian Wooster is visiting in the Woodview Sanitarium. Yeah? Something I can do for you? I'm looking for a girl. You know, honey, something that doesn't look like a man. Now you stay out of this, Diamond. Don't you start getting me confused again. He gets confused? At the drop of a hat. Watch, I'll drop my hat. Now, you stop that. He doesn't like it, does he? Oh, it nearly drives him with... <clears throat> now, you, you understand. Yes, of course. Where are you going? I think you better talk with Dr. Gerson. All right, run him out. Temper, 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 temper. Rick, I swear, if you don't stop these confounded routines... Routines? Well, you know what I'm talking about. Who's on first base? Oh, don't you know who's on first? Huh? I'm Dr. Gerson. Uh, my friend here is given to uh, mass demonstrations in the aisle. Oh, shut up, Rick. I'm Lieutenant Levinson. I'll bet you're with the cavalry. You get wise with me, Mac, and I'll bust you one. Extreme persecution complex ever since Uncle Julius took away his mandolin. Well, we have some lovely mandolins here, Lieutenant. I am Lieutenant Levinson, New York Police. Now, 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 it's more fun in the cavalry. Maybe you'd think it was more fun in a cell. Well, it's wonderful. We have some very nice ones. Let me show you. Now, listen, I am Lieutenant Levinson, New York Police, 5th Precinct Homicide. And if you don't lay off this foolishness to help me, I'll tear you limb from limb. I'll get some help. You won't get anybody. Get away from that phone. Look, I I, I think you better uh, let him tell you why he's here. Will it calm him down? I'm here trying to catch a girl. 
a wreck. That's right. He's here trying to catch a girl. Certainly. Why don't we all try and catch one? Look, would you do me a favor, friend? Why, of course, Lieutenant. Take a look at those credentials. Certainly. Oh, my goodness. I'm afraid he's a real policeman. I need no help from you, Mr. Diamond. Grouchy. Oh, my goodness. Satisfied? Well, yes. Aren't you a little out of your territory, Lieutenant? I am not making an arrest. <laughs> Just trying to catch a girl. I am following a girl. She may be a murderer. She came in here a few minutes you ago. You mean Miss Baker? Then Baker is her right name? Who's she seeing? Her mother. What's wrong with her mother? Mrs. Baker is seriously ill. Have anything to do with her husband's suicide? Everything to do with it? I doubt Mrs. Baker will ever recover. <laughs> We went back out to the car and tried to put it all together. Lillian's father had jumped off a roof. He was being blackmailed and couldn't take it. The shock had driven Mrs. Baker into a permanent breakdown. And John Wiley had been responsible for the whole thing. Motive enough for Lillian to get a job with Pat Sten so she could get her hands on John Wiley's neck. We waited until Lillian's cab turned out of the driveway and headed back for New York. We stayed close watched her get off at her apartment. Then we went over to see Pat Stenz. You going to get a hair treatment tomorrow, Rick? That's right, honey. I, I want you to be sure that Lillian takes care of me. Did she do it, Rick? I, uh, I think so. But why? You seem like such a nice girl. Well, she had a pretty good reason. But we need a confession, and Rick's got an idea how to get it. I want Lillian working on me through the whole treatment, especially when I get on the vibrating table. Your scalp looks pretty good, Mr. Diamond. Oh, it's been itching a little. Uh huh. Losing any? Mm, some. Hi. Oh, uh, hello, Pat. His hair looks pretty good, Miss Stan. Let's see. Hmm. Um, use both solutions. Okay. I'll see you later, Red. Nice girl, Pat. Very nice. Have you found out anything about Mr. Wiley's death? Oh, the police have gone to see our news. The lieutenant wants to see your roommate. As you told me. I hope you don't suspect her. She rather liked Mr. Wiley. She wouldn't have any reason to kill him. All right. Let's go down to the uh, other booth. Huh? You mean uh, you're going to stick me on that vibrating table? Not if you don't want to. Well, full treatment. That's what I came here for. Let's go. <laughs> you don't mind going in there, do you? No. Why should I? Oh, some people are funny about rooms where a murder's been committed. It doesn't bother me, Mr. Diamond. Give him a good rub and let him relax for about ten minutes, Lily. Yes, Miss Dins. All right, up on your back. Uh, Side down a little, please. Uh, all right, yeah. Okay. Uh, what did you do before you went to work for Pat, Lillian? Oh, not much. Went to school... Finally decided to look for a job and found this one. Ever study this sort of thing? No, there's really not much to it. Pat shows us how to wash, apply the formulas, and rub the neck and shoulders. And all you need is a strong pair of arms, huh? I guess so. Your family live in New York? No. Oh, I noticed the picture of your father on Nancy's piano. A fine-looking man. He's dead now. Sorry. Oh, my. Mother still living? No. Oh, wow. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. Am I rubbing too hard? No, it's okay. It's okay. Well, you've got the strength for the job. Did the police find out anything about Mr. Wiley? Yeah. Uh, he was a blackmailer. Ouch. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. I'm a little nervous today. Maybe I'd better get one of the other girls. No, 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 no. no. That's okay. I'm just, just a little tied up. Next step. Yeah. Try to relax. I guess I keep thinking about Wiley and his broken neck. Think I might break yours, Mr. Diamond? Well, it wouldn't be hard. If I was good and relaxed, you could snap it in a minute. I guess I could. So Mr. Wiley was a blackmailer? Yeah. I had a record. They're the foulest people on earth. They certainly are. You think he was blackmailing someone here in the shop? Oh, not... Not necessarily. Well, if he wasn't, then no one in the shop would have a motive for killing him. 
Well, I've got a theory about that. I think someone in the shop hated him so much they waited until no one is looking and the girl was out of this booth. And they slipped in on him and twisted his neck until it broke. Why would they hate him that much if he wasn't blackmailing them? Oh, somebody else he might have blackmailed. Someone very close and dear to the killer. Maybe the person while he was blackmailing couldn't stand it and committed suicide. Interesting theory. Take your family, for instance. Ouch. Sorry. You aren't relaxing. Uh, supposing Wiley was blackmailing a member of your family, your father, for instance. I can't rub your neck unless you relax more. Maybe your father couldn't take him. Maybe he couldn't pay him anymore. Instead of disgracing his family, he committed suicide. Just turn your head a little to the side, Mr. Diamond. Uh, better. Much. Well, if that happened to my family, Mr. Diamond, I guess I'd kill Mr. Wiley and not mind it a bit. Think of the shark. I even put the wife in a sanitarium. It probably would. Uh, how did your father die, Lillian? He jumped off the roof. Now, if you'll turn your head a little more, I'll try to pop your vertebra. Uh, we followed you out to Jersey yesterday, Lillian. I'm going to adjust your neck, Mr. Diamond. It's better if you relax so it won't hurt. Well, if you wanted to, you could pop it anyway. I couldn't stop you in time. I don't guess you could. There. Now the other side. No. Uh, did you kill John Wiley? Yes. Relax. All right, Mr. John. Let's go down to the police station. <laughs> Again, here's your Rexall family druggist. If you're looking for a way to save money on drugstore needs, buy Rexall MI-31, the triple action antiseptic that makes an ideal mouthwash, a soothing gargle, and an effective breath deodorant. What's more, Rexall gives you a full pint of this quality product at the same price as other leading brands of smaller quantity. Ask for Rexall MI-31 at any Rexall drugstore. And remember... You can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and is written by Blake Edwards with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. Featured in tonight's cast were Mary Jane Croft, Ted DeCorsia, Wilms Herbert, Virginia Gregg, B. Benaderet, and Larry Dobkin. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Bill Foreman inviting you to be with us next Wednesday at this time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. <laughs> Hiya, beautiful. Get lost, Bristlepuss. You need a shave. But I have shaved. What else do you want me to do? Silly boy, she wants you to go stag. Go stag? But why? Because stag is Rexall's exclusive line of men's good grooming aids, like stag brushless shave cream. No fuss, no massage, just smooth it on and presto, you get a clean, close shave. Your face stays smooth and whiskerless all day long. I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll... Go Stag. That's it. Join the Stag line now at Rexall drugstores everywhere. Yes, to make girls care. Go Stag. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Listen while the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective.
evening. This is your Rexall family druggist with a welcome from the 10,000 independent druggists who have made the word Rexall part of our own store names. We've done that because we recommend and sell the 2,000 or more drug products made by the Rexall Drug Company, like Rexall Mineral Oil, for example. This is the mineral oil specially refined for extra heavy body. What's more, Rexall Mineral Oil is tasteless, odorless, colorless, non-irritating, and non-habit forming. Quality like that is what we family druggists are talking about when we tell you you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Now your Rexall family druggist brings you a transcribed half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Oh, pardon me. Huh? You know where I might find Mr. Richard Diamond? You want to hire him? Yes. Well, stop being so bashful, friend. Come in, come in. Thank you. You're Mr. Diamond? Well, any resemblance to the Irish washerwoman is purely intentional. Do you always do your own laundry? Always. Keeps my petty cash from looking too petty. Sit down, Mr. Uh... Baxter. Clay Baxter from Oak Mulgee, Oklahoma. Clay Baxter from Oak Mulgee, Oklahoma. Was a man, I guess, to be in his early 50s. Straight up, he crowded six foot three, counting the two-inch heels on his handmade boots. Looking at him, I thought of an old Remington print and suddenly felt like singing a chorus of Home on the Range. I'd like you to come to Oak Mulgee with me, Mr. Diamond. Well, why, Mr. Baxter? My brother was killed yesterday. The sheriff and the coroner said it was an accident. I don't believe it. How did you happen to look me up? I raise cattle, Mr. Diamond. I do a great deal of business in Chicago and New York. I wanted a detective with experience, someone with a good reputation. Bless you. I called a friend on Wall Street, and he recommended several men. One of them was you. I checked your background. I'm satisfied. Oh, good. I charge 100 a day in expenses. Chicken feed. I'll pay it, and if you catch the man who done it, I'll give you a $1,000 bonus. Oh, well, now, I, I can't leave right away. It'll take me at least five minutes to get my affairs in order. <laughs> Yeah, I can certainly see you appreciate a buck. <laughs> Mr. Baxter, I appreciate a buck like a Texan appreciates Texas. Texas? Never heard of him. How was your brother supposed to have been killed? Thrown from his horse, skull fracture. And you don't believe it? I do not. Why? Too good a horseman. Well, it could have happened. Well, if it did, he'd have taken the fall right. Might have busted something, but wouldn't have killed him. Anything else? His wife. My brother was a wealthy man, Mr. Diamond. His wife will inherit everything. Ranch, cattle, all worth about eight or ten million. You think she had something to do with his death? You tell me, Mr. Diamond. I called Helen, told her I was off to Oak Mulgee. Promised I'd send her a couple of Navajos or whatever they had out there. Then I took Clay Baxter over to my flat and threw a few things into a suitcase. <coughs> Oklahoma's dry. So is Richard Diamond. Might get arrested. Oh, I don't want to leave it here. Wouldn't make any difference if it was empty, would it? No. Got a couple of glasses? A fifth usually adds up to a full evening, but that's only when Clay Baxter isn't around. When he poured one for the road, the water line receded six inches. I had a quick one, and he finished it. <sighs> How'd that soldier? How do you feel? Oh, so lively. Why don't we forget the plane? You just start running for the window and I'll climb on. <laughs> Oak Mulgee, Oklahoma. Population 17,091, according to the last census, and very hot in August. Baxter's station wagon's waiting at the airport, and the driver took us into town where I was introduced to the local law. This here is Sheriff Billings. How are you, Sheriff? Jim, this is Mr. Diamond. He's a private detective from New York. Howdy, Diamond. Howdy. Private detective, huh? Oh, I've been called other things. Still ain't satisfied, huh, Clay? Not yet. And you ain't either, and you know it, Jim. How about it, Sheriff? You think Mr. Baxter's brother was killed deliberately? Coroner says it was an accident. Hit his head on a rock. That ain't what Mr. Diamond asked. Well, Will Baxter was a pretty good rider, but he could have been thrown. Yeah, I don't... All the evidence says he was. Could see plain where his horse bolted. What could have made his horse shy? Snake, maybe. Not that horse, and you know it, Jim. Well, maybe he stepped in a chuck hole. He was limping right bad when he got back to the barn. No signs of anyone else near the body? 
Well, when I got there, some of Will's boys had already ridden out. Who found him? A couple old miners. Luke and Phineas Merriweather. Well, let's go out to the ranch, Mr. Baxter, and take another look at the spot where your brother died. Will Baxter's ranch is 40 miles from here, Mr. Diamond. Maybe you'd like to go out to my place and freshen up a bit first. <laughs> You go ahead and shave and shower. I'm going to go build me a drink. Hey, this is quite a place, Mr. Baxter. I'm glad you like it. Take a swim in the pool if you'd want, but watch out for the catfish. Catfish? I, I'm a bachelor. Don't use the pool much, and I don't usually have guests. Love catfish for dinner, so I keep them in the pool. I caught a guy once floating bodies in his bathtub. You don't say. Funny, Harvey. <laughs> I showered and shaved and met Baxter out by the pool where he was feeding his catfish. I watched a pound of liver disappear like leachy nuts in the tongue war. And we all headed back to town where we picked up Sheriff Billings. Forty miles later, we pulled up in front of the late Will Baxter's ranch. A little different architecture, but just as impressive as my clients. Afternoon, Sheriff. Oh, Wilma. Afternoon, Wilma. Wilma, this here is Mr. Richard Diamond. Wilma Baxter, my brother's wife. How do you do? How do you do, Mr. Diamond? Private detective. Come up from New York. Oh? Well, why don't we all go in the house? It's too hot out here. Uh, Mr. Diamond wants to go out and look at the spot where Will got himself killed. Certainly. Have one of the boys fix you up with some horses. When you're done, why not stop back for dinner? Uh, Mr. Diamond's eating with me, and he's going to be pretty busy for a while. Now, I'll give you a rain check, Mr. Diamond. Oh, uh, thank you. I'd like you to tell me about New York. It's been a long time, and I've almost forgotten what it's like. Let's go, Jim. It's getting late. Bye, Mr. Diamond. Nice meeting you. Goodbye, Mrs. Baxter. Seems all broken up, don't she? Yeah. Where was she when her husband got killed? Perfect alibi. In town all day. A lot of people saw her. Mighty fine-looking woman. Mighty. We all rode down to the stables, and one of the hands saddled up three horses, and we started out across the open desert. For a man who had spent all his life riding around in taxi cabs, the experience was just short of agonizing. Just up ahead, Diamond. Swell. Never rode much, did you? No, I always bounce like this. I like to make my money belt jingle. <laughs> well, here it is. Whoa. Yeah, whoa. Oh. Well, here's where they found the body. Now, uh, uh, what did he hit his head on? That rock right there. Mm-hmm. Did you take an impression of the wound to see if it matched? Nope. Well, why not? Never thought about it. Well, that's a pretty good reason. Anyway, let's dig that rock out and take it back with us. I spent the next minutes limping around, looking for something, and came up with nothing except a longing for a hot Epsom salts bath. We dug up the large rock and took it back with us to Wilma Baxter's ranch. Ooh. Oh, 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 hey. oh, 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 Howdy, Sheriff. Howdy, Frank. This here's Mr. Diamond, Frank. Diamond, this is Frank Kelly, the ranch foreman. Howdy. Detective fella, huh? Miss Baxter told me about you. Said you was doing some investigating. Yes, sir. Scientific investigation. The way the city boys do it. What you going to do with that raw? A hopscotch. Oh, uh, on second thought, I I think we'll take turns untying the knots in my back. Good warm shower and you'll feel fit as a fiddle. Well, I got a good start. I'm shaped like one. You'll find it a little bit rough out here, Diamond. Oh, I'll get used to it, Mr. Kelly. I hope you're right. Ain't much like the big city. Oh? Just what is the big city like, Mr. Kelly? I ain't never been there. Just what I've noticed. Looks like a man can get pretty soft living in the city. Mm, Well, I'd like to show you where I was brought up sometime, Mr. Kelly. We never got around to playing cowboy, though. We were too busy kicking each other's teeth out. See you later, Mr. Baxter. So long, sir. I I don't think Frank likes you, Diamond. Uh, What about Will Baxter's horse? I can take a look at him. Right over there in that stall. Really pulled up lame. Oh, good horse. Never figured to shy at anything. Man, look at that. His hip swollen. Yeah, he really twisted something. <laughs> Steady, boy. Steady. Hey, that looks like an infection. 
Yeah, the funny thing, it kind of does. What are you getting at, Mr. Diamond? Oh, I'm not getting into thing, Mr. Baxter. I just said it looked like an infection. Yeah, we better tell Mrs. Baxter or Frank. Have someone take care of it. Tell me, uh, boys, if you jabbed a horse with something, would that make him bolt? Come on, I want to get back to town and talk with the coroner. Before we continue with the adventures of Richard Diamond, private detective, here's your Rexall family druggist. Last week, a customer said to me, I wish I knew some way to be sure I'm getting enough vitamins. Some way that's easy, yes, and inexpensive, too. Why, ma'am, millions of people have found the way to do that. They take Rexall plenamins. Plenamins? Rexall's popular multivitamin capsules. Just two plenamins a day give you more than your minimum daily requirement of every vitamin for which such requirements have been established. Well, you can't expect much more than that. Yet plenamins do give you more than that, for they also contain valuable liver concentrate and iron, plus other factors of the vitamin B complex. Say, they must be expensive. On the contrary, ma'am. Rexall plenamins cost you only a few pennies per day. Ask for plenamins at Rexall drugstores everywhere, and remember... You can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. And now back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Now, look here, Jim. Ain't my word good enough? Why, sure it is, Coroner, but Clay hired Mr. Diamond to do some investigating, and he's doing it. Clay, I tell you, your brother died from natural causes. Uh, I don't think so. But if you insist, I'll show this detective fella the body. I want the head wound matched with this rock. Okay, but the mortuary ain't gonna like it. They got him all ready to bury. The coroner led me across the street and into a funeral parlor where I took a look at the late Will Baxter. Six years with the fifth precinct homicide and a couple of dozen killings should have conditioned me. But like always, the first look shakes something loose in the middle of my stomach and I have to keep swallowing hard. Looks right natural, don't he, Clay? Yeah. They do a good job here. Uh, bully for them. And he hit his head right here. Concussion, plain and simple. No other marks or bruises? Nope. While the coroner rolled the late Will Baxter into one of the back rooms and made a comparison with the head wound and the rock we'd brought in from the ranch, we went out on the front porch for some air. I lit a cigarette and thought about an old case I'd worked on five or six years before. You got a cigarette? Sure, Doc. Picayuni, all right? Hmm. Funny thing. Head wound doesn't match the rock. Sure doesn't. Mm. Wound is too deep. Rock's round and flat. Nothing sticking up to go that deep. Then I want an autopsy. Why? Fracture still killed him? I doubt it. When someone plans a murder, they don't count on one blow to do the trick. Bet there's nothing else that could have done it. Nothing you can see. I've met someone here in Okmulgee that I'm pretty sure is wanted for another killing very similar to this. Now, Doc, go make that autopsy and fast. You think maybe you found something, Diamond? You you think Will was killed deliberately? Maybe, but we'll have to wait for the autopsy. In the meantime, I'd like to go out and visit those two old-timers. Luke and Phineas? That's right, Sheriff. Well, it's my dangerous. Come on, I'll take you out. Uh, You better wait here for the report. Mr. Baxter and I will go on out. All right, you can use my horses, so you won't have to go all the way back to the ranch. Horses? Well, the Merriweather is on the other side of town, not oh. about ten miles, no road. Oh, horses, ten miles. I mean, never play kick the can again. <laughs> You don't take the horses, do you, Diamond? Uh, uh, maybe if you could find me a nice long ten one. <laughs> Holy Ike. Whoa, 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 Stephanie. That's one of the Merryweathers. Well, let's get out of here. Come on, horse. Now, come on, I'm yellow, and I admit it. Now, it's, it's okay, Diamond. That's just the boy's way of letting you know not to come any farther, unless they say so. Oh, swell greetings. What happens now? Hey, up there. Luke, in here. What you want? It's Clay Baxter. I got a friend here who wants to talk to you. In here? Yeah, Luke? Hey, Baxter, got some friend who wants to palaver. I don't feel like palavering. Better shoot him. Giddy up. Just, just take it easy. Take it easy. They always act like this. 
Henny don't want to belabor. I gotta shoot you if you don't promote. It's important. About my brother. Henny? Yeah, Luke. About his brother, the digging we found the other day. Oh. All right, I guess. Let one of them come up. Thanks, sir. Yeah, Luke. Send your friend on up. And up I went, leaving my better judgment running off across the desert. I climbed a small hill and found myself standing at the entrance of an old mine shaft. Luke and Phineas and Merriweather stood on either side, shotguns ready, pointed right at my chest. Start talking. Well, uh, uh, gentlemen, my, my name is Diamond. Don't pay no import to names. What do you want? Just wanted to ask some questions about the man you found the other day. You a policeman? Well, kind of. Shoot him. Oh, now, 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 wait a minute. I'm not a real policeman. Then what are you? I'm a, I'm a private detective. Luke? Yeah. What's the matter? It's an honest profession. A fellow's got to make a living. You a real live private detective? Well, I'm a private detective. The real live part I'm depending on. Well, my goodness gracious. Come on in, have some vittles. Huh? Why, mister... Me and Finney read all them stories about you fellas. Uh huh. We filled up one whole tunnel with old detective magazines. You fellas really are something. Wait a minute. What's wrong? Let's see your badge. Oh, oh, yeah. Sure, sure. There you are. Oh, yes, sir. Well, I'll be dogged. Come on in, friend. Come on in. in. I'd like to ask you some questions about this here Dick Tracy fella. Well, one minute I'd face two shotguns, and the next I was turned into an honored guest. I had coffee and biscuits with Luke and Phineas, and answered enough questions about the private detective business to fill a dime novel of my own. I squeezed in enough questions to find out that the boys hadn't seen or found anything unusual when they discovered Will Baxter's body. Four cups of coffee and a dozen biscuits later, I bid the Merry Weathers a fond farewell and return to Clay Baxter. They loved you? Oh, worshipped me. Hmm. They're starting a Richard Diamond fan club. Well, did you find out anything? No. Uh, well, give me your hand. I'll help you up on your horse. Oh, couldn't I just walk back? Come on, horse. Hold still. Steady, boy. <laughs> Clay Baxter, sitting in his saddle, had leaned down and grabbed my hand to help me up on my horse, and that was when he got it. His horse took out with the wounded man still up and hanging on. I booted my horse in the ribs. Oh! <laughs> I took off after Baxter like citation on a good day. I closed my eyes, prayed a little, and tried to remember every jockey I'd ever seen before. Suddenly, I looked up and spotted Baxter's horse dead ahead, standing still and right in my path. Whoa! If I don't die from this bullet I got in me, I'm going to do it from laughing. <laughs> How is he, Doc? Oh, he'll be all right. Bullet went clean through just under the collarbone. Didn't break anything. How do you feel, Mr. Diamond? Uh, crippled. Any idea who shot Clay? No. Clay said he thought it might have been the Merriweather boys. Oh, uh, I, I, no, it couldn't have been. Why not? Well, the Merriweather boys use shotguns, not rifles. What about that autopsy, Doc? Well, come on, what about it? You was right. Will Baxter didn't die from a skull fracture. What was it? You don't know what was used for sure. A long, thin instrument. Whoever did it pulled the lower eyelid down, killed Will Baxter by jabbing something through the eye into his brain. Probably hit him over the head to knock him off the horse and then got down and made sure. And then jabbed his horse in the flank to make him bolt. Nasty way to kill him, man. That's well, been done before. Not a man's way of killing. Wilma Baxter was in town all day. When Clay comes around, tell him I borrowed his station wagon. Going out to see Wilma? Going out to her ranch. I want to take another look at Will Baxter's lame horse. And, Doc, I want to borrow a pair of surgical probes. I climbed into the station wagon. Close to an hour later, I pulled up on the side of the road. The gate to the ranch house was another hundred yards up ahead. 
So I piled out, climbed the tall white fence, and slipped into the barn. <laughs> Steady, fella. Steady. Steady. The horse's left flank was still swollen, very close to a serious infection. I ran my hand over the spot. <laughs> Steady, boy. There was something still stuck in the flesh, so I used the surgical probes and prayed the horse wouldn't kick my brains out. Oh, oh. Steady, boy. Steady. There. Sorry, fellow. I didn't know you were a vet, Mr. Diamond. Huh? Oh, good evening, Mrs. Baxter. You know, in this part of the country, you can get shot for horse stealing. Oh, not stealing. Just taking this out of your horse's flank. What is it? That's a piece of a long needle. Might be a hat pen or something. I think you'd better tell me what this is all about. Oh, certainly. Your, uh, your husband was murdered. That's impossible. Uh, suit yourself, but he was. Somebody hit him over the head, knocked him from his horse, jabbed this needle into his eye, then jabbed it into the horse's flank so the horse would pull up lame, look like he'd shied. The killer tried to shoot me this evening, but he missed and got Clay Baxter instead. And who do you think did this? I don't know. The method doesn't fit a man. A woman, then? Well, the blow on the back of the head rules out a woman. Too much force. What have you got left? What I started with. A man. And a woman. Very interesting theory. Mm-hmm. You're uh, from New York, aren't you? I've been there. I thought so. Your face is familiar. I haven't been in New York in at least ten years, Mr. Diamond. Oh, funny. Well, I've got to go out to the Merriweathers. With those two old miners who found my husband? Mm-hmm. They saw the murderer. What? Yeah, that's why I know how it was done. I was out there earlier, and I've got to go back after a sworn statement. Well, why didn't they speak up before this? Afraid. Said it was none of their business. See you later, Mrs. Baxter. Have another biscuit, Inspector. Uh, uh, no thanks, fellas. Ten's plenty. Uh, so, uh, Will Baxter was murdered, huh? That's right, and Mrs. Baxter thinks you two saw who did the killing. Gonna lay a trap, huh? Yes, Luke, gonna lay a trap. Mm. Now, look, I remembered Mrs. Baxter from someplace the first time I saw her. Then when I found out how the murder was committed, I recalled a case very similar back in New York. Man was hit over the head, pushed down a flight of stairs, and his brain pierced by a hat pin. A man actually did it, but a woman planned it. The man was caught, but uh, the woman disappeared. Why'd they do it? Uh, the victim was insured. They wanted to make it look like an accident. Ah, uh, come on, we better spread out. We should have company pretty soon. The two old-timers took off their coats and gave me some beat-up pants, which I stuffed with pillows and blankets. In five minutes flat, I had two dummies sitting with me at the little table. You think they'll fall for it? Well, you can't tell, but uh, you two go on outside and wait until somebody comes in. I just want him to try for one of the dummies. Well, what if he tries for you? Killjoy. Luke and Phineas took their place outside the mine, and I smoked a dozen cigarettes, and then I heard someone coming in, moving quietly up the tunnel toward the light. I played it big. Well, that's, uh, that's fine, Phineas, uh, now, if you'll just sign this statement. I rolled, and the dummy that represented Phineas Merriweather doubled over from the force of the slug. He shot again, and Luke's dummy toppled. I kicked the lamp out before he got around to yours truly. Two down and one to go, Diamond. I'm afraid I got a big surprise for you, friend. I ain't worried. You should be. There wasn't even close. You're a lousy shot. Yeah. You missed earlier this evening and got Clay Baxter instead. I'll make up for it. No, you won't, friend. Drop it. Uh -oh, uh -oh. You heard him, drop it. Oh, okay, all right, don't you? Wait a minute. Well, I get the light. Yeah. Well, hey, it's a Kelly fella. Yeah, you're getting way out of line for a ranch foreman, Kelly. <laughs> Give it to him, Mr. Diamond. Who had you kill Will Baxter? You know, Kelly, you said something today about getting soft in the city. Wonder just how soft I've gotten. Maybe you'd like to find out. Turn him loose, boys. Yes, sir. Go on now. Go to it, Mr. Diamond. I don't like getting shot at. It It makes me real unhappy when anyone runs around killing people. No, uh, oh, go on. Stop him, Gordon. Shut up, Finney, and let him fight. Oh, Gordon, stop him. Now, now, Kelly. 
Why'd you kill Will Baxter? Well, my Baxter talked me into it, promised me a share of the ranch. And for that, you killed a man, huh? It's a big ranch. Now, get up. Sure hate to see you leave, Mr. Diamond. I hate to go myself, boys. Love them biscuits. Hmm, maybe we'll get up and see you in New York sometime. Hey, Kelly's coming, too. Hmm? Doesn't like being tied to his horse like that, I guess. Then, eh? Uh, yeah, Duke? Fellas coming, too. Hit him with something. <laughs> sure. Again, here's your Rexall family druggist. I often think there's no common ailment quite so distressing as acid stomach. And there's certainly no relief for it quite as fast and effective as Bismarex. This famous Rexall antacid often neutralizes excess acidity within one minute. And the scientifically balanced ingredients of Bismarex work in sequence, easing gastric distress and leaving a soothing protective covering on irritated stomach membranes. Yes, Bismarex gives relief that's not only quick, but continuous and prolonged. Ask your Rexall druggist for Bismarex. He'll tell you you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and is written by Blake Edwards with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. Featured in tonight's cast were Hal March, Arthur Q. Bryan, Virginia Gregg, Barton Yarborough, Wilms Herbert, and Wally Mayer. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Bill Foreman inviting you to be with us next Wednesday at this time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hiya, beautiful. Get lost, Bristlepuss. You need a shave. But I have shaved. What else do you want me to do? Silly boy, she wants you to go stag. Go stag? But why? Because stag is Rexall's exclusive line of men's good grooming aids, like stag brushless shave cream. No fuss, no massage, just smooth it on, and presto, you get a clean, close shave. Your face stays smooth and whiskerless all day long. I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll... Go stag. That's it. Join the stag line now at Rexall drugstores everywhere. Yes. To make girls care, go stag. Next week, both Groucho Marx and Bob Hope will be back on NBC. Listen while the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. This is your Rexall family druggist speaking to you for the 10,000 independent druggists who have made the word Rexall part of our own store names and who recommend and sell the 2,000 or more drug products made by the Rexall Drug Company, like Rexall MI-31, for example, Rexall's popular and versatile mouthwash, gargle, and breath deodorant. Full-strength MI-31 kills contacted germs almost instantly, 
yet will not harm the delicate membranes of the mouth and throat. Ask for Rexall MI-31 at Rexall drugstores everywhere. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Now your Rexall family druggist brings you a transcribed half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency, I'll help you out if you're in trouble, but if it's a murder, it'll cost you double. Oh, hello, Helen, baby. What's new with the wealthy? Not much. Only we had a date last night, remember? Well, did we have fun? Oh, no. Only we'd had more fun if you'd shown up. Now, Helen, don't overestimate me. I don't. Oh. Look, honey, I am sorry about last night. Sat up with a sick aunt, you know. Tender. Well, don't you believe me? No. Expect me to? No. Then we're even. Hmm. Well, and I hate people who hold grudges. You busy tonight? Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Huh? Doing what? Oh, I'll probably end up listening to some idiot play the piano. Oh. Anyone I know? Maybe. He's a little boy who never grew out of the cops and robbers stage. Oh, yes. The good-looking one. He's the co- Uh-oh. Client just walked in. I'll call you back and squirm later. Bye. Diamond? In the rough. What can I do for you? You seen the morning papers? One of the funnies. Seen the story on page two? Hey, what are you, a traveling quiz show? Look at it. Hmm. Pete Rocco broke out of prison. That's right. You sent Pete up for murder. He always said he'd get out and take care of you. Gee, I wish I hadn't cut my fingernails. I got nothing to chew. You better find something. Pete's a nasty little boy. Hmm. Well, what's all this to you? My name's Danny. Danny Rocco. I'm Pete's brother. Oh. Looking for a piece of cheese? I found one. Get your hat, Shamus. There was a bulge in Danny's coat pocket that hadn't come with a suit. Believing in the safety first slogan, I picked up my hat and was led to a car outside. We drove through town and then the Mulberry Street near Five Points to the section that used to be the heart of the city. We stopped in front of a cigar store. Okay, Diamond, get out. Oh, it's so comfortable here. Come on, move. Well, if you put it that way. Hmm, the Rocco Smoke Shop. Yeah, it's mine. Bet you sell opium. In the back, behind those curtains. That's far enough. Ma! Hey, Ma! I'm right here, Daniel. You know I don't like shouting. Standing in the doorway was a little gray-haired old lady with a sweet, tired smile on her face. If this was Pete Rocco, he wore quite of his guys. You just a diamond? I've given up a denying it. Sit down, please. Daniel, stop looking mean. Go outside and tend the shop. Oh. Daniel. Uh, okay, Ma. Well, now I've seen everything. Daniel's is a good boy, Mr. Diamond, but one must be stern at times. Oh, yes, one must. You're probably wondering why I sent Daniel to bring you here. Well, I have thought about it between prayers. Mr. Diamond, I tried to raise my boys the best I could. Peter and Daniel had every chance for success, but Peter failed me. He killed a man. Go on. I trained my boys to be pickpockets. That was during their school days, of course. Oh, yes, of course. Later, I take them to a nice, tidy little bookmaking business. Like any mother, I wanted to keep them away from violence. Oh, uh, very thoughtful. Mrs. Diamond, I've known crime and criminals all my life. My husband was an immigrant. A criminal killed in a gang war. It's the only life I could teach them, but Peter failed me. Peter turned to murder. Uh, Mrs. Rocco, this is very interesting, but why was I brought here? I'm getting to that. Please be patient. I'm sorry. You see, as long as my boys stuck to bookmaking, I was happy. I was proud of them. But when Peter killed that man, yeah, he failed me. Uh, you said that before. Yes, yeah, so I did. 
Mr. Diamond, you're the one who sent Peter to prison. Police couldn't catch him, but you did. I want you to send my boy back where he belongs. Behind bars. I see. I'll pay you use your fee. If he was out long, he might kill another man. I couldn't stand that. I don't hold with violence, Mr. Diamond. There was a sad look on her face as she pushed the buzzer beside her chair. She was a proud little thing, but you could see the hurt in her eyes when she spoke of Pete. She was determined to have him put back in prison. After all, she'd only raised him to be a pickpocket. Ah, oh, this modern generation... Absolutely no regard for their parents. You ring for me, Ma? Daniel, drive Mr. Diamond back to town. I'll watch the shop. Oh, dear. You haven't said that you would take the job, have you, Mr. Diamond? Ma would like for you to, Shamus. <coughs> well, I... Uh... Thank you so much. Daniel, you're looking mean again. Danny drove me downtown. Instead of going to my office, I went to the 5th precinct where I found Sergeant Otis laboring over a crossword puzzle. Poor Otis. He couldn't find a four-letter word for something that swims, even if you hit him in the face with a herring. Well, hello, brainchild. What? Oh, you. Clapper as always, I see. Shamus, why don't you dig a hole and jump in it? And disturb your wormy relatives? Oh, perish the thought. Get lost. My, I'd be touchy today. Well, can't you see I'm working a puzzle? See it? Yes. Believe it. Well, that's another matter. Have but work on it, genius. I'm going to see Walt. Oh. Good afternoon, Lieutenant Levinson. My, you look impressive with your feet on the desk. Saving shoe leather. Rick, where have you been? I called you 50 times this morning. Well, I've been chatting with a very pleasant little lady. Mm, blonde or brunette? Neither. Her hair was gray. Well, for you, that's a switch. But boy, you better go in hiding for a while. Pete Rocco is out of prison. Yeah, so I heard. Is that why you called me? Right. Rocco said he'd get you, and he's not the type to kid. He'll be looking for you, Rick. Well, that's just Andy, Walt, because I'll be looking for him. What? I've got a client who wants Rocco back behind bars. Any idea where he is? Uh, not much to go on. He's here in town somewhere, that's for sure. Well, why do you say that? Well, remember that role he took from that bookie before he plugged him? Mm -hmm. More than 50,000 bucks. He never would tell where he hid it. Oh, yeah. You think he'll hang around long enough to dig it up and then go south, huh? That's how it looks to me. On the other hand, you might contact one of his old cronies here to get the dough and meet him somewhere else. Maybe. But Pete wouldn't trust many people with 50000 Well, uh, there was a guy named Roscoe Ward used to pal around with Pete a lot. He's yeah. still around town? Yeah, I got a location on him this morning. Seems he's a bowling fanatic. Bowling? Yeah, hangs out in an alley around North Broadway. Joint called Atlas Alley. Mm, yeah, yeah, I know the place. Well, I think I'll get a little exercise. Bowling, maybe? It beats snooker. See you around, Walt. I drove up to the Atlas Alleys and parked in a lot across the street. The bowling fanatics were added hot and heavy, and I sat down in one of the spectator's seats. Half an hour later, a pale little punk came in, got an alley, and began bowling alone. I decided to join him, not because he looked lonely, but because his name happened to be Roscoe Ward. Well, uh, hello, Roscoe. Do I know you? Well, I have the ugliest friends in town. Maybe you'd like to be one of them. Uh, sorry, uh, I'm antisocial. Mind if I bowl with him? Yeah. Thanks. I'll go first. Oh, I knocked them all down. Now, what will you play with? Hey, hey, that's not bad. You've got a swell approach. Thanks. What's your pitch, anyway? What do you want from me? Well, I'd like to meet some of your friends, Roscoe. Like I said before, a man is social. So is your friend I want to meet. Just got back in town and won't let anyone see him. Oh, what? Hey, now I remember you. The name's Diamond. Good memory. Let's try it again. Know where Pete Rocco is? Oh, oh, oh so that's it, huh? But you better head to the Catskills. Word says that Petey's going to put a slug through your private eye. Yeah, so I heard. I thought I'd look him up and beg for mercy or something. Yeah, I bet. But sorry I can't help you. You'll look it. But if I should see Pete, I'll tell him you was looking for him. <laughs> yeah, he get a big kick out of that. Now beat it, late man. I got a bowl. 
Vasco went back to his game, and I left the alleys. The only thing I knew about Pete Rocco was that somewhere in this city of millions, he was waiting to kill yours truly. Not a pleasant thought, but then I'm not in the very pleasant business. I crossed the street to the parking lot and went to my car. Hi, pal. I've been waiting for you. Wow, oh, Pete Rocco. Yeah, yeah. Get him. Hey, look, thinner, Pete. Can I go across the street and get you a hot dog? No, thanks, pal. Right now, I've got my heart set on a little ride. Now, get in. Before we continue with the adventures of Richard Diamond, private detective, here's your Rexall family druggist. Last week, a customer told me that... Something I really like about Rexall Milk of Magnesia is that one bottle won't be so thick I can't even pour it, and the next one thin and watery. Somehow, Rexall Milk of Magnesia always seems to be just right. Well, ma'am, that's because every bottle of Rexall Milk of Magnesia has to meet an exacting standard of viscosity, or it won't wear the Rexall label. What do you mean by viscosity? Well, an easy definition would be the degree of thickness in a liquid. Now, Rexall scientists conduct scientifically precise tests on every batch of Rexall milk of magnesia to make sure it meets this constant standard of viscosity, because that's one big reason why you'll always get a uniform dosage from every bottle. Oh, and I thought it was all just an accident. Oh, no, ma'am. There are no accidents behind the fact you can always depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. And now back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. With a gun pointed at me and Pete Rocco at my side, I followed directions and drove to a Harlem address. Pete led me upstairs and into a half-furnished flat. Far enough. Now sit right here, bright boy. That's good. You know, pal, I've been waiting a long time for this. And you always were the patient type. What are you waiting for now, Pete? An audience? No, oh, I'm in no hurry. You just sit there and square me for a while. Who's there? It's me, Vasco. It's... Well, hello, Snoopy. Can you beat this guy, Petey? He was looking for you. Let's not rub it in, boys. Hey, what you waiting for, Petey? Take care of him. Let's beat it. Shut up. We don't leave till I get word it's all clear to pick up the money. Yeah, but when are you going to find out? Who's going to let you know? Don't get too nosy, Roscoe. Diamond, after you picked me up, I had a rough time. During that trial, I didn't know what they were going to throw at me. Life with a chair. You just had to wait. Well, that's what you're going to do. You're going to sit there and you're going to wait. When you're least suspecting it, I'm going to put three slugs to your head. My barber won't like this. Yeah, just keep making cracks, wise guy. You'll break before long. Yeah, you'll break before long. Is there an echo in here? Roscoe, did you shake that police tail? It's, it's, yeah, he's still looking for me in the bowling alley. Good. Tie Diamond up tight and keep an eye on him. I'm going out for a while. Ah, oh, Pete, you going to take a chance on getting seen. Shut up. Been away for five years. I'll do what I want. I'll tie him up. <laughs> Pete kept the gun on me while Roscoe tied my arms behind a chair. Then he put the gun he had taken from me in his left pocket and his own in his right. He resembled a walking armory as he went out the door. You know, Snoopy, you're not so bad. Oh, now, watch it, Roscoe. You'll hurt my feelings. Well, Pete's a rough boy. I'm going to enjoy watching him settle with you. Oh, you have such simple taste. What's in this for you? Pete giving you a cut? Yeah, if he ever gets around to picking up the dough. He's got to wait until he gets the all-clear signal out. Oh, so there's someone else in this. Who, Roscoe? I don't know. If I did, I wouldn't yap to you. No, it's too bad you'll be a corpse. Huh? Oh, thanks for the pleasant thought. No, I mean it. That strike you made at the bowling alley tonight, that, that just wasn't luck. you got a swell approach. You think so? Yeah. That's why I have my trouble with my approach. But when Pete gives me my cut at the door, I'm going to buy me an alley. And bowl all the time. Oh, how exciting. See, you want to give me a few pointers? What? The approach. Maybe you could help me improve mine, huh? Now, look, this floor is kind of slippery. Now, watch. Now, I almost 
fellows hold the ball like this. You see? And swing it back and approach like this. Dad, how'd it look to you? Well, I, uh, I couldn't see too well from here. Suppose you untie my hand. Oh, no, and... no, 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 no. You've got to stay tied there. Well, I'm, I'm afraid I can't help you then. Uh, come around this side. I can't see through that table. Oh, all right. Yo, I got it. I got it. I'll slide towards you this time. All right. Yeah. What do you think of that? Well, I, uh, I won't hurt you now. No, go on. Be brutal. Well, it's, it's too sloppy, Roscoe. You keep your head up too high. The head, huh? Oh, yeah, sure. And keep the head down. That's right. <laughs> Ward followed instructions and kept his head down low, just in line with my foot. Chalk up a strike for Diamond. He went down like the number 10 pen. I managed to work my hands up over the back of the chair. Then a few calisthenics and my hands were in front of me, still tied, but free enough to call Walt Levinson on the phone. Fifteen minutes later, he arrived, put the cuffs on Ward, and untied me. Hey, you're loose. You know, maybe I should have kept you tied up. You might stay out of trouble then. You're so considerate, Walt. I'll put some men around the house. When Pete comes back with... Uh-oh. Maybe him now. Otis, bring Roscoe Ward over here. Come on, Ward. Ward, you pick up that phone and act like nothing's happened. Hold the receiver so we can hear who's on the line. If you don't, I'll see that the judge throws the book at you. Uh, hello. Roscoe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is this Pete? Of course, you don't want it. Wrong? Oh, no, 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 Peter. Everything's fine. You're just all funny. You, uh, take the phone out of the room, put the receiver in front of Diamond. Yeah, sure, it's your Pete. That's right. I heard him. Give me the phone. Uh, hello, Pete. Check up to see if I'm comfortable. How long have you been loose, pal? Come again? Diamond, I left you in a chair across the room. The phone don't reach that far. Well, Pete, you're getting smarter. Yeah, thanks. Too bad I'll have to postpone those three slugs in the head. But maybe later. I'm glad you said maybe, Pete. I have different ideas. Yeah, we'll see, pal. We'll see. Well, he tricked us, Walt. He won't be back here. Does this bird know where he is? Yeah, I don't think so. Roscoe, you mentioned that Pete had to wait for the word from someone before he could pick up that money. Who is that someone? Then I told you before, I don't know. Look, punk, you're all through. Help us out, and you'll get a better deal in court. Yeah, well, if I knew, I'd tell you. All I know is that Pete won't go near the door until this someone gives him the green light. No. I think he's telling the truth, Walt. Take him downtown and book him. I'm going visiting. I drove back out Mulberry Street to the Rocco Cigar Store. I was hoping Pete's brother, Dan, might remember some of Pete's old hangouts. I wanted to wrap up this case quickly for two reasons. One, Pete was a killer. Might kill again at any minute. And two, I might be the one he'd kill. Simon? Oh, yeah. Hello, Danny. I'm trying to get you in your office. I think I know where Pete is. Hello, Mr. Simon. I'll tell you later. I do hope you have something to report. Well, uh, uh, not much, Mrs. Rocco. I met your son today on the wrong side of a gun. I don't know where he is now. Oh, well, that's too bad. But you will catch him, I'm sure of that. Peter must be punished. I don't hold with violence, Mr. Diamond. Uh, Ma... Don't you want me to drive you over to visit Mrs. Montelli? Oh, well, that would be nice, Daniel. I'd like that. Well, uh, uh, you get your wrap and we'll go now. All right. And, Mr. Diamond, remember, I want my son caught quickly before he can kill again. Good day. Now then, Danny, what were you saying about Pete? I know where you can locate him. I didn't want to talk in front of Ma. I want to get out of this. Go on. Pete called me a little while ago. He's coming over tonight. I'm taking Ma to visit a friend, so she'll be out of the way. Tonight's your chance, Diamond. Tonight. I made plans to meet Danny out in front of the shop around 8. Then I went back to my office. I called Helen, wrote my dinner date for that evening, and waited as the hours ticked by. 7.30 and I was ready to go. Pete had taken my gun earlier, so I slipped a spare in my pocket and drove to the cigar store. I parked down the street, walked halfway up the block, and met Danny. Diamond? Yeah. Our boy showed up yet? No, but he should be here soon. Come on. We walked up to the shop, and Danny unlocked the door. The shop was dark as I entered, and I tripped over something on the floor. Hey! 
Can we have some light in here? Sure. Why not? That's better. And then I saw what I tripped over. Pete Rocco with six bullet holes in his body. And then it was clear. Why had Pete come here? To get the money. That made the strong-armed boy behind me the contact. The one Pete was waiting for to give him the all-clear was little brother Danny. Right, Shamus? Uh, I'll be honest. Yes, I am. Pretty smooth, huh? Here, catch. Yeah, that's good. You'll notice it's your gun. Pete was bragging about how he took it from you. He let me see it. And that was fatal. Right. And this gun I got on you now was Pete. I kill you, put the gun in Pete's hand, and I'm clear you shot each other. No one will blame me. You thought this all out, huh? That's right. Pete and I robbed that bookie together. He left the dope for me to keep after he was picked up. I figured he'd never get out, but when he did... Well, it's real convenient you're being around. Now, say your prayers, Samus. This is it. Is he? Is he dead, Mr. Diamond? No, you, uh... You hit him in the shoulder. Better call an ambulance, though. Yes. My boys. Peter and Daniel, look at them. I tried to teach them. I told them I wouldn't stand for violence. But they wouldn't listen. You know, sometimes you've just got to be stern. Yes, Francis. Will you fix us some drinks, please? Mm. Soda was mine. And you, Mr. Diamond? Oh, I'll take soda, too, Francis. About a jigger full. Uh, uh, yes, sir. Rick. Uh-huh? Don't you ever get tired. Playing the piano? <laughs> Never. That's not what I meant. Why, like today, you were almost killed twice. Honey, you can only be killed once. All right, then. You were threatened twice. Don't you ever wish you were in a different profession? For instance? Oh, insurance, maybe. You can talk fast enough. Well, you uh, may have something there. Need a lot of gals in the insurance game. On second thought, you'd be better as a good humor man. Need a lot of children instead. Hmm, gals are like better. And so I've noticed. Oh, Helen, what's wrong with my own business? Now, where else could I find excitement all day and a beautiful girl to sing to at night? Hmm. Flattery will get you everywhere, Mr. Diamond. Don't I know it? A little bit independent in your walk. A little bit independent in your talk. There's nothing like you in Paris or New York. You're awfully easy on the eye. A little bit independent when we dance. A little bit independent towards romance. A bit of sophistication in your glance. And yet you're easy on the eye. Whenever I'm with you alone, you weave a magic spell. And though it be a danger zone, I only know that you're swell. A little bit independent with your smile. A little bit independent in your style. How can I help but love you all the while? When you're so easy on the eyes. Rick. Yes, baby? I've been wondering which holds more attraction for you. Me or my piano? Hmm? Oh, come here, baby. Here's your drink, Mr. Oh! Mr. Diamond. Miss Helen. Oh, dear. Why did I ever leave Cambridge? Again, here's your Rectal family druggist. Whenever you have a headache, remember this about Rectal aspirin. When taken with water, the five full grains of pure aspirin in every Rectal tablet are ready to go to work for you even before they reach your stomach. 
So whenever you have a headache, remember that about Rexall aspirin. Ask for it at Rexall drugstores everywhere. And remember always, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role, with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. Look for Dick Powell in the Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer production, Right Cross, in which he co-stars with June Allison and Ricardo Montalban. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Bill Foreman inviting you to be with us next week at this time, when we will again present Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hiya, beautiful. Get lost, bristle puss. You need a shave. But I have shaved. What else do you want me to do? Silly boy, she wants you to go stag. Go stag? But why? Because stag is Rexall's exclusive line of men's good grooming aids, like stag brushless shave cream. No fuss, no massage, just smooth it on and presto, you get a clean, close shave. Your face stays smooth and whiskerless all day long. I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll go stag. That's it. Join the stag line now at Rexall Drugstores Everywhere. Yes, to make girls care, go stag. <laughs> Listen while the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Evening. This is your Rexall family druggist with a specially important news for you. This week's issues of the Saturday Evening Post, Life, Look, Colliers, and the Farm Journal carry a two-page advertisement on Rexall's famous one-cent sale that starts October 19th. You'll find 150 guaranteed Rexall products, every one of them offered at two for the price of one plus a penny. And that's not all. There are 53 other specials too good to miss. So be sure to check this ad on Rexall's big one-cent sale, and when you see it, remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Now your Rexall family druggist brings you another half hour with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. I'm Roger Renard, uh, real estate. Well, uh, have a seat. Uh, thank you. Uh, let's get right to the point. Oh, so it's me, $100 a day plus expenses. Oh, yes, your uh, fee. Well, it's not much, but it's all mine, and I love it. Uh, <clears throat> What's that racket? Nothing. Excuse me. M Mr. Diamond, I'm, I'm being blackmailed. Well, it happens in the best of families, especially in the best of families. Mr. Diamond, I'm engaged to marry a very wealthy widow. What's that clicking? Have you got a wild lifesaver in your mouth? I have false teeth, Mr. Diamond. Is that so amusing? When they start making bird calls? Yes. They're new. Just got them yesterday. Mm. Awful nuisance. Oh. Well, you were engaged to some wealthy widow last I heard. I don't appreciate your humor, Mr. Diamond. I happen to be very much in love with my fiancée. Sorry? It so happens that I dabbled in a rather uh, 
Shall we say off-color business in my younger days? Shall we say what we, you mean? Mm, perhaps it would be better, yes. Twenty-five years ago, Mr. Diamond, I became rather discouraged working for a living, especially when I saw less gifted men enjoying the real fruits of life, having some education and a bit of charm. Excuse me again. You know, if you learned the Morse code on those things, it would be the life of the party. Briefly, I courted wealthy women, predominantly widows who sought romance. Flattery, etc. Mm-hmm. I married several times without bothering to obtain divorces in between. Oh, well, wait until the Reno Chamber of Commerce hears about you. In due time, the police caught up with me. My accumulated crimes cost me eight years in jail. But when I was released, I decided to turn my talents toward more legal pursuits. Glory be, you're saved. Saved, indeed. <laughs> <clears throat> Can you imagine what my fiance would think if she learned of my past? She'd surely suspect my motives. And the irony is that I do love her deeply. Oh, I see. Well, who's the killjoy that shares your little secret? Now, that's the puzzle. Nobody in New York knows of my past. I haven't told a soul. But I received this letter in the morning mail. Here. See how smart you are. He gave me a square white envelope, the dozen for a quarter variety, and I slipped the letter out of it. It was typewritten and point by point looked like a pocket biography of a one-time Casanova. It ended up by ordering Renard to have a $100 bill ready that night when someone called Andy would be at his home to pick it up. I relaxed a little. The case began to look like the standard kind of blackmail as found in the detective's manual. I know you think $100 isn't much. Well, that all depends how often you have to pay it. I don't suppose you know who Andy is. I do not. Oh, well, that makes the next step pretty obvious, Renard. What's your address? Here's my card. I'll expect you at nine. Leave a candle in the window. Uh oh. Nailed down everything, Lieutenant. It's the Shamus. Why, Sergeant Otis, don't tell me it's you. You've brightened my whole day. I don't know why, but that's too bad. Well, the boys in the pool room told me you were drafted. I cashed in all my war bonds. Now I can buy them back. Uh, Otis, stop trying to figure that one out. What's doing, Rick? Oh, nothing much, Walt. How'd you like to come along with me tonight? Help me wrap up a screwy blackmail deal. Might learn something. It's a new angle. What's new about blackmail? Well, the whodunit part in this case. My client doesn't know who's blackmailing him, but some character named Andy is supposed to pick up the cabbage tonight. Want to come along or not? I'd like to, Mr. Diamond, if the invitation is still open. Well, that's very nice, Lieutenant Levinson. It's open to you for a nominal fee. Well, I'm prepared to pay. Oh, hey, cut it out, Rick. Can I go too, Lieutenant? Sorry, Otis. This is strictly stag. Oh, I didn't know. Excuse me. One moment. Oh, uh, come in, Mr. Diamond. I... Who is this other gentleman? Roger Renard. Meet Lieutenant Walt Levinson. The police. Mr. Diamond, I expressly told you... Take it easy, take it easy, Mr. Renard. I'm here unofficially. What time is it, Walt? Nearly nine. Hmm. Quiet. I just heard something. Oh, relax, Walt, relax. Mr. Renard is suffering from a set of mechanized molars. Oh. (laughs) Store teeth, huh? Yes, it has become unbearably embarrassing. Oh, would you gentlemen care for a drink while we're waiting? I'll take a double of anything. Oh, I don't think I'll have Oh, go ahead, Walt. Get an unofficial snootful. Wait. Oh, <laughs> sit tight, Renard. I'll get it. I'll cover you, Rick, just in case. A package for Mr. Raynard. Come right in, Andy. What do you mean, Andy? My name's Sheldon. Are you Raynard? I'm Renard. Oh, sign here. I'll sign it, uh, Renard. It uh, looks like straight goods. We're getting anxious. All right, then. Here. Uh, here's your package. Keep this side up. Okay, Sheldon. Sorry for the trouble. Here catch. Hey, thanks. Thanks a million. Uh, false alarm. Hey, that's a screwy looking package. Look at those holes all over the top. Can't imagine who would be sending me anything. Why don't you open it as long as we're killing time? Yes, of course. Well, heavy cardboard. Uh, uh, there. Rick, what? look. It, it's alive. It's a pigeon. Oh. All right, you. Talk. What are you yelling at that bird for? Well, I thought he might be a stool pigeon. Fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Gentlemen, look at this nameplate on the bird's leg here underneath the capsule. Says Andy. That must be the bird's name. Let me see that box it came in. Uh, Yep, there's a note. Listen to this. Mr. Renard, by now you have met Andy, my pigeon. 
You will please roll the $100 bill very tightly and place it in the capsule attached to Andy's leg. Then simply release him outdoors. Please check your watch, Mr. Renard. If Andy isn't safely home by 9.30, your secret will be turned over to the papers in the morning. You will hear from me again next week. Hmm, no signature. How do you like that? You get it, Rick? Andy's a homing pigeon. Oh, don't explain it, Walt. Just pick out a nice hard wall for me to knock my conceited head against. Miss Diamond, it's almost 9.15. What shall I do? Well, here's my overpaid opinion, Renard. If you don't pay off, you know what'll happen. If you do pay off, we'll just keep working on the case and hope for the best. Rick, do you think oh, we could... Oh, Walt, pro- Walt, Walt, don't say it. The chances of following a pigeon between New York skyscrapers, especially at night, is strictly for radar. Something we don't happen to have handy. Well, what's it going to be, Renard? Ah, uh, I'll pay the money, of course. There's no other way. But this will bleed me dry week in, week out. Uh, looks that way. Well, that will be the end, then. I can't raise that much cash each week. Well, here's the money, Mr. Diamond. Will you gentlemen take care of the details? There wasn't any use hanging around. Walt drove me home, and I spent the rest of the night dreaming about flying blackmailers. Sure, we could check the delivery outfit that brought the package, but I'd give odds the turn address was phony. Come morning, I washed the sour taste out of my mouth with some coffee and went to my office. While I was draping some black crepe around my license, business picked up. A nervous young man walked in, introduced himself as John Miller, hemmed and hawed for a minute, and then blurted out with... Uh, Mr. Diamond, I need your help right away. I'm being blackmailed. <laughs> Just because I sat there with my mouth open, he thought I was interested and told me more. He was married, and several years ago, another girl had come along. Nothing serious. The romance had died in a few weeks, but his wife might not understand, so on, so on. Uh, Mr. Diamond, why are you staring at me that way? Who is blackmailing you? That's the strangest part. I don't know. Oh, don't sit there and lie to me. You've got to know. Blackmail means that somebody has got... Oh, Oh, never mind. Oh... There's one thing, though. Uh, Tonight at 9 o'clock, someone named Andy will be... Andy? Oh, no. No, no, no! Before we continue with the adventures of Richard Diamond, here's a lady with a question for our Rexall family druggist. I want to know more about the ad on Rexall's one-cent sale. Well, ma'am, the ad appears in this week's Life, Look, Collier's, the Saturday Evening Post, and the Farm Journal. Two big pages crammed with 150 guaranteed Rexall products. Every one of them offered to you during Rexall's famous one-cent sale at two for the price of one, plus a penny. Golly, what an opportunity to save. And that's not all. The ad also lists 53 other specials that can help you cut your cost of living to a minimum. Now, in front of every item, there's a little square so you can check what you need in advance. Why, I can use the ad as a shopping list. That's exactly what we intend it to be. It's your big chance to stock up for months in advance. Because on October 19th, the starting date of Rexall's one-cent sale, you double your buying power simply by adding a penny. Where did you say the ad appears? In this week's Collier's, Look, Life, Saturday Evening Post, and Farm Journal. Look for it. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. And now back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. So it had come to me as it must to all private detectives. A strange little voice inside my head began nagging. Get out of this business while you still have all your marbles. Get into something sensible like taming Python. It wasn't enough to have one client being blackmailed by someone he didn't know. A second guy has to walk in with the same routine. And the payoff was that a certain miserable homing pigeon called Andy had a feather in the pie. A foul, foul, that Andy. After a while, my second client, Miller, began to fidget in his seat. Probably because I began sharpening my letter opener. Uh, Mr. Diamond, do you feel all right? Oh, yes, I I feel great, simply great. Just keep me away from open windows. I beg your pardon? Oh, forget it, forget it. Now, let's see now. You're being blackmailed, but you don't know by whom. And a certain Andy will be at your office by 9 o'clock tonight to pick up the money. 
Uh, yes, that's right. Oh, well, now, Miller, I'll, I'll be kind. I won't tell you who Andy is right now. First of all, you tell me, uh, do you know Roger Renard? Roger Renard? Mm-hmm. No, I, I, I don't believe so. Now, think hard, Miller. Small guy, bright blue eyes, cultured voice. No, I don't know anyone like that. Who is he? Well, he happens to be in the same hole you are. Andy paid him a visit last night. Really? Yeah. This is bargain basement day in blackmail. Well, what do you know? Well, let me think. Renard, Renard... Now, look, look. I got a better idea. You just sit tight and leaf through my collection of unpaid bills. It'll keep your mind off your own worries. Well, there's got to be an answer to this. Hello? Uh, Renard, this is Diamond. Can you get to my office in 15 minutes? Of course. Has anything happened? Don't ask. But, uh... Just it... hurry. There'll be a diagram for you when you get here. When Roger Renard arrived, I introduced him and revealed my last hope. Somewhere, there had to be a familiar connection between Miller and Renard. A familiar place, a mutual friend. Well, they finally caught on and began playing the game known as... Haven't I met you somewhere before? Now, let's see, Miller. Uh, were you in Kansas in the winter of 1942? I had a dear lady friend there at the time, name of Sophie Holloway. Never been in Kansas. I spent uh, two years in Seattle, though, 1938-39. No, never had the pleasure of being in Seattle. Um, pardon me. Bad job done on my new team. Oh. <clears throat> Now, about New York. Ever frequent... And so it went on and on. If these guys had been stranded on a desert island 20 feet square, they probably never would have bumped into each other. But the fact remained. Somebody knew about the pass of both and was using the same technique to blackmail them. An hour and three aspirants later, my head began to feel like a ping-pong ball being smacked from Miller to Renard, from Renard to Miller, from Miller... I've done my best to stay away from physical exertion, and I must say that I've been rather successful at it... Mm, the devil take these artificial bicuspids. I go to all the expense of having New York's best oral surgeon work on my mouth, and then some incompetent dentist can't turn out a proper hitting dentist. Uh, <coughs> well, we're not getting any place. I have an appointment in a few minutes. You learn anything new, Mr. Diamond? You'll be sure to call me, won't you? If something doesn't happen soon, I... Well, I just don't know. No, don't worry, Roger. We'll catch the culprit, or my name isn't... Uh... Oh, oh, well, it doesn't make any difference anyway. Mm. Well, goodbye, Mr. Dunn. Goodbye. Goodbye, Renard. Uh, goodbye, Renard. Whew. That guy was driving me crazy with that clack-clack of his teeth. You think an oral surgeon with Cutler's reputation would recommend a competent dentist to his patients? I thought he was great. Yeah, yeah, sure. Now, look, Miller, isn't there anything else I can do for you? Find out who stole your yo-yo in 1922 or maybe get look, you... Look, just find out who's blackmailing me, Diamond. I haven't slept in days. I know, I know. Somehow I feel that soon you won't be alone. If you could only find out where that pigeon is. Hello, pigeon. Well, Rick, what are you doing here in the middle of the afternoon? Oh, I'm looking for a place to hide, Helen, dear. Can I borrow your closet? Hide from what? Pigeons, false teeth. A pigeon with false teeth? No, 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 dear. A client with false teeth. The pigeon's blackmailing him. Oh, a stool pigeon. No, I tried that. This pigeon flies. He has a plane? Honey, honey, this is a real pigeon with wings yet. You know, like this. Oh, just lie down on the couch and take it easy. You must be working too hard. I don't want to lie down. You want to fly. No, no. Well, make up your mind. Well, I'm trying to tell you why I came over. Two guys who never saw each other are being blackmailed. By a pigeon. Yes. The same pigeon. Yes. And it flies. Yes, and it goes coo, 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 brr, coo, coo. Uh... Are you sure you wouldn't like to lie down? No, I just want some peace and quiet so I can figure this thing out. Rick, darling, at least try and take it easy. No, no, come on. Nothing's that bad. Smile for Helen. Smile? <laughs> oh, come on. Let's see your pearly teeth. Hmm? I said, let's see your pearly teeth. Helen, Helen, that's it. That's wonderful. Now, how about a nice cool drink? No, no, listen. Renard said he went to New York's best oral surgeon. Later, Miller said an oral surgeon with Dr. Cutler's reputation should have recommended a competent dentist. And he was probably right. Now, why don't you just try... How did Miller know Renard was talking about Dr. Cutler? Ouija board? Because Miller must have been treated by Dr. Cutler, too, and knows he's the best oral surgeon in New York. Helen, I've got to make a phone call. I grabbed the phone book. Looked up the office of Dr. Cutler, oral surgeon, then called Walt. 
20 minutes later, I met the good lieutenant on the 10th floor of an office building on Madison Avenue. Walter signed Otis to guard duty outside of Dr. Cutler's office. His orders were to trip any guy in a white smock that seemed in a hurry to take the day off. Walter and I agreed to underplay our police affiliations just in case we were wrong. Then we went in. We slowed up when a white mountain of a woman stood up from her desk and announced she was Miss Barrows, Dr. Cutler's nurse. Could have fooled me. From the size of her, Notre Dame could have used her last week. What seems to be the trouble, gentlemen? Well, it's, uh, it's somewhat important, Miss Barrow. We'd like to uh, see Dr. Cutler as soon as possible. My name's Diamond. I see. In just a moment. Yes, Miss Barrow? Doctor, there's a Mr. Diamond and his friend here to see you. They say it's urgent. Thank you. I'll be right out. Won't you sit down? Uh, no, 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 thanks. We'll, we'll sign. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, hello, Doctor. How do you do? What seems to be the trouble? May, uh, may we go into your office, Doctor? Oh, yes, of course. Go right in. Uh, Miss Barrow, are those x-rays ready in that impacted molar? I'll have a look, Doctor. Mm, thank you. Now, gentlemen. The doctor was an old, red-faced gentleman with puzzled blue eyes. As tactfully as I could, I told him about Renard and Miller and the fact that they were in trouble. He remembered them. Oh, yes, Mr. Diamond. I removed Mr. Renard's teeth last month. As for Mr. Miller, he was in just last week. Uh, the rest of it is pretty blunt, Dr. Cutler. Both of these men are being blackmailed by the same party. And it just so happens, Doctor, that you are the only acquaintance they have in common. What? Now, look here, now, young... Don't get excited, Doc. Rick isn't accusing you. We just have to check these things. I realize that. I think my position and past record in dental surgery are proof enough. If you care to see a statement of income from my practice, plus stock dividends, you'll see how foolish... Yeah, yeah, Doc, you're right. Rick, it just doesn't figure, not for a lousy couple of hundred bucks. No, I know, Walt. It sure looks that way. But if this isn't the end of the line, we'll be on this sleigh ride forever. Dr. Cutler, is there, a, is there anyone else in your office who gets to know the patients well? Just myself and Miss Barrow. She's the nurse's heart side. I could call her in No, if... no, no. In a minute, Doctor. Does she uh, just answer the door and take temperatures or, or what? Oh, no, of course not. Miss Barrow is a registered nurse and a trained anesthetist. You mean she gives your patients Novocaine? Is that it, Doc? Novocaine, yes, in some cases. For specific cases, we must use a more general anesthetic like sodium pentothal or gas or, or sometimes... Doctor, doctor, isn't sodium pentothal sometimes called the truth serum? Yes, in narcosynthesis. It's sometimes used in psychiatric treatment. Some patients will answer any question truthfully under the influence of sodium pentothal. See, it weakens the conscious will and... The x-rays are ready, doctor. Uh, that's Miss Barrow now. I'll call her. No, no, no. Don't do it, doctor. Stall her. Just ask... Ask her to uh, wait outside. I don't understand, but... Very well. One moment, Miss Barrow. What are you going to do, Rick? Uh, doctor, I want you to pretend that I'm an emergency case. Must be treated at once. Can you? Oh, of course, but... Now, can you have your nurse give me something harmless instead of pentothal? Well, yes. Distilled water could be substituted. Well, we're in business. Walt, you make like the old friend who came along for laughs. Uh-huh. Now, doctor, call Miss Barrow in and turn her loose on me. Just relax in the chair, Mr. Diamond. There's nothing to worry about. Oh, I hope not. My, my, my whole mouth feels like it's burning. Now I'll mm. have to strap your hand down for the pentothal injection. Oh, the... Mm. This won't take long, will it? You won't feel a thing. Now, there's the tourniquet. Now we're ready. Now well, let's, let's get it over with. Very soon, Mr. Diamond. Very soon. Mm. 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 You're getting drowsy now. Very tired, aren't you? Um, I... You can talk, Mr. Diamond. Oh, I... Patients talk. often talk away their troubles while I take care of them. Oh, yes, talk, talk. Uh, talk away troubles. It's up to you, of course. But if you want to get anything off your conscience, why, just go ahead. Oh, wonderful. Everybody has something that's bothering them. Something they're ashamed of. Ashamed? Oh. You can tell me. Ashamed of? Oh, ashamed. Yes. Go on. I. I used to steal money from a friend of mine. 
was a wonderful guy. Big, fat, but but dumb from the word go. I I'd steal him blind, his his watch, his, his cash. He, he never knew what was happening. That was terrible of you, wasn't it? What's his name? Levinson. Walt Levinson. Oh, but then I Yes, I'm listening. Well then then he he became a policeman, a, a lieutenant. One night he caught me stealing. I I had to kill him. He was going to arrest me. And you escaped? Yes, escaped. But his ghost haunts me, haunts me. In fact, Lieutenant Walt Levinson is sitting in the next room, badge and all. Okay, Miss Barrow, we've all heard enough. Andy's going to miss you. Come on, Walt. What? Why, you... All right, lady, hold it. Watch out, Walt. Walt ducked just in time to miss being scalded by the boiling pan of surgical instruments. But it gave her enough time to run out of the office. I had just freed myself when I heard a scream from the hall. Walt and I rushed out there and found Otis helping Miss Barrow to her feet. Gee, miss, I'm sorry I tripped you, but but you was wearing a white smock and I got mixed up. I'm sorry, honest I am. Shut up, Otis. What? what? O- Otis, Otis, I don't know what to say. You, you doing this, I... Otis, you... Oh, Otis, you are without a doubt... Feel better? Mm -hmm. All calmed down. Oh, sure. No more problems? Not a single one. Uh How's the pigeon? Oh, we found him over at a nurse's house. He was staying with the nurse? In the garage, yes. Had a friend there, too. The nurse worked for Dr. Cutler, an oral surgeon. I thought you said your client was the one with the false teeth. Oh, that's right. Then what was the matter with the pigeon? Nothing. He was just a little tired from making all those trips with that money tied to his leg. Uh, why don't you sing something? Mm, mm, all right. It's wonderful. It's marvelous. You should care for me. Soft night. Paradise, what I love to see. You've made my life so glamorous. You can't blame me for feeling amorous. Oh, wonderful, it's marvelous. That you should care for me. Well, honey, how was that? Hmm? Oh, oh, fine. Fine. I don't even think you were listening. Rick, uh, about the pigeon and what you said about money tied to his leg and... Ah, come here. Now, wait a minute. I'm confused. Come here. You said that you had a client who... He had false teeth. Mm. And a pigeon with money. Mm. Oh. Still confused? Uh-huh. Confuse me some more. <laughs> You listeners will have at least one of these magazines in your home this week. Life, Look, Collier's, the Saturday Evening Post, or the Farm Journal. Pick it up and turn the pages till you come to the two-page ad on Rexall's one-cent sale that starts October 19th. Take a long look at this opportunity to buy twice as much for just a penny more because this ad lists 150 guaranteed Rexall products all offered at two for the price of one, plus a penny. In addition, there are 53 other sales specials you can't afford to miss. So check this ad on Rexall's big one-cent sale, and remember, starting October 19th and continuing through October 23rd, you can buy twice as much for just a penny more.
Good health to all from Rexall. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and was written by Joe Morheim and Hal Bloom and edited by Blake Edwards with music by Frank Worth. Dick Powell's soon-to-be-released picture is the Metro-Golden-Mayer production, Right Cross, in which he co-stars with June Allison and Ricardo Montalban. Featured in tonight's cast were Ted Osborne, Wilms Herbert, Arthur Q. Bryan, Bob Sweeney, D.J. Thompson, and Virginia Gregg. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, is produced and directed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Bill Foreman inviting you to join us next week at this same time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Check the double-page ad in this week's Life, Look, Collier, Saturday Evening Post, and Farm Journal on Rexall's one-cent sale that starts October 19th. Mark the date on your calendar. It's your chance to buy two top-quality guaranteed Rexall products for the price of one plus the penny. Hear a thrilling police drama on Dragnet tomorrow night on NBC. Listen while the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. This is your Rexall family druggist with a message that will save you money. Tomorrow morning at Rexall drugstores everywhere, Rexall's world-famous one-cent sale begins. From then on through Monday, October 23rd, you can buy two regular guaranteed Rexall products for the price of one plus one cent. For example, the regular price for the 100-tablet bottle of Rexall aspirin is 54 cents. During Rexall's one-cent sale, you get two bottles for 55 cents. That's right. Just a penny more buys twice as much. What's more, this offer of two for the price of one plus a penny applies to literally hundreds of items. From vitamins to mineral oil, from cold cream to iodine, from shaving needs to Christmas cards. And what's more important, these are Rexall products, and you can depend on any drug product that bears the name... Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Now your Rexall family druggist brings you another half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency, we can solve any crime but television. Diamond, stop clowning and get right down here. Well, Sergeant Lovelum, what's the matter, Otis? Didn't the zoo pick up your option? Oh, now quit that. You gotta get right down here. Something terrible's happened. They haven't made you commissioner. Worse than that, Lieutenant Levinson's been kidnapped. <laughs> Diamond to see you, Captain. Hello, Collins. Sure. All right, Diamond. Uh, Otis just called me about Walt. Now, look, Rick. I know Walt's a personal friend of yours. He's a good friend of mine, too. But this is police business. A cop's been kidnapped. Diamond was a cop for six years. I don't need a case history, Sergeant. Oh, get off it, Charlie. I'm down here to help. Of course you are. But there's one thing I won't stand for, Rick. 
The way you operate. Well, what's the matter with the way I operate? I know how you feel about Walter, and when a guy feels that strongly about someone, he's liable to do a lot of things to get a few answers. Oh, for Pete's sake, Charlie. What are you going to do, hold a tea party and hope someone will spread some gossip? That's not fair, Rick. Well, if you think I'm going to sit back knowing that Bert Fisher's got Walter... Who said anything about Bert Fisher? Well, nobody had to say anything. Pretty obvious, isn't it? Walt sent Bert's brother Art to the electric chair. Bert swore he'd get Walt for it. Fisher dies tonight, doesn't he? Yeah. Sure, I think it's Bert Fisher, too. And we're going to do everything about it we can. Bert's been in Detroit, hasn't he? Yeah. I've got a call into Detroit. Should be hearing any time. This phone call you got saying they had Walt. I didn't have time to trace it. The guy hmm. said Walt was being held, and when Art Fisher dies tonight in the chair, so does Walt. Charlie... I'm going to work on this thing whether you like it or not. Yeah, that figures. But I promise you, Rick, I won't save your skin if you get out of line. Mm. Any leads yet? No. They're rounding up the usual stoolies. Well, I know a couple of boys who might have a few angles. Who? Nobody who would give you any information. These guys aren't stoolies. They might tell me because I think they like me. You see, Charlie, sometimes it pays not to be a cop. I'd expect any information you get, Rick. Oh, sure. Well, I'll see you later. Uh, Rick? Yeah? Be a good boy, will you? Uh, Collins, if we don't find Walt by 11 o'clock, can you hold up Fisher's execution? No. Oh, it's swell. I'll keep in touch. Hey, Diamond, do you think you can do anything? And I can try. Do me a favor, Otis. Okay. Get me a complete background on Bert Fisher. Everything. All his friends, his record, as far back as you can go. Gee, Diamond, I'm scared for the lieutenant. You're not alone with that one, Otis. In the Bowery, living in a broken-down rooming house, was a man. Twenty years ago, he'd come to the big city with his trumpet tucked under his arm. He'd started playing with little combinations along 52nd Street, and pretty soon the word got around. Everyone came to listen to him. They called him the Dean of Jazz, and the title stuck. Then one night, he had an argument with one of the Fuseri mob. And the next morning, they found him in an alley, half dead, his face beaten to a pulp. It was a long time before the dean could get around again, and it was a lot longer before he could play his trumpet. And by then, no one would have him. He couldn't make enough with the horn, so he tried crime. And that's where I met him. I did him a favor, and a short time later, he went straight. He'd still kept his underworld connections, but he, he wasn't a stoolie. I'd just done him a favor once. Richard Diamond. Oh. Hello, Diamond. How are you, Dean? Like to see you. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of figured you would. Dean, uh, you ever run into a guy named Fisher? Bert Fisher? How about a drink? No, thanks. Skull. <sighs> oh, man, it's going to be hot today. This uh, Bert Fisher grabbed Lieutenant Levinson. Says he's going to kill him. I can't help you. Oh, Dean, I just need one little lead to get started. Yeah, sure. Whew, I wish I had a fan in here. How's business? Hmm. It isn't. I make enough to pay the rent. How about a few bucks to keep you going? Well, I ain't proud, but it won't buy you anything. The lieutenant's a good friend. Yeah, yeah. Word got around this morning. Yeah. Here's ten. Buy yourself some groceries. Oh, thanks. You... You did me a favor once. Forget it. Bert Fisher's got a lot of rough hoods working for him. They're most all from Detroit. But they kill the same as anyone from here. Mm-hmm. Dean, do you know anything at all? I might. Who wants to die? Pretty good. <laughs> sure, me and Bix. Well, I'll see you around. Yeah, thanks for the tent. Oh, uh, Dean, about 11 o'clock tonight, play a few bars of the funeral march. Oh, uh, Simon. Yeah? You, uh, you remember this tune, don't you? Put it 
that was Mary, Mary, plain as any name can be. You got it, pal. See you around. <laughs> Oh, this is Diamond, Otis. What did you find out? Oh, I got reports on everybody we know is connected with Bert Fisher. You want me to read them off? Anybody on that list named Mary? Mary? No. These guys are all named Hallelujah or something. Look, uh, check all of those names and see if Fisher or any one of his boys ever knew a girl named Mary. Then after you do that, I'll... You'll what? Holy smoke. I'll talk to you later. Dean! 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 The Dean had blown his last note. He was sprawled face down on the dirty carpet, clutching the shiny trumpet. A thin line of red was spreading out from a bullet hole in his chest. And the open window sent me across the room in a hurry. I looked out on the fire escape to see a man drop to the alley below. We both fired a split second apart. He staggered as my slug knocked him against the building... And then before I could try again, he disappeared around the corner. I turned, looked down at the dean, and wondered if Gabriel was getting a lesson in jazz. Diamond, I warned you before you left here Okay, that I... okay, Charlie. A nice guy's been killed, but all the crying in the world isn't going to help. Hey, I got something, Diamond. Let's see. Good grief. He's got the whole department working for him. Come on, Otis. What have you got? Uh, is it all right, Captain? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. I should be in the second-hand business. Report on one of Fisher's old mob, Lou Baxter. Only one of the whole bunch who had a girl named Mary. Mary? Who's Mary? Charlie, look at this picture. Lou Baxter. I've been looking at it all morning. Well, take another look. This is the guy I shot climbing down off the fire escape after he killed the dean. What? Holy smoke. You know where you can pick him up? Oh, he's a local boy, all right. Didn't go back to Detroit with Fisher. I've had a call out him since 1020 this morning. Hey, what about that girl, Otis? Name's Mary Sinclair. Uh, used to go with Lou Baxter, Captain. No address on her. Mary Sinclair and Lou Baxter, huh? Well, it's the first lead we've had. I'll get the boys on it. Charlie had his methods and I had mine. Otis got in touch with the musician's local, and in half an hour, I had a list of all the places the dean had worked since the union had a record on him. I started checking. Dives, restaurants, jam joints. Questioning owners, bartenders, waiters. No one knew a girl named Mary Sinclair. Around 3 o'clock, I wandered into a place on 52nd Street known as the Red Parrot. Hey. I'm uh, looking for information. You a cop? Private cop. Mm-hmm. You, uh, remember a guy who played here last year? Trumpet man, the dean? Sure. Everybody knows the dean. Something wrong? Uh, the dean got himself killed. Oh, no. See, that's too bad. Real nice guy. You ever know a girl named Sinclair? Mary Sinclair? Uh, no. No, I don't think so. Oh, uh, okay. Hey, mister. Yeah? Why don't you ask Ed? He's the boy with the fingers playing the piano. He knew the dean pretty well. Thanks. You, Ed? Yeah. What can I do for you, Pops? I understand you're a good friend of the dean. Sure, we're compatible. But I ain't seen him in a while. You looking for him? No, for a friend of his. A Mary Sinclair. Cute chick. Uh, where can I find her? Why do you want to find her, Pops? The dean was murdered a few hours ago. He used to live over on 47th Street, 69 West. But that was a year ago. You sure about the address? Couldn't forget it. We had a few balls up there. She was kind of a flip. We had a little combo in here, pretty crazy, too. He used to come in and listen. Real hep on jazz. Knew all the old-timers by name, like the dean. Remembered when he was tops, before he got hurt. You ever hear him in those days? Yeah. I played with him a lot. 
to watch them real close sometimes. After hours, the boys would just sit around and blow because they felt like it. The dean used to lean back and close his eyes and blow things like he was getting the word from the other side. It was great. Might have been the greatest. Well, you all got to go on ahead sometime. I guess it ain't so bad, though. The harp's a real wild instrument. I left the piano player and headed for the address he'd given me. There was a good chance Mary Sinclair wasn't living there anymore, but it was the closest I'd come to any kind of a lead. When I got there, I held my breath and looked at the mailbox. Score for Diamond. Miss Mary Sinclair still lived in the building. Before we continue with the adventures of Richard Diamond, here's your Rexall family druggist. And tonight I have money-saving news. For tomorrow morning at every Rexall drugstore in the country, Rexall's famous one-cent sale begins. The sale where you get two fine-quality, guaranteed Rexall products for the price of one, plus one cent. Exactly how does that work? Well, for example, the regular price for a pint bottle of Rexall's Milk of Magnesia is 39 cents. But during the one-cent sale, you can buy two bottles for 40 cents. Why, that means a penny more buys twice as much. Exactly, ma'am. What's more, you'll find some 347 of these twin bargains in our stores. Everything from Rexall rubbing alcohol to stationery, from Rexall foot remedies to Rexall dental products, plus 85 other sales specials you can't afford to miss. Well, I'm putting my pennies to work tomorrow. Then use a lot of them, ma'am, for every one of them doubles your buying power. Best of all, you'll be getting Rexall products, and you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. And now back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Yeah? Oh, hello. Uh, Mary Sinclair? Yeah. Whatever you're selling, I'll take a dozen. I'd like to talk with you. I'd like you to. Some other time. I'm busy right now. I'm afraid this can't wait. It'll have to, baby. Give me a call. Plaza 45466, Mr. Uh, Diamond. Okay, doll. Call me tomorrow, huh? You got your foot in the door, honey. Old habit. Can't seem to break it. Well, I'll break it for you, honey. Your whole leg. You'll be sorry, doll. Mm. All right, baby. Make it quick, huh? What do you want? Let's talk inside. I told you. Yeah, yeah, I know. It was cooler in here. The coolest. But it won't be for long. Where's Lou Baxter? Who? You know, the boy you used to run around with. I ran around with a lot of boys. Ever since I was in grammar school, I ran around with boys. It's a hobby. Where's Lou Baxter? Baby, I don't know. You want to twist my arm? Go ahead, it might be fun. He just killed the dean. He did? Shame on him. Forget it, Mary. Hey, Lou. Get out of the way. That's the guy who put a slug in me. Looked like you're in pretty bad shape, Baxter. Doctor's coming. But he ain't gonna be able to help you. See, honey, you should have come back tomorrow. Shut up. Well, wouldn't have been half so painful. I want Bert Fisher. Yeah. Good for you. Get away from that door. Now, walk into that other room. Drop it back to you. You didn't want to play. Oh, you shouldn't have done that, Charlie. I needed him alive. That's gratitude for you. I knew you'd get into trouble, Diamond. So I tailed you from that last bar on 52nd. Is this uh, Mary Sinclair? Charmed, I'm sure. Ought to stay here. Call the wagon. Right. There's a doctor coming up. I doubt if he's legit. Wait for him, then bring him down to the station, Otis. Right. Come on, Miss Sinclair. Sure, honey. You know, Mr. Diamond, I think I'll have to break that date for tomorrow. Here are Baxter's things, Captain. Watch, wallet, nothing much. Yeah, let's check the wallet. Hmm, book of matches. 
Danny's Diner, Route 51. Check on that, Otis. Right. Nothing much in the wallet. Social security, driver's license, some money. Quite a lot of money. Want to take a look? Yeah. No addresses, huh? Here's a ticket to a shoe repair shop. Nothing much here that would give us a lead. Mm. Yeah. Danny's Diner is about 160 miles out on Route 51. And guess who runs it? Who? Chino Amalo. That does it. Call the authorities in that area. Right. Chino Amalo. Hmm. Eight years for armed robbery. Used to work for Bert Fisher. Yeah, maybe this is it. What time is it? Uh, going on seven. This better be it. We only have four hours. You've got to drive 160 miles. Captain Collins talked to the sheriff's office and set up a rendezvous with him near Danny's Diner. Then we piled into a squad car and roared across the 59th Street Bridge for Route 51. Step on it, Otis. We're to 180 now. Then to 90. It's getting late. Now, Rick, uh, you think we should bust right in the diner and take Amalo? No. Amalo doesn't know me. Never seen me. You stake out your men around the place and I'll go in. Give me a couple of minutes, then you come in, work on Amalo a little, and then leave. If he knows where Fisher is, you'll try to get in touch and I'll tag him. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, a cup of coffee and a piece of pie. You got raspberry, chocolate, lemon, peach, custard. Oh, uh, raspberry. Yeah. Hmm. Here you are. Uh, where's the closest gas station? About a mile down the road, but I think it's closed. It's after 10, closes at 10. Oh, thanks. Miss? Oh, miss? Yeah. Where's Tino Amalo? In the back. You want him? Call him. Sure. Hey, Mr. Amalo, someone wants to see you. Okay, be right there. Yeah, something I can do. Well, what are you doing way out here, Captain? This your book of matches? Yeah, that's the name of my place. Huh, these matches on Lou Baxter. Baxter's dead. Oh, that's too bad. You're not going to tie Baxter up with me, are you? Lots of people come in here and take my matches. If Baxter came in here, you saw him. You're an old friend. Well, sure, I, I know, Lou, but I ain't seen him in years. We got word your old boss is in town, Bert Fisher. Oh, is that right? Now, where we might find him? No, I haven't seen Bert in years either. Look, Captain, I've been going straight. Sure. You're uh, a little out of your territory, ain't you? This is unofficial. If you were in my jurisdiction, I'd haul you in. Look, I tell you, I'm going straight. I don't know nothing about Lou Baxter or Bert Fish. Okay, Amano. You may hear from me again. Well, nice seeing you again, Captain. Now, uh, miss. More coffee? Yeah. Where's the phone? Right over there on the wall. Is there another one? In the kitchen, but you can't use that. <laughs> hey, you can't go back there. Honey, it's the police. You stay where you are. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is Tino. Let me talk to Fish. I... Hey, what are you doing? Don't move, Amalo. What is this? Cover up that mouthpiece. Cover it up. Okay, okay. Now, when you get Fisher on the line, say what I tell you. Hold that receiver out so I can listen. Look, friend. You I... look. Say one thing wrong, and I'll use this gun. Your cop? None of your business. Well, look, look I... Uh, yeah, what do you want, Amalo? There he is. Tell him you just heard Baxter was killed. Hello, hello. Tell him, tell him. Uh, hello. Look, I, I just uh, just got news that the Baxter was killed. Yeah? Okay, anything else? Uh, no, that's all. Uh, no, no, that's all. So what's the matter with you? Uh, nothing, nothing. Okay. You got any more news? Keep in touch. Hang up. Now, where's Fisher hiding out? Get up. Where's Fisher hiding out? You dirty flat foot. You nearly bust my jaw. Only nearly? Where is he, Amalo? Well, you kill me if I tell you. That's getting late. Are you going to tell me? Okay, to... okay. He's, he's in a cabin about a mile up the road. Come on. You're going to show us. <laughs> It's just around that bend. Yeah, we better get out here and walk. How many men has he got in there with him, Chino? Uh, two. Now, whose cabin is it? Mine. Otis, get out and tell the rest of the men to douse their lights and come over here. Right, Captain. Uh, here's a piece of paper. Draw us the floor plan of that cabin. Here, I'll give you some light. Okay, go ahead, Amalo. 
How many rooms? There's three. Uh-huh. Hey, we're all set, Captain. Okay. One big room with a door here, a kitchen here, and a bedroom here. Oh. Where's Lieutenant Levinson? I've only been up there once since they got in. He, he was in the bedroom. How about closets, back door? Uh, one closet in the main room here, one in the bedroom here. Let's see, a broom closet in the kitchen and the back door here. Has it got an attic? I did, no, no. Where's Fisher's car? Parked around the back in the shed. Okay, I'll have the men stake out the place. You're going to take me up there, Amalo? Me? He's going to take us up there. You're a civilian, Rick. If there's any shooting to be done... If there's going to be any shooting, I'm going to be in on it. Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Who said I was going to take you guys up there anyway? I did. I, did. I told you everything I know. I ain't going to get my head shot off. You're going to walk us up there, Amalo, and you're going to knock on that door. No, no, no. And no. you're going to get them to open up. Look, they're loaded with artillery, shotguns. When the door opens, you duck. Okay, suicide. You heard what the captain said, Amalo. I'm a civilian. Without a badge, I'm allowed to get pretty nasty with you. Look, you can't make me do something I don't want. I know my rights, Captain. You know something, Rick? I think I'm catching a cold. I can't hear a thing. All right, now, wait a minute. I'll go check the men. I, uh, trust you'll not take advantage of the prisoner, Rick. I couldn't hear if he yelled or something. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, okay. Fine cop. All right, let's go. All right, men. Yes, sir. Listen now. I'm going up with Diamond. Three of you take that side of the house. Yes, Three sir. take the other. Uh, yes, sir. You and you go around in the back to the shed where the car is. Yeah. Otis? Yeah? You and this man cover the front, but stay out of sight. If it comes, it'll come in a hurry, so close in fast. Yes, and look, boys, the lieutenant's in the back room, so try and be as careful as you can. Uh, all set? Yep. Let's go, Amalo. Front window. It's 10 minutes of 11. I hope their watches aren't fast. Keep going, Amalo. Okay, Otis. You two drop here. Right, Captain. Good luck. What are you stopping for, Amalo? I I just remember they told me to yell if I came up. If you try to pull anything. No, no, no. Honest, honest. They told me to yell. Okay. You stay here. We're going up on that porch. Count 20, then yell. And play it smart. I won't fool with you, Amalo. Okay, okay, Captain, but I'm scared stiff. You're not alone. Come on, Charlie. That's what he's trying to do. He's a lad, Steve. He doesn't know what he's worried about. Get on that side of the door. Hey, Bert! Bert, it's me, Chino! Hey, Bert, I gotta see you! You alone? Uh, yeah, yeah. Can I come up? It's all right, Animad. Okay, come on up. Get him right back. Why are you doing it? Come on! One going in the back room. Take out! Okay, okay. Don't shoot anyone. I'm hurt. See you, Walt. Okay. Walt? Well, it's about time. Get these ropes off me. You okay, Walt? Yeah. Thanks, Charlie. What time is it? 11 o'clock. Happy birthday. Again, here's your Rexall family druggist. Once more, let me remind you that tomorrow, Rexall's mighty one-cent sale begins. The sale where you get two guaranteed Rexall products for the price of one plus a penny. For example, the pint bottle of MI-31, Rexall's famous mouthwash, regularly costs 69 cents. Tomorrow, you can get two bottles for just 70 cents. And remember, there are some 347 of these twin bargains, plus 85 other super specials. Make your pennies by dollars during Rexall's one-cent sale. Tomorrow through Monday at Rexall drugstores everywhere. Good health to all from Rexall. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards, 
with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. Dick Powell can soon be seen in the Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer production, Right Cross, in which he co-stars with June Allison and Ricardo Montalban. Featured in tonight's cast were Wilms Herbert, Bill Johnstone, Sidney Miller, John Stevenson, Arthur Q. Bryan, Virginia Gregg, and Jay Novello. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, is produced and directed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Bill Foreman inviting you to join us next week at this same time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Remember, tomorrow starts the four biggest bargain days in the year. Rexall's nationwide one-cent sale. The sale where you get two top-quality guaranteed Rexall products for the price of one plus one cent. Remember, tomorrow, Friday, Saturday, and the following Monday, just step inside a Rexall store where you buy twice as much for a penny more. Your chime master, Robert Young, is expecting you tomorrow on NBC. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Paul. Yeah? What's the matter? You, you got to do something for me. Hey, you're hurt. Yeah, yeah. I'm... Hey, hey, now, take it easy. Sit down. Oh, Sit no, down. you, you got to listen to me. You're bleeding all over the place. I'll call the doctor. No, please, please wait. But look, I've been knifed. I've been knifed bad. I don't think I've got much time. Here, take this. They're right behind me. I'm going to call the doctor. No, no, listen. Listen. Key. West. Get envelope to the... Oh. Hey. Hey, you. Oh, no. The man, whoever he was, had toppled over on his face and was very dead. He handed me a plain white envelope, sealed with no address on it. I went over to my desk to put in the call to homicide when I heard someone moving around in the hall. I turned and saw the shadow of a man silhouetted against the glass section of my office door. I grabbed a pen and hurriedly scribbled the address of Lieutenant Walter Levinson, 5th Precinct Homicide, on the envelope, stuck a stamp on it, then headed for the hallway. I was about to open the door when the shadow was joined by another one. They opened it for me. Uh, excuse me, gentlemen. Wait a minute. We want to ask uh, you... Later, so... later. I, I got hey, to mail a letter. Hey, stop him! Don't let him mail that thing! They were both big men and could run. I beat them to the mail chute by a split second and dropped the envelope. They made a dive for it, and when they missed, they forgot it and started concentrating on me. Oh. Where are your wings, honey? You look as though someone had beaten you up. No, don't be silly. It's the latest thing. Hey, I'm back in my office. I found you lying here. You want me to call a doctor? No, no, call homicide. Oh, someone did? Certainly. That guy right over... What time? Oh, dandy. Well, honey, there was a guy. In fact, he was lying just about where I'm lying, and he was dead. Look, you can see the blood. I thought that was your blood. Oh. Rather than try and convince you... Maybe you'd like to tell me why you came up to see me. Well, my name's Nancy Lang. I want to hire you. To do what? I'm giving a big party tonight, some very wealthy guests. I just want someone around to keep an eye on things. Well, I'd like to help you, but I've got a bit of a problem with a missing body. Oh, that's too bad. I was prepared to pay you $500 for the evening. Uh, $500? Well, so a body gets lost. Who wants to hunt a corpse when he can attend a perfectly good party? Well, good afternoon, Sergeant Otis. Oh, oh, how are you, Diamond? Still breathing. 
Why don't you try it sometime? Oh, go jump in the lake. Only if you'll lend me one of your shoes to paddle around in. No. Hello, Walt. Hi, Rick. Oh, no. What happened to you? Well, two charming gorillas used me for a fast game of squash. Who were they? Never saw them before. But I got a hunch they killed the guy. Let's have a look at your mug file. I gave Walt the story and told him about the mysterious envelope he would be getting in the mail. But after two hours of checking the rogues' gallery, we came up with nothing. So I went home, shaved and changed, and went out to my client's house, where she met me in a well-appointed library. Her appointments were, uh, well... Uh... Mr. Diamond, right on time. You look much better. Well, I, I tried to wear something that wouldn't clash with my bruises. I'd like you to meet Senor Giardo. Giardo? An old friend, a very wealthy politician from South America. This is Mr. Diamond, Mr. Giardo. Uh, how do you do, sir? Uh, how are you, Mr. Giardo? Mr. Diamond is a private detective. He's here to guard the wealth. How oh, very interesting. Kind of an official watchdog, Mr. Giardo. Well, there will certainly be enough to guard. Uh, Miss Lang's guest list is made up of some very wealthy and prominent personalities. In fact, I am very flattered to be among them. I, uh, I've seen you before. Oh, very possibly. Have you ever been to South America? A couple of times, but that's not it. And my home is in Bogota. No. Well, it doesn't matter. I'll think of it. If you'll excuse us, Mr. Guiardo, I want to show Mr. Diamond around the house and grounds. Uh, certainly, certainly. A pleasure meeting you, Mr. Diamond. <laughs> house was my father's. He died several years ago. He used to love this garden. It's beautiful. Smell the jasmine? Yes. What made you become a private detective? Oh, I don't know. I, I make a pretty good living. My own boss. I was a cop for a long time. I like to work. Now that's uh, quite a fountain. Trying to give Rockefeller Center competition. It looks beautiful with the lights on. There. Yes, it certainly does. You're not the type to be a private detective. Oh, I'm definitely the type. Sure, like everything else, it gets dull sometimes, but when things start popping, it can get pretty interesting. Like this afternoon? Getting beaten up? The man you said was killed in your office? Well, he wasn't killed there. He just died there. Besides, how many guys can wake up lying on their office floor and have a beautiful girl offer them $500 to come to a party? <laughs> I see what you mean. <laughs> Don't you think you'd better get back? Your guests are probably all right. Yes, I'll switch off the fountain light. Don't you leave them on. My father used to sit and watch it for hours. I don't like to show it to everyone. Hmm. Kind of like a part of the garden died. You certainly are a strange man. Never noticed myself. But I have. I like you. Uh... Where did you meet Mr. Guiardo? In South America. He was a good friend of my father's. Wealthy politician. That's right. Mr. Diamond. It's Rick. Rick? Yeah. Oh. I, uh, I think we'd better go back to the party. I'm a fairly normal guy. Nancy was a very exciting girl. And the kiss in the garden was as nice as anybody could ask for. But there's one thing I do pride myself in... And that's a certain lack of stupidity. There was something wrong, nothing I could put my finger on, but I sensed it. Like being lost in a dark room with a loose high tension wire. I circulated around and nothing out of the ordinary happened. By three o'clock, the party broke up and Signor Giardo and Nancy were the only ones left. A hey, most enjoyable party, Miss Lang. Oh, thank you. It was nice of you to come, Senor Gallo. Well, I must say good night. Uh, have you remembered where you have seen me before, Mr. Diamond? Well, uh, not yet, Mr. Gallo. Oh, it's too bad. Uh, thank you again for a charming evening, Miss Lang. Uh, good night, Mr. Diamond. Good night. Good night. Oh, God. A little beat myself. You want some coffee? Love it. <laughs> We had some coffee and Nancy drove me home. I kissed her goodnight and left with a promise to call. As I reached my floor, I could hear my phone ringing. I opened the door and stumbled into the biggest mess I'd seen in a long time. My room was a wreck. Someone had torn it to pieces. 
Yeah? Diamond? It's a quarter to four in the morning. What do you want, Fatty? We fished a body out of the river about an hour ago. Died from a knife wound in the back. Did he fit the description of the guy who died in my office? This one didn't fit any description. Someone was very careful to fix his face so we couldn't identify him. Check his fingerprints? You're playing around with some pretty gory individuals. They amputated his fingers. Ah. Oh. Somebody's given my room a good going over. Brady took it apart. It's an odds-on bet they were after that envelope. And when you get it tomorrow morning, give me a call. It might tell us everything we want to know. Okay. Walt, you ever heard of a man named Guillardo? South American, supposed to be mixed up in politics? No. Why? Nothing. I met him at the party tonight, and I... <laughs> Who is this? This is Lieutenant Levinson. Who is this? Mr. Diamond is unconscious. What? And if you ever want to see him alive again, listen carefully. Okay, go ahead. From Mr. Diamond's conversation, I understand you are to receive the envelope. When you do, go directly to the Staten Island Ferry. Ride on it, all day if necessary. A man will meet you and pick up the envelope. Be alone. Do not notify the police, or Mr. Diamond will surely die. Someone had sapped me and sapped me good. I had a dull, throbbing headache, and when I began to find my way back to consciousness, I felt my coat pulled off and my right shirt sleeve rolled up. There was a sharp pain in my upper arm, and several seconds later, my headache disappeared in a surge of heat that spread out over my back and shoulders. I tried to fight it, but it, but it was like being on a sinking ship, trying to crawl back up the slanting deck. The ship dragged me down, and I swallowed up in the black water. Next thing I remembered was a blinding circle of light overhead like the sun if you were looking at it through a sheet of wrinkled cellophane. I shut my eyes and I could hear voices far off, hollow, not making much sense. The light hurt my eyes, but I, I couldn't seem to shut it out. So I tried to relax and wait, give the drug time to wear off. After what seemed like hours, the voices began to make sense. The light was easier to look at. It was just a plain ceiling lamp. As the feeling in my fingers began to return, I realized I was lying on a bed. There's a restaurant on the corner. I won't be more than ten minutes. The other man had promised to be back in ten minutes, so I had to do something in a hurry. I kept tightening my muscles, trying to get the circulation back. I had to make a try. I wasn't sure of my strength, but I had to try. I rolled off the bed. Hey! Hey, coming out of it, huh? Trying to break your neck? He leaned down to pick me up, and I hit him just below the Adam's apple with the side of my open hand. <laughs> the man choked and turned blue. He grabbed for his shoulder holster, and I kicked out with both feet. He doubled over and fell on his face. The effort had put him out of commission, but I was exhausted. I grabbed his gun, staggered for the door. But getting out of that room was like wading through an acre of glue. I made the hall somehow and started down the steps. I met the other man coming up. His arms were filled with beer and sandwiches. I shot him right through his dinner. Feel better? Yeah, yeah, Walt. Uh, a little more coffee, huh? You really had a rough time. They pumped you full of the stuff. Yeah, I'm amazed. I was out nearly 14 hours, huh? Yeah, you lost a whole day. How you managed to get down here, I don't know. I guess I'll never know. Drink your coffee. Yep. Yeah. And uh, you gave them the envelope, huh? Yeah, about an hour before you staggered into the station. I rode that ferry all day. Five o'clock, a man came up to me, and I gave him the envelope. Oh, I was smart. 
I had three men on the ferry and three men at each landing to tail him. He was a little smarter. He took the envelope, stuck it in a waterproof case, and jumped overboard. Fast speedboat picked him up. No identification on the guy I shot? Uh, no record. Nothing on him by the time we got there. What did the other guy look like? I was so punchy I couldn't tell much. You'll have a sore throat for a long time. But they were the ones who beat you up yesterday at your office. They were. When you feel like it, I want you to take a look at that guy we dragged out of the river. See if you recognize his clothes or anything. He just might be the one who died in your office. All right. Now, uh, what was in that envelope? Well, I had a photostat made before I took it to the ferry. Looks like part of a map. Here. Hmm. So this is what's caused all the trouble. Boy, it must be worth a lot. Can you make anything out of it? Water. Section of land. And here's a... Oh, here's a longitude reading, but, uh... Hmm. No latitude reading. Probably on the other half. I wouldn't doubt it. Well, I've got a hunch about this. I want you to send Otis over to pick up Nancy Lang. Then take me over to the newspaper office and help me look at the files for something on a man named Guiardo. You know what you're looking for? Yeah, this guy Guiardo, Senor Guiardo. I know I've read about him or seen his picture. I... Hey, Walt. You find something? Yeah, here he is. But his real name isn't Guiardo, it's Ortiz. Yeah, look at those headlines. Julio Ortiz assassinated. Rebel leader killed after plot to take over government failed. Yeah, listen to this. Ortiz was expecting a large amount of American dollars to finance his army. Although the rumor is not confirmed, it was reported that Ortiz shipped a million dollars in gold bullion to someone in the United States. The plane was supposed to have crashed, and it is interesting to note that the recent plane crash in which two American pilots escaped, John Bishop and Bernard Combs, were found floating off Key West. Key West? Holy smoke, that's what the guy in my office tried to tell me. He said Key West before he died. Huh. Hey, Walt, don't you see? Ortiz is still alive. Maybe those two pilots double-crossed him. He hid the gold. That's what that map is all about. All eight to five, that man you've got down in the morgue is one of those pilots. John Bishop or Bernard Combs. I'll have the FBI send us the files on both those guys. If one of them is John Bishop or Bernard Combs, we won't need fingerprints nor a face. We'll check their dental records, birthmarks. Now, uh, let's get back and see if Otis has got the lovely Nancy Lang. That's right, Lieutenant Shane in town. She's gone on a vacation, a butler said. Did he say where? Uh, no, he said he didn't know. He said this Miss Lang left town about 4 o'clock this afternoon. And I'll bet she's with Ortiz. Walt, when you talk to the FBI about those two pilots, have them check Nancy Lang, too. I'm going to Key West. Send any information to the chief of police there. Well, I'm glad to know you, Diamond. We just got a teletype from the lieutenant identifying the body. It was Bernard Combs, one of the pilots. Hmm. Well, here's, here's the half of the map. Tell me, does that look like any section of coastline around here? Well, no, that's hard to say. I'll have a check. Uh, you ever heard of a man named John Bishop? He's the other pilot. Oh, sure. When them two boys was found floating around, they brought him into Key West. Mm -hmm. They was in the hospital here a couple of days. Bishop still lives in Key West. Well, I hope so. He may have died here very recently. And you think this here Ortiz is in Key West, too? I'll bet on it. He wants the other half of that map and may have it by now. He's got to go after that gold. You'll need a boat and some diving equipment. Well, what makes you think the gold's in the water? This map's got a shoreline, too. Well, those two pilots couldn't carry a million dollars in gold bullion. It either went down with the plane or they dumped it and then bailed out and let the plane crash. Well, I'll get Bishop's address. We'll go over and have a talk with him. He's on the next floor. Oh, I hope you're right. Well, that's where he's been living. Right down here. Bishop? Hey, Bishop. Door's locked. You got a pass key? Yeah. Bishop, you... Lord of mercy. Yeah. Is that Bishop? 
Yeah, that's him. Boy, he sure is dead. <laughs> Well, that accounted for the two pilots. So now all we had to do was find Julio Ortiz. It figured he now had both sections of the map, but his next move would be to hire a boat and diving equipment. There weren't many places in Key West where a man could rent a boat and diving equipment. So the chief rounded up his men, and we all started checking. It didn't take long. No, Captain. Party you hiding my ship we ain't come back yet. We ain't due to sail for an hour. What did the party look like? Pretty girl. Can't figure what she wants to go diving for, but I just ran them to keep my mouth shut. Mm, probably Nancy Lang. Ortiz is staying undercover until the last minute. Well, I'll spread my boys around. We'll keep out of sight. And when they show up, Skipper, you don't say nothing about us. Sure, sure. I just ran them to keep my mouth shut. About ready for that boat to sail. Well, they'll wait till the last minute. Hmm. Just imagine a million dollars in gold, just like a pirate story. Not enough killings mixed up with it to be one. Uh, hey, hold it. Is that them? Yeah, that's Nancy Lang. But Ortiz isn't with her. Who are them two fellas? I've never seen them before. Some of Ortiz's men. They're probably checking to see if everything's clear before Ortiz comes aboard. We got as close to the schooner as we could and waited. The two men walked over and checked the diving equipment while Nancy Lang went below. We kept waiting, and still Julio Ortiz didn't show. Hey, they started an engine. I don't see Ortiz anywhere. They're casting off. We better take them. Yep. We're gonna have to jump. I got for that one. He's got a gun. I got him jump. The other guy's running forward. Stop you! He's going over. Well, my man will pick him, huh? Yeah, I'm going below. <laughs> Hello, Nancy. How did you find him? Where's Ortiz? I don't know who you're talking about. Uh, is this the girl? Nancy Lang, meet Key West Chief of Police. How do you do? Where's Ortiz? She says she doesn't know who he is. Okay, young lady, I'm going to hold you for the New York authority. Hold me for what? Murder. John Bishop and Bernard Combs. So we can make it stick. It might go easier on you if you tell us where Ortiz is at. I still don't know any Ortiz. Guillardo, the man I met at your party. That's ridiculous. Now, look, we know all about the gold. You don't have a chance of raising it, and eventually we'll get Ortiz. Yeah, we're back at the dock. Uh, if you don't help us, Nancy, it's pretty sure you'll get life for complicity. And if I do help? I can't promise a thing, but it will make a difference with the court. Julio's waiting ten miles down the coast. We would pick him up, then go out and raise the gold. He has the map? Yes. I'll tell the skipper to shove off again. We'll sail that ten miles and grab Ortiz. What's your connection with Ortiz, Nancy? He's my husband. A dozen police officers came aboard and hit below decks. The skipper put out to sea and sailed parallel to the coast. Nancy told me all about her husband and his history as a rebel leader in South America. I was stranded in South America with a show that folded. I married Ortiz. After the gold was lost, he faked assassination and came to the United States. He located the two pilots. My husband was suspicious, so I played up to the one who came to your office. I got him drunk one night, and he told me about the gold and his half of the map. We've gone to ten miles. I'm glad it's over with. I see a man standing on the beach. Mr. Diamond. Yes? I was supposed to lure you into that garden. Figured. What I said at the fountain. I really... Oh, forget it. Yeah. No sense in making it any tougher. We pulled into a cove and got as close to shore as possible. Then we swung a dinghy over the side. The chief and I climbed in behind Nancy. We kept our hats down over our faces and hoped our tiz wouldn't notice until it was too late. We both rode and kept our backs to him. Nancy sat in the stern facing us. Rick... Now, we headed right. I don't want to turn around. You're headed all right. Rick, my husband has always been good to me. Well, I'm glad he was good to somebody. He sure made a mess out of a couple of guys I can think of. But he was good to me. Hey, we're nearly there. Hello, darling. Hello. Julio? Yes? The police are with me. Why, you stupid little... He's running for it. Save the girl. Uh, let him go. My men will pick him up. i got a score to settle. Ortiz, Stop. Okay. 
Well, that that makes the assassination permanent. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. This is Bill Foreman speaking. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. At the first sign of a cold, take Rexall antihistamine. Bottle of 15 tablets, only 39 cents, at Rexall drugstores everywhere. And now listen while the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Health to all from Rexall. Now your Rexall family druggist brings you a transcribed half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Mr. Diamond? Yeah? What's the matter? You got to do something for me. Hey, you're hurt. Yeah, yeah. I... Hey, hey, now take it easy. Sit down. Oh, Sit no, down. you, you got to listen to me. You're bleeding all over the place. I'll call the doctor. No, please, please wait. But look, I've been friend... knifed. I've been knifed bad. I don't think I've got much time. Here, here take this. They're right behind me. I'm going to call the doctor. No, no, listen. Listen. Key or west. Get envelope to the. Oh. Hey. Hey, you. Oh, no. The man, whoever he was, had toppled over on his face and was very dead. He handed me a plain white envelope, sealed with no address on it. I went over to my desk to put in a called homicide when I heard someone moving around in the hall. I turned and saw the shadow of a man silhouetted against the glass section of my office door. I grabbed a pen and hurriedly scribbled the address of Lieutenant Walter Levinson, 5th Precinct Homicide, on the envelope... Stuck a stamp on it, then headed for the hallway. I was about to open the door when the shadow was joined by another one. They opened it for me. Oh, hey, excuse me, gentlemen. Wait a minute, we want to ask uh, you... Later, stop. later. I, I got hey. to mail a letter. Hey, stop him! Don't let him mail that thing! They were both big men and could run. I beat them to the mail chute by a split second and dropped the envelope. They made a dive for it, and when they missed, they forgot it and started concentrating on me. Oh! You look as though someone had beaten you up. No, don't be silly. It's the latest thing. Hey, I'm back in my office. I found you lying here. You want me to call a doctor? No, no, call homicide. Well, someone did. Certainly. That guy right over the... What guy? Oh, dandy. Well, honey, there was a guy. In fact, he was lying just about where I'm lying, and he was dead. Look, you can see the blood. I thought that was your blood. Oh. Well, rather than try and convince you... Maybe you'd like to tell me why you came up to see me. Well, my name's Nancy Lang. I want to hire you. To do what? I'm giving a big party tonight, some very wealthy guests. I just want someone around to keep an eye on things. Well, I'd like to help you, but I've got a bit of a problem with a missing body. Oh, well, that's too bad. 
I was prepared to pay you $500 for the evening. Uh, $500? Do- oh, well, so a body gets lost. Who wants to hunt a corpse when he can attend a perfectly good party? Well, good afternoon, Sergeant Otis. Oh. oh, how are you, Diamond? Still breathing. Why don't you try it sometime? Oh, go jump in the lake. Only if you'll lend me one of your shoes to paddle around in. No. Hello, Walt. Hi, Rick. Oh, no. What happened to you? Well, two charming gorillas used me for a fast game of squash. Who were they? Never saw them before. But I got a hunch they killed the guy. Let's have a look at your mug file. I gave Walt the story and told him about the mysterious envelope he would be getting in the mail. But after two hours of checking the rogues' gallery, we came up with nothing. So I went home, shaved and changed, and went out to my client's house, where she met me in a well-appointed library. Her appointments were, uh, well... uh... Mr. Diamond, right on time. You look much better. Well, I, I tried to wear something that wouldn't clash with my bruises. I'd like you to meet Senor Giardo. Giardo? An old friend, a very wealthy politician from South America. This is Mr. Diamond, Mr. Giardo. Uh, how do you do, sir? Uh, how are you, Mr. Giardo? Mr. Diamond is a private detective. He's here to guard the wealth. How very interesting. Kind of an official watchdog, Mr. Giardo. Well, there will certainly be enough to guard. Uh, Miss Lang's guest list is made up of some very wealthy and prominent personalities... In fact, I am very flattered to be among them. I, uh, I've seen you before. Oh, very possibly. Have you ever been to South America? A couple of times, but that's not it. My home is in Bogota. No. Well, it doesn't matter. I'll think of it. If you'll excuse us, Mr. Guiardo, I want to show Mr. Diamond around the house and grounds. Uh, certainly, certainly. A pleasure meeting you, Mr. Diamond. <laughs> house was my father's. He died several years ago. He used to love this garden. It's beautiful. Smell the jasmine? Yes. What made you become a private detective? Oh, I don't know. I, I make a pretty good living. My own boss. I was a cop for a long time. I like to work. And that's uh, quite a fountain. Trying to give Rockefeller set a competition? It looks beautiful with the lights on There. Yes, it certainly does. You're not the type to be a private detective. Oh, I'm definitely the type. Sure, like everything else, it gets dull sometimes, but when things start popping, it can get pretty interesting. Like this afternoon? Getting beaten up? The man you said was killed in your office? Well, he wasn't killed there. He just died there. Besides, how many guys can wake up lying on their office floor and have a beautiful girl offer them $500 to come to a party? <laughs> I see what you mean. <laughs> Don't you think you'd better get back? Your guests are probably arriving. Yes, I'll switch off the fountain light. Don't you leave them on. Your guests would, would love it. My father used to sit and watch it for hours. I don't like to show it to everyone. Hmm. Kind of like a part of the garden died. You certainly are a strange man never noticed myself. Well, I have. I like you. Uh, where did you meet Mr. Guiardo? In South America. He was a good friend of my father's. Wealthy politician. That's right. Mr. Diamond. It's Rick. Rick. Yeah? Oh. I, uh, I think we'd better go back to the party. I'm a fairly normal guy. Nancy was a very exciting girl. And the kiss in the garden was as nice as anybody could ask for. But there's one thing I do pride myself in, and that's a certain lack of stupidity. There was something wrong, nothing I could put my finger on, but I sensed it. Like being lost in a dark room with a loose high-tension wire. I circulated around and nothing out of the ordinary happened. By three o'clock, the party broke up and Signor Giardo and Nancy were the only ones left. A hey, most enjoyable party, Miss Lang. Oh, thank you. It was nice of you to come, Signor Giardo. Well, I must say good night. 
Uh, have you remembered where you have seen me before, Mr. Diamond? Well, uh, not yet, Mr. Giardo. Oh, that's too bad. Uh, thank you again for a charming evening, Miss Lang. Uh, good night, Mr. Diamond. Good night. Good night. Oh, I'm exhausted. A little beat myself. You want some coffee? Love it. We had some coffee and Nancy drove me home. I kissed her goodnight and left with a promise to call. As I reached my floor, I could hear my phone ringing. I opened the door and stumbled into the biggest mess I'd seen in a long time. My room was a wreck. Someone had torn it to pieces. Yeah? Diamond? It's a quarter to four in the morning. What do you want, Fatty? We fished a body out of the river about an hour ago. Died from a knife wound in the back. Did he fit the description of the guy who died in my office? This one didn't fit any description. Someone was very careful to fix his face so we couldn't identify him. Check his fingerprints. You're playing around with some pretty gory individuals. They amputated his fingers. Oh. Somebody's given my room a good going over. Really took it apart. It's an odds-on bet they were after that envelope. And when you get it tomorrow morning, give me a call. It might tell us everything we want to know. Okay. Walt... You ever heard of a man named Guillardo, South American, supposed to be mixed up in politics? No. Why? Nothing. I met him at the party tonight. Not... Hey, what's the racket? You met this guy at a party in, in what? Rick. Rick, what's the matter? Rick! Who is this? This is Lieutenant Levinson. Who is this? Mr. Diamond is unconscious. What? And if you ever want to see him alive again, listen carefully. Okay, go ahead. From Mr. Diamond's conversation, I understand you are to receive the envelope. When you do, go directly to the Staten Island Ferry. Ride on it, all day if necessary. A man will meet you and pick up the envelope. Be alone. Do not notify the police, or Mr. Diamond will surely die. Now back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Someone had sapped me and sapped me good. I had a dull, throbbing headache, and when I began to find my way back to consciousness, I felt my coat pulled off and my right shirt sleeve rolled up. There was a sharp pain in my upper arm, and several seconds later, my headache disappeared in a surge of heat that spread out over my back and shoulders. I tried to fight it, but it, but it was like being on a sinking ship, trying to crawl back up the slanting deck. The ship dragged me down, and I swallowed up in the black water. next thing I remembered was a blinding circle of light overhead like the sun if you were looking at it through a sheet of wrinkled cellophane. I shut my eyes and I could hear voices far off, hollow, not making much sense. The light hurt my eyes, but I, I couldn't seem to shut it out. So I tried to relax and wait, give the drug time to wear off. After what seemed like hours, the voices began to make sense. The light was easier to look at. It was just a plain ceiling lamp. As the feeling in my fingers began to return, I realized I was lying on a bed. There's a restaurant on the corner. I won't be more than ten minutes. The other man had promised to be back in ten minutes, so I had to do something in a hurry. I kept tightening my muscles, trying to get the circulation back. I had to make a try. I wasn't sure of my strength, but I had to try. I rolled off the bed. Hey! Hey, coming out of it, huh? You trying to break your neck? He leaned down to pick me up, and I hit him just below the Adam's apple with the side of my open hand. <laughs> the man choked and turned blue. He grabbed for his shoulder holster, and I kicked out with both feet. He doubled over and fell on his face. 
the effort had put him out of commission, but I was exhausted. I grabbed his gun, staggered for the door. But getting out of that room was like wading through an acre of glue. I made the hall somehow and started down the steps. I met the other man coming up. His arms were filled with beer and sandwiches. I shot him right through his dinner. Feel better? Yeah, yeah, Walt. Uh, a little more coffee, huh? You really had a rough time. They pumped you full of this stuff. Yeah, I'm amazed. I was out nearly 14 hours, huh? Yeah, you lost a whole day. How you managed to get down here, I don't know. I guess I'll never know. Drink your coffee. Yeah. And uh, you gave them the envelope, huh? Yeah, about an hour before you staggered into the station. I rode that ferry all day. Five o'clock, a man came up to me, and I gave him the envelope. Oh, I was smart. I had three men on the ferry and three men at each landing to tail him. He was a little smarter. He took the envelope, stuck it in a waterproof case, and jumped overboard. Fast speedboat picked him up. No identification on the guy I shot? Eh, no record. Nothing on him by the time we got there. What did the other guy look like? I was so punchy I couldn't tell much. You'll have a sore throat for a long time. But they were the ones who beat you up yesterday at your office. They were. When you feel like it, I want you to take a look at that guy we dragged out of the river. See if you recognize his clothes or anything. He just might be the one who died in your office. All right. Now, uh, what was in that envelope? Well, I had a photostat made before I took it to the ferry. Looks like part of a map. Here. Hmm. So this is what's caused all the trouble. Boy, it must be worth a lot. Can you make anything out of it? Water, section of land, and here's a, oh, here's a longitude reading, but uh, hmm, no latitude reading. Probably on the other half. I wouldn't doubt it. Well, I've got a hunch about this. I want you to send Otis over to pick up Nancy Lang, then take me over to the newspaper office and help me look at the files for something on a man named Giardo. You know what you're looking for? Yeah, this guy Giardo, Senor Giardo. I know I've read about him or seen his picture. I... Hey, Walt. You find something? Yeah, here he is. But his real name isn't Giardo, it's Ortiz. Yeah, look at those headlines. Julio Ortiz assassinated. Rebel leader killed after plot to take over government fails. Yeah, listen to this. Ortiz was expecting a large amount of American dollars to finance his army. Although the rumor is not confirmed, it was reported that Ortiz shipped a million dollars in gold bullion to someone in the United States. The plane was supposed to have crashed, and it is interesting to note that the recent plane crash in which two American pilots escaped, John Bishop and Bernard Combs, were found floating off Key West. Key West? Holy smoke, that's what the guy in my office tried to tell me. He said Key West before he died. Huh. Hey, Walt, don't you see? Ortiz is still alive. Maybe those two pilots double-crossed him and hid the gold. That's what that map is all about. All eight to five, that man you've got down in the morgue is one of those pilots. John Bishop or Bernard Combs. I'll have the FBI send us the files on both those guys. If one of them is John Bishop or Bernard Combs, we won't need fingerprints nor a face. We'll check their dental records, birthmarks. Uh, let's get back and see if Otis has got the lovely Nancy Lang. That's right, Lieutenant Shane in town. She's gone on a vacation, a butler said. Did he say where? Uh, no, he said he didn't know. He said this Miss Lang left town about 4 o'clock this afternoon. And I'll bet she's with Ortiz. Walt, when you talk to the FBI about those two pilots, have them check Nancy Lang, too. I'm going to Key West. Send any information to the chief of police there. Well, I'm glad to know you, Diamond. We just got a teletype from the lieutenant identifying the body. It was Bernard Combs, one of the pilots. Hmm. Well, here's, here's the half of the map. Tell me, does that look like any section of coastline around here? Well, no, that's hard to say. I'll have it checked. Uh, you ever heard of a man named John Bishop? He's the other pilot. Oh, sure. When them two boys was found floating around, they brought him into Key West. Mm -hmm. 
They was in the hospital here a couple of days. Bishop still lives in Key West. Well, I hope so. He may have died here very recently. And you think this year Ortiz is in Key West, too? I'll bet on it. He wants the other half of that map and may have it by now. He's got to go after that goal. You'll need a boat and some diving equipment. Well, what makes you think the goal's in the water? This map's got a shoreline, too. Well, well those two pilots couldn't carry a million dollars in gold bullion. It either went down with the plane or they dumped it and then bailed out and let the plane crash. Well, I'll get Bishop's address. We'll go over and have a talk with him. He's on the next floor. Oh, I hope you're right. Well, that's where he's been living. Right down here. Bishop? Hey, Bishop. Door's locked. You got a pass key? Yeah. Bishop, you... Lord of mercy. Yeah. Is that Bishop? Yeah, that's him. Boy, he sure is dead. <laughs> Well, that accounted for the two pilots. So now all we had to do was find Julio Ortiz. It figured he now had both sections of the map, and his next move would be to hire a boat and diving equipment. There weren't many places in Key West where a man could rent a boat and diving equipment. So the chief rounded up his men, and we all started checking. It didn't take long. No, Captain. The party hiding my ship ain't come back yet. We ain't due to sail for an hour. What did the party look like? Pretty girl. Can't figure what she wants to go diving for, but I just ran them to keep my mouth shut. Mm, probably Nancy Lang. Ortiz is staying undercover until the last minute. Well, I'll spread my boys around. We'll keep out of sight. And when they show up, Skipper, you don't say nothing about us. Sure, sure. I just ran them to keep my mouth shut. About ready for that boat to sail. No, they'll wait till the last minute. Hmm. Just imagine a million dollars in gold, just like a pirate story. Not enough killings mixed up with it to be one. Uh, hey, hold it. Is that them? Ah, uh, that's Nancy Lang. But Ortiz isn't with her. Who are them two fellas? I've never seen them before. Some of Ortiz's men. They're probably checking to see if everything's clear before Ortiz comes aboard. <laughs> We got as close to the schooner as we could and waited. The two men walked over and checked the diving equipment while Nancy Lang went below. We kept waiting, and still Julio Ortiz didn't show. Hey, they started an engine. I don't see Ortiz anywhere. They're casting off. We better take them. Yep. We're gonna have to jump. Look out for that one. He's got a gun. I got him jump. The other guy's running forward. Stop! You! He's going over. Well, my men will pick him, huh? Yeah, I'm going below. Captain, what in the world? Hello, Nancy. How did you find me? Where's Ortiz? I don't know who you're talking about. Uh, is this the girl? Nancy Lang, meet Key West's chief of police. How do you do? Where's Ortiz? She says she doesn't know who he is. Okay, young lady, I'm going to hold you for the New York authorities. Hold me for what? Murder. John Bishop and Bernard Combs, so we can make it stick. It might go easier on you if you tell us where Ortiz is at. I still don't know any Ortiz. Guillardo, the man I met at your party. That's ridiculous. Now, look, we know all about the gold. You don't have a chance of raising it, and eventually we'll get Ortiz. Yeah, we're back at the dock. Now, if you don't help us, Nancy, it's pretty sure you'll get life for complicity. And if I do help? I can't promise a thing, but it will make a difference with the court. Julio is waiting ten miles down the coast. We were to pick him up, then go out and raise the gold. He has the map? Yes. I'll tell the skipper to shove off again. We'll sail that ten miles and grab Ortiz. What's your connection with Ortiz, Nancy? He's my husband. A dozen police officers came aboard and hid below decks. The skipper put out to sea and sailed parallel to the coast. Nancy told me all about her husband and his history as a rebel leader in South America. I was stranded in South America with a show that folded. I married Ortiz. After the gold was lost, he faked assassination and came to the United States. We located the two pilots. My husband was suspicious, so I played up to the one who came to your office. 
I got him drunk one night, and he told me about the gold in his half of the map. We've gone to ten miles. I'm glad it's over with. I see a man standing on the beach. Mr. Diamond. Yes? I was supposed to lure you into that garden. Figured. What I said at the fountain. I really... Oh, forget it. Yeah. No sense making it any tougher. We pulled into a cove and got as close to shore as possible. Then we swung a dinghy over the side. The chief and I climbed in behind Nancy. We kept our hats down over our faces and hoped Ortiz wouldn't notice until it was too late. We both rode and kept our backs to him. Nancy sat in the stern facing us. Rick. Yeah? We headed right. I don't want to turn around. You're headed all right. Rick, my husband has always been good to me. Well, I'm glad he was good to somebody. He sure made a mess out of a couple of guys I can think of. But he was good to me. Hey, we're nearly there. Hello, darling. Hello. Julio? Yes? The police are with me. Why, you stupid little... He's running for it. Stay with the girl. Let him go. My men will pick him up. I got a score to settle. Ortiz, stop. Okay. Well, that, that makes the assassination permanent. Again, here's your Rexall family druggist. Good health to all from Rexall. Richard Diamond, private detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music by Frank Worth. Dick Powell may currently be seen in the Metro-Golden-Mayer production, Right Cross, in which he co-stars with June Allison and Ricardo Montalban. Featured in tonight's cast were Barton Yarborough, Barney Phillips, Virginia Gregg, Wilms Herbert, Arthur Q. Bryan, and Luke Krugman. Richard Diamond, private detective, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Bill Foreman inviting you to join us next week at this time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency, murders are better than ever. Mr. Diamond? I stand condemned. Uh, my name is Arnold Bryce. I'm an art collector. Well, unless you're looking for empty beer bottles, I'm afraid you have the wrong man. You're a detective, aren't you? That's right. Well, then you're the man I want. How soon can you come over to my home? Well, that depends on two things, where you live and what you want me for. I live at 9607 Riverside Drive, but I'd rather tell you the nature of your assignment in person, if you don't mind. Well, that suits me, but my fee is 100 a day in expenses. Still want me to come over? Money is no object, Mr. Diamond. Please hurry. <laughs> Uh, my name's Diamond. I'd like to see Mr. Bryce. Mr. Arnold Bryce? That's right. Well, come in, sir. Thank you. Mr. Bryce is busy with an art dealer in the library, sir. You can wait in the gallery. The gallery? The art gallery. This way, sir. He led me down the hall and into a room that looked like it was once a den. There was a piano in the room, and hanging over the fireplace was a large painting of the Mona Lisa. The other three walls were all covered with pictures, too. This, I took it, was the gallery. 
Just make yourself comfortable, sir. I'll tell Mr. Brasher here when he's finished. Thank you. Beautiful room, isn't it? Hmm? Oh, oh, yes, yes. Lots of paintings. I didn't mean the paintings. I meant the room. Oh, I take it you don't like the art? No, sir. I only appreciate what I can see in the picture. This room used to be a study until Mr. Arnold Bryce came. And who had it before? Mr. Jasper Bryce. He died two months ago and left this house to Mr. Arnold. Well, I must get on with my work, sir. The butler gave a disgusted look at the paintings and took his leave. Come to think of it, I agreed with the old boy. Most of the paintings were what is called modern, which is sort of a nasty poke at the present period. Hi there. If you're a burglar, just help yourself. Take them all if you want to. Well, I didn't know I had company. That's because you're not a very good burglar. You should be more careful. You, no doubt, are the local police force. <laughs> no, I won't turn you in. I... Oh... What's the use? Used to be I could joke. Used to be I liked to joke. Now it's no fun. Who are you, really? What do you want here? Can I fix you a drink? Hey, that's a lot of questions for a little girl. Little girl. <laughs> she staggered over to a couch and sat down while I took a good look at her. Beautiful is a word thrown around a lot these days, but it could only describe her. She had soft brown hair, big brown eyes, with a sort of a pleading look about them. She was wearing a pair of lounging pajamas, but her figure was nothing to speak of. When you found one like this, you kept the news to yourself. Ugly. What's that? I said ugly. Oh. Meaning those pictures. You like pictures? Oh, you look like the type who would like pictures. Well, I'm flattered. Look at that one. Do you ever see such a mess? That's night chasing away the morning in September. Well, you could have fooled me. That's my husband's favorite. You a friend of my husband? No. Neither am I. All he does is buy paintings. He's a nut about paintings. He should have married one. You must be Mrs. Bryce. I must be. Then that's life. Oh, who'd you say you were? I didn't, but the name's Diamond. My name's Della. You know... Mr. Diamond, Mr. Bryce will see you now. Oh, get lost, Timothy. Mr. Diamond and I are just getting acquainted. But Mr. Bryce said... Mr. Bryce. Mr. Bryce. All right, you better go and see him, Mr... Diamond. My husband hates to be kept waiting. Me, I'd rather be alone anyway. I'm going to sit here till I figure out just why in Blaze's night is chasing morning away in September. I left Della Bryce staring at the picture and followed Timothy to the library. Inside, I met Mr. Arnold Bryce. He was a big man and looked old enough to be Della's father. On the desk lay another modern painting, and he sat admiring it like it was the deed to the Taj Mahal. Look at it, Diamond. Look at it. Uh, yes. Um... A masterpiece. Masterpiece. Well, it's original, all right. Of course. I buy nothing but originals. Can't stand copies, can you? Well, I, I really haven't thought about it lately. I, uh, tell me, is this a uh, masterpiece what you wanted to see me about? Oh, no, 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 no. Just thought you'd enjoy seeing it. Mm-hmm. Well, now that we've had our kick, suppose we get on to business. Fine, fine. Mr. Diamond... I'm number 34 on this city's social register. Do you follow me? No, I'm about six millionth. Please, sir, I'm very serious. Sorry. Now then, one in my position must be discreet. Divorce, heaven's knows, is scandal enough, but, well, to have a roust about for a wife, that I cannot tolerate. Heaven's no. I was married a little over six months ago, and, to be frank, Mr. Diamond, my wife doesn't like me. Go on. That's all. I want to get rid of her. Uh, Mr. Bryce, I'm a detective, not an assassin. Of course, of course. I, I want you to help me find grounds for divorce. Oh. Well, a case like this can take a long while. And a hundred a day, that can add up to quite a bill. I hired you because I've heard you're the finest detective in New York. Oh. <laughs> well, thanks for the flattery, but the fee is still a hundred a day. And I told you over the phone money meant nothing to me. Here. Here's a check I made out to you. It's for $500. That should serve as a retainer. Well, uh, yes, that's... Uh, well, I... Now then, we can get on with this. Uh, I think my wife is in love with another man. No. Yes. And I think that... <laughs> I keep forgetting these walls are soundproof. Uh, we've only lived in this house a few weeks. My Uncle Jasper left it to me. Yes, your butler told me. Uh, Timothy? Mm -hmm. Well, Doc Timothy. Uncle Jasper left... Me, him, too. Oh. Well, uh, let's get back to your wife. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, Mr. Diamond, when I married Della, 
I thought we'd be well suited. She's very beautiful. And, uh... Uh, Guess where we met? I have no idea. In an art gallery. Naturally, I thought Della would be an art lover like myself. I could just picture her sitting in front of the fire on cold winter evenings, gazing at my originals. Thrilling thought. Yes, but it wasn't to be. Della deceived me. She hates my paintings. Well, it takes all kinds to make a world. Yes, but my world is art, Mr. Diamond, and Della is no part of my world. I see, but that uh, hardly sounds like grounds for divorce, Mr. Bryant. Oh, I realize that, but maybe this is. You see, Della used to date a boy named David Tharp. Now she's been going out a lot lately, and I think she may be seeing him again. Mm Mm-hmm. You think? Well, I... Oh, I know it really may be nothing, but if she should be seeing him and we could prove it, wouldn't that be grounds? Well, no, no, possibly. Now, now this boy used to work for the Gorman department store. And if he's still in town, I want him watched. All right, I'll, uh, I'll check with the store and report to you later. Good, good. Timothy will show you out, Mr. Diamond. I left Mr. Arnold Bryce admiring the monstrosity he had purchased earlier. On the way out, I took another peek into the gallery to see if Della Bryce was still around. She wasn't. And then I noticed the Mona Lisa again. Somehow it seemed so out of place. I was staring at it when Timothy came up behind me. I see you admire the lady. Say, don't you ever make noise? Beautiful, isn't she? The Mona Lisa? Yes, look at that face. The most lovely face in the world. I thought you didn't like art. Not what Mr. Bryce calls art. Only that picture. Do you know about it? Do I know about it? Oh, so many things. It really has a colorful history... Da Vinci painted her over 400 years ago. No. Yes. Zenobe del Giocondo's wife posed for Leonardo four years before it was finished. My, my. Everyone loves it. Francis I of France paid 4,000 golden florins for it. You really know the facts, huh? Oh, yes, sir. I've read many books about La Gioconda's history. I come here often and just stare into her face. Do you know that men have stared into the mystery of that face and then... Killed themselves? You don't say. Yes. But I'm probably boring you this way, sir. He took a last tender look at the picture and then led the way to the door. It was a crazy house full of crazy people and felt good to be outside again. The job I had was strictly routine, but as long as Bryce paid for my services, he'd get them. I took off for lunch, then went to the Gorm department store to find David Tharp. There, I found Thart, had joined the Army six weeks ago and was now stationed in California. That meant that Bryce's suspicions about his wife were unfounded, at least as far as Thart was concerned. Hello? Let me speak to Mr. Bryce. Who's this? Oh, that worn-out voice sounds familiar. Walt? Yeah, is this Diamond? Yeah, but what are you doing there? Or did I dial the wrong number? You calling Arnold Bryce, Rick? That's right. Then you have the right number. Was he a client of yours? Uh Uh-oh. I don't like the way you said was. You guessed it. Better get over here, Rick. Arnold Bryce has been murdered. In my pocket was a check for $500, signed by one Arnold Bryce. The same Arnold Bryce was now dead, according to Lieutenant Walt Levinson, who was very reliable in these matters. I took a cab to the Bryce home on Riverside Drive... Timothy, the tall, gaunt butler, again let me in. His expression hadn't changed since I'd seen him earlier. Well, Timothy, a lot of excitement around here, huh? Yes, sir. The police are in the gallery. So is Mr. Arnold's body. Gruesome sight. Rick. Hello, Walt. He's in there. Want to have a look at him? Why not? The boys in the lab are all finished. There. There he is. Head bashed then, huh? Coroner says he's been dead for about two hours. That place is the time of the murder around noon. Found the murder weapon? No. Figured it must be the missing poker from this fireplace set. Got the boys upstairs now looking for it. Who found the body, Walt? Mrs. Bryce. Otis is in the library now taking her statement. What's your angle in this? Well, uh, Bryce hired me for some stock investigating. He was thinking of divorcing his wife. Well, at last we've got a motive. She finds out he's getting rid of her and knocks him off. Oh, maybe. Who else was in the house? It's the butler, the maid, and Mrs. Bryce. Otis is sure the butler did it. 
been reading murder mysteries again. No. How about visitors? Anyone come to see Bryce around noon? No, apparently not. Looks like an inside job, Rick. We've got three suspects, and all we can do is grill them till one of them breaks down. So we might as well start on the wife. Mind if I sit in? No. Come on. We left the gallery and walked down to the library. Inside sat Della Bryce, patiently answering the questions of that master detective, that super sleuth, Sergeant Otis Loveloon. Hello, Lieutenant. I got a statement down on paper, and I'm asking some questions on my own. She's, uh... Oh, Diamond. Don't look so happy, Otis. Hello, Mrs. Bryce. Well, you come back. That man, Lieutenant, he's the one who saw my husband earlier. Yes, we know that, Mrs. Bryce. This is Richard Diamond. He's a private detective. Oh, well, what would Arnold want with a private detective? It seems he was planning to divorce you. Or didn't you know that yet? Divorce me? <laughs> You're kidding. <laughs> you want to tell us the joke, too, Mrs. Bryce? Oh, this is a good one. <laughs> oh, come now. Maybe it's Otis, Walt. After all, she's been looking at that face of his for an hour. Can you blame her? Hey, I heard that. Oh, I'm sorry, but that just struck me funny. That worm of a husband was going to divorce me. Well, I've already talked to a lawyer about getting rid of him. I take it you and Mr. Bryce didn't get along? You said it. I married Arnold because I thought it'd be fun to have a big home and a nice car. All those things money can buy. Go on. Well, the money part was okay, but Arnold... Well, a girl can only take so much. It's a nice, respectful way to speak of the dead. All right, so he's dead. So now I get all that money and don't have to put up with Arnold. I should cry? Maybe a jury will think you picked up a poker in order to get that money. Now, look. Just because I'm not crying and moaning about how much I loved Arnold doesn't mean I killed him. I didn't. We'll decide that. And will you please tell this baboon to stop asking me questions another hour and here with him and I'd confess to anything? Good old Otis, the traveling third degree. Now look, Shamus. Take it easy, Otis. Now, Mrs. Bryce, you say you were upstairs fixing your hair around noon? That's right. What about your lunch? Don't you eat? I'm on a diet. Look, it's all there in my statement. Around one o'clock, I came downstairs and found the body. I called the police and that's all I know. Well, then if you're innocent, you won't object to answering questions. So make yourself comfortable. Walt kept asking questions and Della kept answering them. Half an hour later, Walt was getting tired. Della was getting tired and I was already tired. Grilling a suspect is the most boring thing in the world. And it was a relief when Walt sent the girl upstairs. Otis, you see that she goes to her room and then bring that maid in here. Right, Lieutenant. Well, Rick, what do you think? I think she's innocent, Walt. Oh, you do? And why? Because she leaves herself wide open. She admits she's glad the guy's dead. So maybe that's all a front to throw suspicion off her. She makes everything point toward her, and she thinks we'll figure she couldn't be that dumb. Mm, maybe, but uh, I don't think so. I think Otis was right. Huh? What are you talking about? Well, you said he thought the butler did it. So do I. Rick, I'm in no mood for jokes. Look, Walt, the guy was bashed in the head, right? The top of the head. Now, Bryce is close to six feet tall. So is Timothy. Della's too short. She couldn't hit him on top of the head unless you stood on a ladder. Yeah, I thought of that. But you can't convict a guy because he's tall enough to hit Bryce on top of the head. Besides, maybe Bryce stooped over to tie a shoelace. Any number of reasons. Mm, maybe, maybe. But I, I still bet Timothy killed him. Okay, Sherlock. Tell me one more thing. Why? Why did he kill him? He'd only worked for him two weeks. No money's missing. Where's the motive? I'm not sure, Walt. But I think it's in a picture. Huh? Oh, now, Rick. Walt, when I was here earlier, I talked to Timothy in the art gallery. We talked about the Mona Lisa. Well, what about it? He knew everything about it. A lot of its history. Now, here's a guy who hates all these paintings around but one, the Mona Lisa. But what's it doing here? What's what doing here? The Mona Lisa. Bryce told me himself he only collected originals. But the Mona Lisa hangs in the Louvre in France. That picture over the fireplace is only a copy, and Bryce hated copies. Go on. That's all. I don't know exactly why or how all this happened. I only know things don't add up. Timothy's admiration for that one painting and what's it doing here. Hmm. And somewhere in there you think there's a murder motive. Why not? Sure, Della might have killed him for the money. That's a nice, big, fat motive. 
But, Walt, how many murders have big, fat motives? Darn few. Well, you're right there. A girl kills her sister because she called her fatty. A man shoots his wife for nagging. A woman poisons her neighbor for gossiping. A lot of little things can turn a twisted mind into a murderous mind. Okay, okay. But this picture angle doesn't impress me. Where's the motive? Even a small one. I can't... Here's the maid, Lieutenant. In here, miss. Oh, Lieutenant, I am so sorry about this thing. I am feeling to cry. Please, you can't think I have anything to do with it. I hardly know, Mr. Wright. Uh, just <laughs> sit down, miss. We just want you to answer some questions. Now, don't be frightened, dear. We... We don't think you killed Mr. Bryce, but you might help us find out who did. Oh, well, I'm glad to help. Good. Now, uh, how long have you worked here? Oh, well, let me see. It has been, uh, uh, five years. Uh, five years they have been here. He worked for Mr. Bryce's uncle. Then when he died, they stay on. Uh-huh. And Timothy, how long has he worked here? Oh, yes, my Timothy has been here all his life. He has told me about it. His father worked for the old Mr. Jasper Bryce and his mother, too. Timothy, he grew up in that house. Then when his father died, he'd take over his job. I see. Now, uh, about the young Mr. Bryce, Arnold. Was he easy to get along with? Well, you don't know him so well, but they have no trouble with him. Timothy does not agree with him at times, but they have no trouble. Timothy doesn't agree with him? What do you mean? Well, Mr. Arnold changed a lot of things. New furniture and such. Timothy thinks they look better where they have always been. Just this morning, they argue. Mr. Bryce wants Timothy to get rid of something, but they do not remember what it is. Oh. And then one more question. The room with all the paintings. Do you remember that room before Mr. Arnold Bryce came here? Oh, yeah. It used to clean there. But there was not all the paintings there then. No painting? Uh, not all there is now. Just the one. The painting of the pretty lady. The Mona Lisa. Uh, what did you say? The Mona Lisa. Yeah, that's it. That is what Timothy and Mr. Bryce was having words about this morning. The Mona... Uh, Mona Lisa. That was it. I looked at Walt and I could see that he was interested. Now there was a motive. Oh, not the big headline motive, just the kind you'll read on page six of your local paper. The kind of story that usually says the murderer is now undergoing sanity tests. Otis showed the maid out and left Walt and me with our little brains racing a mile a minute. I don't know. We still haven't got anything to convict him. Walt, he's a psycho, that's for sure. Now, the way I see it, he's crazy about that one picture. He grew up in the house. Maybe it means something to him. Then in comes Bryce with all his modern junk and orders Timothy to get rid of the Mona Lisa. Yeah. But Timmy argues and Bryce insists. They were both in the library, so maybe Bryce was even going to take it down himself. Well, it could be. Then our boy gets mad, grabs the nearest thing, which happened to be the poker. Okay, so it fits. We have a theory. But we still need one thing to convict him. A confession. Yeah. Maybe we can use the Mona Lisa. What? He killed for it. He may talk for it. I outlined my plan to Walt. Timothy was a psychopathic, and I knew we'd have to get him in the right kind of mood. Walt agreed with the plan, and we headed for the gallery. They had removed Bryce's body from the room, and only a deep red spot in the carpet was left. Walt went looking for Timothy, and I moved over to the piano. In here, Timothy. Oh, hello, Rick. Hi, Walt. Just thought I'd pass the time at the piano. It's all right. Just sit down, Timothy. I want you to wait here where I can locate you. We'll want to question you later. Yes, sir. I'll call you if I need you, Rick. Okay, Walt. My playing bother you, Timothy? Oh, not at all, sir. I like music. Oh, me too. You know, that painting up there reminds me of a song I heard not long ago. Pretty thing. Went like this. Mona Lisa, Mona Lisa, men have named you. You're so like the lady with the mystic smile. Is it only cause you're lonely they have blamed you For that Mona Lisa strangeness in your smile I watched him carefully as I sang. At first he stared at me with a strange look in his eye, but gradually he settled back in his chair and listened to the words. His eyes rested on the beautiful painting over the mantelpiece. This was the mood I'd wanted. 
Many dreams have been brought to your doorstep. They just lie there and they die there. Are you warm? Are you real, Mona Lisa? Or just a cold and lonely, lovely work of art? Well, did you like that? Hey, Timothy. Hey. Huh? Oh, <laughs> The song is very beautiful. It's fitting of her. Mm-hmm. Well, I guess I'd better stop fooling around at the piano and do what I came here for. His eyes were on me as I got up from the piano bench and walked over to the fireplace. I tried not to look at him as I reached up for the picture, but I heard him jump from his chair. What are you doing? Leave that alone. Well, I'm sorry, friend, but Mrs. Bryce is all upset about her husband's death. She asked me if I wouldn't carry out his last wish and get rid of this. Plot us up the other pictures, you know. Leave it alone. Take the others, but leave that alone. Sorry, but out it goes to the trash pile. No, it belongs here. The living part of this house. Put it down, I said. Put it down! I warned you. Now, now, Timothy, take it easy. Put on that shovel. When you put down the picture. Oh, and if I don't, you'll swing that shovel at me just the way you swung a poker at Bryce. He was an idiot. Throw it out, he said. Throw it out and leave that other trash on the walls. Now you, you want to throw it out too? No, no, give me that painting. All right, Timothy, you've got it. Rick, are you all right? Yep. See how Timothy is. He'll come around. You heard from the door? Yeah, enough. Imagine. All this over a picture of a dame. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role. It was written by Blake Edwards with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. This is Bill Foreman speaking. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. When I retire the smiling... Well, if it ain't sure. Richard Diamond, the smiling gumshoe. Well, if it ain't Sergeant Otis, the laughing hyena. The lieutenant in? Yeah, go on in and spoil his afternoon. You know, Otis, I think you've got the kindest, most wonderful face in the whole wide world. You do? Absolutely. But I do wish you'd do me a favor. Well, sure, anything. Stop wearing it upside down. Hello, Walt. Hello, Rick. Sit down. Oh, thanks, thanks. Uh, what's doing? Want a sandwich? Mm, I'll take some of that coffee. Sure. Something on your mind, Rick? No, just got tired of sitting around the office. No business? Not in a week. Hmm. <laughs> got any sugar? Oh, yeah, I forgot. Here. Yeah, Otis. Uh, Lieutenant, I got some guy on the phone who won't give me his name. Says he wants to talk to you. Matter of life and death. Okay, put him on. Right. Homicide, Lieutenant Levinson. I'm going to say this once, so listen carefully. Tonight, somewhere in New York City, I'm going to kill a man, and there's nothing you can do about it. What? Promptly at 8 o'clock, somewhere in this city, I'm going to kill a man. Hello? Hello? Something wrong? Some guy says he's going to kill somebody at 8 o'clock tonight. Oh, dandy. Crank. Did he say who his victim is going to be? No, just a crank. I should have humored him. Made suggestions. My landlord, for instance. Be a little gruesome if he really did it. Yeah. You'd have a hard time protecting 8 million people from a killer you don't know anything about. Hope it was just a crank. Otis. Yeah, what's that? If that guy calls back, put him through and trace the call. Right. 
It sure would be miserable if that call was on the level. Oh, relax. I'll have some more coffee. I had some more coffee. Walt worried a little. Not a lot. Because the big precinct caters to a good number of cranks every day. We talked about old times, and around six, I matched Walt for dinner. He stuffed himself at the automat until I ran out of change and begged for mercy. Then he dropped me off at my flat on 53rd and went back to the precinct. I showered, shaved, slipped into my blue suit and headed for the door. Yeah? Do me a favor, will you, Rick? You gotta stop stuffing yourself, Walt. You sound like you got indigestion. I'm down at the morgue. Meet me here, please. Oh, now, look, I got a date with a live one. I'm in on the start of some trouble. It's liable to grow. That guy who called made good. He stabbed a man to death on Broadway at 8 o'clock. Here he is, Lieutenant. Hello, Walt. Hi, Rick. Thanks for coming down. Okay, Hal. Who is he? Or, uh, who was he? Brother identified him, Abraham Weiss. Stabbed in the heart from behind with a long, thin instrument. On Broadway at 8 o'clock. That's right. Mm. A dozen people saw him stagger to the curb and fall. Most of them just thought he was drunk. You think your boy on the phone did it? 8 o'clock, right on the nose. Whoever did it must have walked up behind him, jabbed him just below the left shoulder blade, and kept on walking. What do you want me for, Walt? If this guy on the phone did kill Abraham Weiss and we can't find a motive... It's a little more than a simple killing. We may be mixed up with a madman. Oh, so I qualify in that league. You're one of the few guys who really is interested in criminal psychology. Well, I think it's the answer. You can't stop something unless you know the cause. Will you give me a hand, Rick? Sure, sure. I've got Weiss's family at the station. Let's go see them. <laughs> Why, Lieutenant, why did this happen to Abe? That's what we're going to try and find out, Mrs. Weiss. We were hoping you might help us. Well, he, didn't, he didn't have any enemies. He was a good man. We have three children. I left them with Mrs. Bellotti, my neighbor. It, it's going to be hard on them. You're sure your husband didn't know it? No. He didn't have any enemies. He was a good husband and a good father. Everybody liked him. But only last week, Mrs. Dowd up the street from us. <laughs> We'd like a list of your brother's friends, Mr. Weiss. Where he worked, people he had business with, anyone you can remember who might give us a lead. Been sitting out there thinking about that. There just isn't anyone that I know would want to kill Abe. He was a good guy, did his job, took care of Louise and the kids. He didn't bother nobody. How long were Louise and Abe married? For, uh, no, six years. Maybe a little more. Nice girl, Louise. Oh, the best. Good wife. What happens to her now? I'll take care of him. You're not married, huh? No. Quite a job taking care of a widow and three kids. I'm doing all right. It's the least I can do. You got a girl? Yeah, why? Maybe you're going to get married, huh? Well, I'm engaged. I've been thinking about it. It'll have to wait for a while, I guess. Until Louise gets back on her feet. Okay. Tell us about some of your brother's friends. Well, I guess his best friend was Art Brearley. They were awful close to me. He told us about everyone he could think of. He gave us a dozen names and addresses we could check. Like Louise, Martin couldn't figure why anyone would want to kill Abraham Weiss. The next was Mrs. Rebecca Weiss. Tired. The hurt in her eyes, enough for all the mothers who had raised a son and lost him. We'll try not to keep you too long, Mrs. Weiss. It's all right, Lieutenant. You want to help. Would you like a glass of water? No, no. When will I be able to see my son? It's right that I should see my son. A few questions first, if you don't mind. I know you're trying to help. Just me a few questions. As many as you like, Lieutenant. Not long with Mrs. Rebecca Weiss. Nothing that would help to catch her son's killer. So we checked the people who had known Abraham, and there were plenty. His boss gave us a few more names to add to the long list. All of them friends who couldn't imagine why anyone would want to kill a nice guy like Abe. 
At 7.30 the next morning, Walt looked at reports and poured more coffee. Here. I'll put sugar in it. Ah, thanks. If that phone call was on the level, why would a guy kill like that? Call us and tell us he was going to do it. What would be his reason? Uh, well, couldn't guess. But if that guy who called did do the killing, you can bet he'll phone again. Why? Well, he bragged he was going to do it. He'll want the credit. Well, I'm going to get some rest. A couple hours anyway. Let's both get a couple. <laughs> Yeah? Sorry. Ah, it doesn't matter. Lousy dream. What time is it? Five o'clock. Oh, I died, didn't I? A boy called again. Oh? You trace it? Phone booth in Grand Central. What do you have to say? How much. Wanted to know how he liked his handiwork. What's a good answer to that one? Well, I said a few things, but I guess he figured we weren't satisfied, so he promised he'd kill somebody else tonight. <laughs> Hello, Rick. Seen the papers? No. Here. Hmm. Fiend terrorizes city. Unknown killer murders at will. Police baffled. Everybody's on my back. Exactly. What did he say? You want to hear? I made a recording. Let's hear it. Okay, Otis. Put him on. Hello, Lieutenant. Yeah. What do you think now, Lieutenant? I did what I said I was going to do, didn't I? Look, who is this? The man who called yesterday and said he was going to kill someone at 8 o'clock last night. I don't believe it. Well, certainly you do. You'd like to stall so you can have this call traced. Well, you'd better listen. I want everybody to know just how stupid the police force really is. I'm going to kill again tonight, and there's nothing you can do about it. Look, you, whoever you are, if it's the last thing I ever do, I'll... Tonight at 8, another innocent victim will die because the police can do nothing about it. Hello. Hello. Oh, this. The call came from a phone booth in Grand... He said another innocent victim. Yeah, so he's a nut. For some reason, he hates the police force. There's your motive. Well, I guess it's possible, but something sticks in my craw. Yeah? What? Eight o'clock. Why pick eight o'clock both times? Well, I guess, like you said, he wants the credit. We're liable to get a couple of killings in an evening. He wants us to be sure which one he did. Okay, so he makes it eight o'clock the first time. Why the second? Why not six or seven or ten or... Just following a pattern, I guess. Uh, maybe so. Well, what do we do? I got every man possible on the streets. But, Rick, let's face it, this is a pretty big city. And it's six, two, and even. If he does kill again, it won't be anywhere near the scene of his first stabbing. I guess we just wait. Yeah, a little over an hour to go. So we waited. Walt got the coffee going, and I went through a whole package of cigarettes. Somewhere in the middle of New York, probably on a crowded street, a man was walking, waiting like we were for 8 o'clock, waiting to stab someone through the heart, waiting for 8 o'clock. Want coffee? No. Give me a cigarette. You don't smoke. Want a bet? Ah, uh, here. Got a match? Got a lighter. Ah, uh, this is no good. Yeah? Let's go. Where to? Entrance to Madison Square Garden. Man stabbed to death in the crowd going into the fights. Right at 8 o'clock. A man murdered going into Madison Square Garden to see the fights. Stabbed through the heart while he stood in the middle of the large crowd. We went through the same routine. Identify the body. Question witnesses who had been close to him. See his friend. Anyone who knew him. Name's Leon Ellis. Small-time fight manager. No family. Handles a young kid named Billy Martin. Wasn't fighting last night. At 10 o'clock the next morning, we found Billy Martin working at the East Side Gym. We talked to him for a while, but he couldn't help much. So we kept going, making our list of names, talking to everyone, all morning and into the afternoon. 
By 4.30, we were holding each other up. Look, we're working with a madman who kills anybody close to him so he can show how helpless we are to stop him. The whole city's in a panic. The newspapers are blasting everybody in the department, yours truly in particular. Yeah? I got him on the line again. He even bragged to me about this last killing. Trace it as fast as you can. Right. Start that recorder, Rick. It's our boy again. Okay. Go ahead. Fifth Precinct, Lieutenant Levinson. You can skip the formalities, Lieutenant. Your sergeant told you who was on the line. Well, I did it again last night, didn't I, Lieutenant? Okay, so we can't stop you. I admit it. I'll admit it to the papers. That should make you happy. The police department can't do anything about it. That's what you want, isn't it? Again tonight, Lieutenant. One more person will die. Now, wait a minute. At least give me a chance to talk to you. While you trace the call? No. Tonight at 8 o'clock, and you can't stop me. Hello? Yeah? Call came from a phone booth in Rockefeller Center. Picks the right place to call from. We look pretty silly rounding up everybody in Rockefeller Center. Walt looked sick, and I felt it. What could we do? We knew nothing about our killer or where he'd strike next. Walt called in the reporters and gave them the story. The papers would blast the department, but it was the best way to warn the public to stay off the streets. The department was alerted, the radio stations were given bulletins to broadcast, and Walt and I climbed into a prowl car and started cruising. At 8.5, it came in. Attention, all units in the vicinity of Zone 12... A 211 in front of 415 West 64th, 415 William 64, ambulance, dead body, car 73, come in please. 73, go ahead. 211 at 415 West 64 is a stabbing, Lieutenant. Roger. That's it, Rick. The victim was an elderly man dressed expensively and lying face down on the sidewalk. Again, no witnesses to the killing. Most of the people who had seen the man fall realized almost immediately what had happened because of the publicity on the last two killings. But like one man said... Well, how are you going to see who killed him in a crowd like this? Maybe a hundred people on the block when it happens. Boy, you guys better start doing something. Yes, sir? Does a Mr. Arthur Reeves live here? Yes, sir, but Mr. Reeves is not in at the moment. I'm from the police. Lieutenant Levinson, homicide. Homicide? I'd like to talk with everybody in the house. Certainly, sir. Has something happened to Mr. Reeves? He's been murdered. Oh, no. No, not Mr. Reeves. How many people in the house? Myself, the maid, and Mr. George Reeves, Mr. Reeves' nephew. Tell him I'd like to talk with him. And we talked with the three people in the dead man's house. The maid, the butler, and George Reeves, the nephew. I warned him not to take his walk tonight. I showed him the papers. Did he usually take walks at night? That's for the past 15 years. Know why anyone would want to kill him? Mr. Reeves? Of course not. You know very good and well it was that fiend what did it. How about you? Can you think of why anyone would want to kill your employer? No, sir. I've been with Mr. Reeves for over 20 years. I'm acquainted with most of his friends and associates. Look here. I can assure you that my uncle knew no one who would want to kill him. You're his nephew? That's right. Your uncle took walks every night? Yes, every night. Now, if you don't mind, we'd like you all to come down at the station to make statements. Okay, we got the statements and other list of names and a long one. None of these killings tie together. Nobody on the first list has any connection with anybody on the second list. Let's face it, if that madman calls again, we can't stop him. Oh, take it easy, Well, can we? I want to talk to the maid, the butler, and the nephew again. Why? It's just the same as all the others. I want to talk to them, okay? I'm sorry. Getting jumpy. No, you're tired. So am I. Otis, send in the maid. What are you doing? Fixing the recorder. I may want to listen to it again. So we again talked to the maid, then the butler... Then the nephew and the tape recorder picked up everything they said, and it sounded very much like everything everybody else had said after the first two killings. Walt let them go home and went up to talk to the commissioner. When he came back, he looked pretty discouraged. I'm sure on the griddle. Solve it or turn in my badge. I want you to listen to something. Oh, sure. I've cut out sections of tape, stuck them together. Mr. Reeves took walks every night after dinner, and dinner was always at seven? That's right. Then he always left sometimes close to eight? Yes. 
7.30 or a quarter to 8. He was never gone more than half an hour? No. What time did he leave tonight? About a quarter to 8. Weren't you worried when he didn't come back within half an hour? Well, certainly. Both the maid and I were very anxious. Were you all in the house between a quarter of 8 and the time we arrived? Yes, sir. Where was Mr. Reeves' nephew? In his room. He went up right after dinner. How wealthy was your employer? He was very wealthy. Mr. Reeves, who inherits your uncle's fortune? Why, I do. Was Mr. Reeves ever longer than half an hour with his walks? Never more than a few minutes, one way or the other. Who handles your uncle's affairs, Mr. Reeves? Well, Richard B. Gregg. He's been my uncle's attorney for many years. Young Mr. Reeves has always been excitable. Gotten a lot of trouble in the past. Yes, he argued with his uncle many times. No, Mr. Reeves didn't come down and ask why his uncle had been gone so long. Certainly I worried about my uncle. But I thought he might have stopped along the way for something or other. Okay, so you took out pieces of the testimony and stuck them together. So what? Just this. Every one of these killings have taken place at 8 o'clock. I know, and it's worried you. Now, this is the first time that one of our victims was certain to be out on the streets at 8 o'clock. Coincidence. Ah, uh, maybe, maybe. Mr. Reeves was a wealthy man, very wealthy. And the nephew gets his money, and the nephew was in his room at the time of the killing. Who saw him? The butler and the maid both say he was up there. So he climbs out a window. His uncle was killed only two blocks from the house. Plenty of time to stab him, get back through the window. You're really reaching out, aren't you? Uh, sure I am. What do you want me to do? Well, the nephew's voice certainly doesn't match the ones we got on the threatening phone calls. So he disguises it. I got an idea. What? Let's put a tail on all three of these people anyway. It's not much. It's all we've got so far. I'm going out to check on something. What? Here's something that'll make your hair curl. I just saw the attorney for the Reeves estate, and he said the old man was planning on changing his will. Leaving all his money to charity, not his nephew. He was supposed to meet with Mr. Reeves this morning. And Reeves gets killed last night. Pretty convenient for the nephew. We can't arrest him on that. No, but it makes a good motive. You think the nephew would kill two men and then his uncle, just so it would look like a madman had picked out another innocent victim? You've got to admit it'd be pretty clever. There's an understatement. Yeah? He's on the line again, Lieutenant. I'm tracing him. Oh, no. Our boy again. There goes your theory. Hello? You can't do anything, Lieutenant. I've killed three men, and you can't stop me. I'm going to kill again tonight at 8. Hello? It was him, all right. Tonight at 8. Rick, we've just got to do... Yeah? Call came from Grand Central again. Okay. Well, what happens to your theory now? Well, he might do it again. Expect you to react just this way. Uh, who's tailing George Reeves? Harrison. When does he report in again? Checks in on the hour. Last time was about 20 minutes ago. 40 minutes to go, huh? No way of contacting him? No. Nope. Okay, we wait. Yeah? Yeah? Where was he at 446? Don't let him out of your sight. Well? At 446, George Reeves made a phone call from a booth in Grand Central Station. He's home now. Well, we had something. A motive and a man calling from Grand Central, but not enough to make an arrest. We waited until seven and then headed for the Reeves' house. The area is surrounded. He'll have two men on him no matter where he goes. He's still in the house? According to Harrison. No, I want to do more than pick him up with a knife. Here he comes. Yeah. Climbing into his car. Attention, cars 314-15. Suspect heading east. Proceed east on your street. We tailed him, keeping in contact with the other cars as they stayed parallel. When Reeves turned off, we went on ahead, notified the car in our right or left to pick him up. That way, Reeves wouldn't suspect a tail. About 7.30, we got a call that Reeves had parked. We headed for the spot in a hurry. Suspect is heading north on Calder. Well, get ahead of him. Park at the corner of Davis. We'll pick him up there. We stopped at the corner and got out of the car. We waited until we spotted Reeves walking in our direction and then let him pass and followed, staying close. We kept after him until five minutes to eight. He swung out on Broadway and was pushing his way through the crowd. Then it happened. 
Where'd he go? We've lost him. Come on. Three minutes to eight. Let us through, please. Well, I never... Get out of the way. Oh, you push. Shut up. You see him turn off? No, he's got to be... Walt, Walt, crossing the street. Let's go. Reeves. What? No. Look out for the knife. No, no. Let me go. Let me go. Drop it. You okay? Yeah. Here's the knife. Young man. Young man, what right have you got to hit that nice gentleman? He was helping me across the street. I have a good mind to report Lady, him. lady. If this man was helping you across the street, just forget about him. Go bet on a horse or something. This is your lucky night. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. This is Bill Foreman speaking. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency... Roses are red, violets are blue. Crime doesn't pay, but see that you do. Oh, Rick. Oh, hi, Helen, baby. Rick, have you ever thought of writing holiday greeting cards? Mm, no. But then you might just have a thought there. Christmas isn't far away. Mm, I think you'd better aim toward April Fool's Day. Oh, sweet. Helen, did you call just to insult my creative genius, or do I get an invitation to dinner? Well, the genius I didn't even recognize. The dinner, well... Oh, maybe. Hmm. Here I am, a poor, starving detective, and you confront me with maybe. Oh, well, a girl can't be too careful about who she invites into her house these days. Do you have references? From the best crooks in town. Oh, well, I suppose it's all right. Come around to the back door, and I'll have Francis fix you a sandwich. Well, now, don't go to all that bother, Helen. I'll I'll just stop off at the mission. <laughs> oh, you fool. Are you busy? Mm-mm. Haven't had a case since... A... Well... What is it? I'm not sure, but I think a flying saucer landed outside and its occupant just walked in. Rick, what are you talking about? Who came in? Well, it looks like an Otis Loveloon, but it's awake. Oh, Diamond. Mm, Got a vocabulary like Otis, too. Look, Shamus, hurry up, will you? I got business with you. Helen, I have no choice but to hang up. This man speaks with such authority. Oh, Rick, if Otis is there, go easy on him. You'll tease that poor boy out of his mind. Helen, he... Oh, no, it's too obvious. I won't say it. I'll see you at dinner. Bye. Well, well, well. Sergeant Otis Loveloon. What brings you up here? Want me to sign your report card? The lieutenant sent me up, wise guy. Oh? Now, let's see where they put that paper. Paper? Oh, oh, here. Uh, Mr. Richard Diamond, we of the 5th Precinct, having missed your sparkling personality, do hereby invite you to a tea. To be held this palm. This what? This palm. That's what it says. Let me see that paper. Otis, that's P.M. Well, don't that snow? No. So what is all this? A tea at the 5th Precinct? Sure. It's my idea. The lieutenant says we got to be more formal from now on. And he wants to see you. So? So this is your idea of being formal. That's right. Trouble with you, Diamond, is you got no culture. Well, I'm hurt, Otis. You say Walt wants to see me? Yeah, he sent me in a squad car for you. Well, I can hardly wait to find out what this is all about. Me too. I delivered a letter to him this morning. He's been a changed man ever since. A letter? Hmm. Maybe he... Oh, no, no, no. Walt's too old for the draft. 
And so yours truly was ushered into a waiting squad car. Usually, Walt Levinson let me wear out shoe leather on my trips to the 5th Precinct, and his hospitality was overwhelming. Otis even stopped on the way and bought me some chewing gum. Of course, it was Otis's favorite brand, but then I'm no prude. I enjoy blowing bubbles. He's in here, Diamond. Take off your hat. What? New rule. Oh, no. Here he is, Lieutenant. Well, I got eyes, you numbs. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Sergeant Otis. Oh, thank you, Lieutenant. It was a pleasure. You may take your leave now, Sergeant Otis. Yes, sir, Lieutenant Levinson. Otis, curtsy and get out of here, will you? This is killing me. Oh, you had to go and ruin it all. Walt, what's going on down here? Look at your desk. What's wrong with my desk? Well, it's tidy. Everything's in place. Are you ill? Mr. Diamond, a man's desk reflects his character. Now, please be seated. I think I'd better take this standing. This new trend in character is amazing. Rick, look at this. Looks like an ordinary letter to me. Yes, but what's in it? Well, you tell me what's in it. Rick, I've been invited to speak at the annual Peace Officers Symposium at the University of North Carolina. So? So? But don't you know what this means? The top men from all over the country will be there. And to be a speaker... Well, that's quite an honor. Oh, comes the dawn. So this is why everything around here has become formal, huh? Sure. After all, we've got to have a little dignity. Mm Mm-hmm. Why send for me? In a squad car yet? Well, it's like this, Rick. I'm supposed to make a speech concerning juvenile delinquency in New York. Uh Uh-huh. Now, they also want someone to make a speech on the relationship between the policeman and the private detective. Touching. They told me to pick out a good man and bring him down. So I picked you. Oh, Walt, you're so thoughtful. Sorry, but speeches aren't my line. Ah, Rick, don't be that way. We'll have a good time. We'll leave tonight from Penn Station, get there in the morning. It'd be a nice vacation. Walt, I can't afford a nice vacation. While I'm down there over the weekend, I might miss a client. I'll get somebody else. Um, Rick. Well? Remember last year when we decided to give all the private detectives an examination to find out whether or not they were still qualified to operate? Sure, why? Well, I just heard the commission may call another examination this year. So what's this got to do with me going to North Carolina? Well, last year, remember, I didn't exactly help you. Just to cough here and there when I saw you were writing the wrong answer. Go on. I was just thinking. Maybe this year I won't have a cold. Oh, now, Walt. Rick, this trip to North Carolina means a lot to me. All kidding aside, it's a big honor. Now be a pal and go along. Well, what? Oh, that's a boy. I'll have the ticket clerk line up two tickets. All right, Walt, I'll agree on one condition. Shoot. Well, I realize you're now a man of dignity, and I know that that you think things should be more formal. Yeah. But for Pete's sake, take that doily off the lie detector. Oh. That's a nice, healthy groan. What's the matter, Walt? Train rides make you ill or something? No, but I just had a horrible thought. I was so excited about leaving, I forgot. Otis will be in charge while I'm gone. Oh, great. This is the biggest boon to crime since Prohibition. Don't remind me of it. No, take your mind off of it. Look at the more pleasant things in life. Mmm. Like that blonde up front? (laughs) Oh, you're catching on, Fatty. Cute, isn't she? I guess so. Only she keeps looking around. Sort of suspicious-like. Walt, can't you take your mind off crime once in a while? All right. I'm sorry I brought it up. Everyone isn't criminal, you know. She's probably a co-ed on her way back to school. That's your opinion. Me? I say she's got criminal connections. Well, I have a buck that says you're wrong. All right, you're on. Now, how do we find out? Walt, you're so naive. Look, she's going to the club car. Come on. Now, where'd she go? Well, there she is at the end of the car. Come on. Hey, Rick, maybe we shouldn't. Uh, she might have a boyfriend around somewhere. Oh, it's all right, Walt. I have you to protect me. Uh, <clears throat> uh, pardon me, uh, Miss... Uh, yes? Uh, I'm Richard Diamond, and this is Walt Levinson. Walt says he'd like very much to meet you, but he's the shy type and asked me to Miles Standish for him. Diamond. Well... You Americans, you are certainly direct in making the acquaintance of young women. But I cannot remember anyone who has done it in so few words. Well, we're really harmless, and we would like to buy you a drink. 
Why, I think that would be very nice. Good. Let's order before Diamond proposes for me. Oh, the waiter seems to be busy at the other end of the car. Well, I'll go down there and get the drinks. Excuse me. Are, uh, are you traveling far, Miss, uh... Krona? Isabel Krona. Hmm. I'm on my way to North Carolina. Well, well, how nice. So are we. Do you, uh, live in New York? No, I'm from Switzerland. Oh, then you're a long way from home. Yes. But I love traveling in your country. Everything is so beautiful. This is my first trip. But I hope to return. Pleasure trip or a business? Oh, uh, a little of both. I'm representing my country's police department at the North Carolina Symposium. Oh, perhaps I should explain that. You see, uh, they are holding a convention... Oh, uh, never mind, we know. That's where we're headed for, too. Well, such a coincidence. You're a police officer? Uh, yes, that's right. Walt's a lieutenant, and I'm in business for myself. Well, we here we are. Hope Scotch is all right. Fine. Thank you. Here, Diamond. Pardon my thumb. Mm -hmm. Scotch and fingerprint ink. What a combination. Mr. Diamond tells me that you are a policeman, Mr. Levinson. Yes, but don't let that frighten you. It's a tough life, but off duty we're just like everyone else. Well, I remember... Walt, uh, Walt, before you start telling her all about crime, let me tell you something. She happens to be a policewoman. What? Well, I'll be. You certainly will. A flat foot in high heels. Well, sometimes it is advantageous, Lieutenant. If I were easily recognized as a policewoman, well, my usefulness would be at an end. Well, I, um, I wouldn't exactly say uh, that. <clears throat> uh, let's have another. By the time our train reached Raleigh, North Carolina, we were old friends. From Raleigh, we took a bus to Chapel Hill, where the university was located. As we got off the bus, a short, red-faced man came up to greet us. Hello there. How, how do you... Hello, my name is Kevin. Christopher Kevin. I take it you folks are here for the Peace Officer Symposium. That's right. I'm Levinson from New York. This is Ms. Isabel Crona, and this is Richard uh, Diamond. Yeah, I'm very glad to... How are you? How are you? I, I am the chairman of the Institute. Uh, we're taking a group picture on the front steps, and I think you're about the last to arrive. We can get started with the picture now. Ah, oh, this is a police convention, all right. Here, two minutes, and lawyer Phil Potts wants to mug you. You three in the back row there. Move in closer, please. Well, that's one suggestion I don't mind. Bother you, dear? Well, uh, since it's all for art, I do not think yeah. I mind. That's it. That's it. Now, we just... Oh, my. You in the front row, you've moved again. Now, you've got... Our little friend is having a rough time. <laughs> yes. He was... Uh, What's the matter? That man, the photographer. What about him? He... Oh, it is nothing. Right. It just looks so familiar. Everybody smile. Easy now. Don't strain. Don't easy. Oh, no. The third row. Will you please stand here? The little photographer pulled out a few hairs from his head and patiently rearranged his subjects. Half an hour later, he had succeeded in snapping enough pictures and the group disbanded. Miss Croner promised to have dinner with us that evening. So a couple of hours later, Walt and I were walking down the hall to her room. Playing like gentlemen, we knocked on a door that was half ajar. No answer. Still the gentleman, we knocked again. This was getting monotonous, so we quit being gentlemen. We shouldn't walk right in, Rick. Oh, come on. Maybe she forgot. After all, I... Uh-oh. What? She didn't forget, Walt. Look. Good Lord. Better get on the phone and call the local peace officer. We have no jurisdiction here. Not even for murder. Walt and I stared down at Isabel Croner's body on the floor. What had once been a pretty head was now crushed and wasn't a very pleasant sight. Walt called the local sheriff and we waited until he arrived. Well, you say you two found the body? That's right, Sheriff. My name's Diamond. This is Walt Levinson. We're here for the peace officer's symposium. Oh, oh, yeah. And uh, who was she? Name was Croner, Isabel. She was a policewoman from Switzerland. Well, the coroner will be finished in a few minutes. Darndest thing I ever heard of. A policewoman gets killed right smack in the middle of a gathering of the best cops in the country. Now, we called you right away. We figured if the news leaked out, every cop in the place would try and catch the murderer. They'd all run into each other, make a real mess. Yeah, but we'd better keep it quiet till we can make an investigation. You all seem to know some of the facts about her. Care to give me a hand? Sure would, Sheriff. Mr. Diamond here is a private detective, though. 
There's no client, Rick. Do you want to work on it? Well, that's a nasty poke, Walt. I'm as anxious as you are to catch this girl's killer. Good. Now, any reason you know of why anyone would want to get rid of her? I can't think of any. She said this was her first trip to this country. Uh, uh, Johnson, check with the hotel manager. See if he saw anyone come in who might have entered this room. Now, let's see. Looks like she was hit with a heavy instrument. Yeah. We noticed what might be a clue over here, Sheriff. There, on the floor. Oh, a little vial. We figured it might have fallen from the killer's pocket during the struggle. It's, uh, it's marked silver nitrate. There might be some prints on the bottle. Well, let's hope there are. We can use a few breaks in this case. What do you think about Simmons? Oh, he seems like a competent sheriff. He wants us over at his office after we have dinner. Yeah, he's sending the vial onto the lab in Raleigh. I hope they turn up something. What beats me is, why was Isabel Crona killed? Who did she know here? Walt, I... I... Hmm. What's the matter, Rick? I was just thinking. Remember when we had our picture taken earlier today? Sure, why? That little photographer. Isabel seemed to recognize him. She shrugged it off when I asked her about it, but she had a strange look on her face. Yeah, you might have something there. At least there's one person who might have known her. Let's look him up and ask him a few questions. Oh, no, no. I, on second thought, I don't think we'd better. If he did kill her and we asked questions, he might leave town. Let's just keep an eye on him till the lab has a chance to go over that vial. Right. Here's a drugstore. We can look up his address. Luckily, we found that the fair city of Chapel Hill had only one photographer, the little man who had snapped our picture that morning. His name was William Avery, and we jotted down his address. Ten minutes later, we were waiting outside his studio. Can you see him through that window, Rick? Yeah, yeah, he's putting on his hat. Move back into that doorway. He's coming out. Come on. Let him get farther ahead. That's good. Let's go. He's stopping. Yeah. Hey, there he goes into that restaurant. Come on, let's go across the street. Still think we ought to question him? No, 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 wait. If he thinks no one suspects him, he may let his guard down. Let's just wait here. We can watch him through the window. The waitress is taking his order. Good. Well, I'm going to take a chance. If he's ordering dinner, he'll be in there for a little while. I'm going back to his studio and look around. Hey, now, Rick, you can't just break in there. We have no jurisdiction down here. And someone had no jurisdiction to kill Isabel Croner. I'm sorry, Walt. There might be something in that studio to pin this on Avery. Okay, you win. But I'll go back and look around. I was breaking in houses while you were still breaking in rattles. Okay, Grandpa. Don't let anyone near your bones creak. <laughs> Find anything in the studio, Walt? And how? Our friend Avery has a broken camera. It's been smashed. Wow. Oh, oh. Hey. Hey, hold it. Here he comes out of the restaurant. Oh, looks like he's heading for a studio. You, uh, you say his camera was smashed? Yeah, I found it in the closet. Didn't the coroner say Isabel had been killed with a heavy instrument? That's right. You know, Walt, this may fit. After Avery took the picture, you recognized Isabel. Then still with his camera, you went to see her. They fought and he bashed her with it. I'll buy that. Well, then maybe we're just grabbing at straws. We still need something concrete to tie Avery in with that murder. I... Hey, wait a minute. Huh? Look up ahead there. He's got an apple. Look at the way he's eating it. Well, what about it? Well, he's only biting it on the right side of his mouth. So what? I have a hunch, that's all. Well, if it's about that apple, forget it. He just threw it away. Yeah? Well, what's all this about, anyway? Let him go on, Walt. We'll know where to find him. And besides, I want this apple. Holy cow, what are you doing in the gutter? If you're that hungry, I'll buy you a whole apple. No, thanks. Come here, Walt. Look at this apple. Mm -hmm. The teeth marks show it's only been chewed on one side of the mouth. Now, maybe that's just habit. I don't know. 
Or maybe Avery has bad teeth. So no matter what it is, how does it help us? I think it may help a lot. Let's get back to the sheriff. Well, it's about time you fellas got here. Thought you were coming over right after dinner. I was sorry, Sheriff, but we followed a hunch. You know a photographer here in town named Avery? Bill Avery? Why, sure. He's the best photographer in town. Came down about a year ago. Why? We think he killed Isabel Croner. But... Well, now, what makes you think a thing like that? Well, so far it's nothing concrete, but Isabel seemed to recognize him today. Yeah, so we followed him. And later I found a broken camera in his studio. We think it's the death weapon. Well... Well, now, a broken camera is hardly enough to convict a man. Oh, we know that, Sheriff, but there, here's something else. You remember that vial of silver nitrate we found by Isabel's body? Uh, sure. What about it? Well, some dentists prescribe silver nitrate for use on the gums in case of infected teeth. Now, look at this apple Avery was chewing. The teeth marks show it's been eaten only with the right half of the jaw. So? So that could indicate Avery has had bad teeth and may have been using silver nitrate on his gums. Now, that's downright clever. Of course, it still don't prove nothing. Well, it might, though. Send this apple on to the lab. If they find traces of silver nitrate on it, it will at least indicate Avery was in Isabel's room. Yeah, and I've been thinking. It might just be a wild guess, but if the girl recognized Avery, he probably recognized her. He might be a big European criminal. He was afraid she'd turn him in, so he killed her. Now, you may have something there, Walt. A transatlantic call to the Swiss Detective Bureau might clear up his real identity. Now, now, boys, before you go running up my phone bill, let's just... Take it nice and easy, like this broken camera, silver nitrate apple, and motive. It's all mighty interesting. But I don't think we'd better waste time sending this apple to the lab. Doubt if they'd find anything on it. Well, you'll at least check it, won't you? No. Like I say, all these things are real interesting. But there's just one thing stands in the way of me trying to arrest Avery. What are you getting at, Sheriff? Well, while you boys were out playing cops and robbers... I caught the murderer. You, what? Wait. Yep, nothing fancy. Just thorough, routine investigation. I sent a man to check the hotel manager. He hadn't seen anyone, but he said the maid was due to clean that room about the time of the murder. We questioned her. She got nervous and broke down. Confessed she killed Krona. But why? Lieutenant, what's the reason for most of the killings in your state every year? What's the motive? Well, robbery's mostly the motive. That's right. And it's the same down here. The maid told her she was going through Krona's purse when Krona came in and caught her. She got frightened, picked up a vacuum sweeper attachment, and hit her with it. You know how a berserker petty thief can get when they're afraid they'll be caught. Yeah, but the silver nitrate and the apple. Oh, hell, the apple's coincidence. The silver nitrate belonged to Krona. She, too, had bad teeth. Well, I'll be... Move over, Walt. That makes two of us. Hey, yes, sir. When I heard all you fellas were having a big convention down here, I said to my deputy, Peter said... We're going to see ourselves some fancy investigating if anything should happen while those fellows are here. Only I'm sure sorry you went to all that trouble for nothing. Rick, don't speak to me. I'm still brooding. Well, at least we got through the speeches. Yeah. Yeah. Would have been a swell trip if it wasn't for that hunch of yours. Oh, now that's it. Blame it all on me. Apples and silver nitrate. And what about you? Broken camera and that motive. Big European criminal. All right, all right. <laughs> sort of funny, though. That poor little photographer. Yeah. <laughs> we were all set to send him to the chair. <laughs> uh, Walt. Huh? Maybe we shouldn't say anything about this when we get back. I was thinking the same thing. If Otis ever hears about it, we'll be disgraced for life. Yeah. Let's just forget it. And look at the more pleasant things in life. Yeah. Like that little redhead up front? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I was just kind of... Uh-oh. Uh I have a feeling we've been through all this before. You're right. Well, uh... Shall we have a game of cards, Walt? <laughs> Rick 
Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. This is Bill Foreman speaking. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Makers of Camel Cigarettes present Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. What cigarette do you smoke, doctor? That question was asked of doctors in every branch of medicine, doctors in all parts of the country. What cigarette do you smoke, doctor? The brand name most was Camel. Yes, according to this recent nationwide survey, more doctors smoke Camels than any other cigarette. Make your own Camel 30-day test, the sensible cigarette test, and see how mild, how flavorful, how thoroughly enjoyable Camels are. Here transcribed is Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Mr. Diamond, come in, sir. Well, thank you, Francis. How's the pantry Einstein tonight? Oh, oh my goodness, sir. That was a dandy. Oh, you like that, huh? Oh, yes, sir. Well, <laughs> chuckle along and tell Miss Asher sweet and frostbitten is downstairs. Right away, sir. I'll be in the study. Yes, sir. The snow is snowing. The wind is blowing. But I can weather the storm. Why do I care how much it may storm? I've got my love to keep me warm. Hi. Hi. What's new? Nothing with me. I want to know about you. Uh, nothing much with me either, honey. What have you been doing for the last couple of days? Mm, case. Oh. Got a nice big fat retainer. Oh. Yeah, oh. Look at the eyes light up. Well, I'm happy for you. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't want your money. But now that I'm independently wealthy, you figure you don't have to feed me anymore. Rick. Don't have to take me to any more shows. 
Stake me to an occasional chocolate malt. Oh, don't be silly. You know I don't mind. Just because I made a couple of hundred dollars. A couple of hundred dollars? Stop kissing my hand. Rick. You idiot. Mm. I have tickets for the ballet tomorrow night. Dinner at 21 after the show. Oh, Rick. <laughs> Afterwards, we nick. I love you. Of course. Now, I suppose you want to hear all about the case. Well, not unless you want to. Well, as long as it's optional... If you're too tired, some other time. It all started three days ago. You don't really have to. I can hear about it any time. I was sitting in my office. You don't have to put yourself oh, up. Oh, shut up, woman. <laughs> as I was saying, the whole thing started three days ago. I was sitting in my office reading Gaylord Hauser and soaking my feet in a tub of blackstrap molasses when the door opened and then walked six feet of mink cape wrapped around five and a half feet of what little girls are made of. I remember thinking about the sugar and spice and everything nice... And even with a mink cape covering most of it, I decided that this little girl could have given a bee farm a nervous breakdown. Mr. Diamond? You have been reading the sign on the door. I'd like to hire you. Well, I'd like you to. I charge a hundred a day in expenses. I want protection. From what? My husband. What's the matter? Can't he stand the pace? He's getting out of prison at five o'clock this afternoon, and he's threatened to make trouble. I think you better tell me the whole thing, Miss... Uh, uh, Connors. Marilyn Connors. Uh, okay. Uh, who's your husband? His name's Joe Connors. Oh... You know him? Helped send him up ten years ago. Armed robbery, wasn't it? Yes. He hasn't served all of his time, but he's being paroled. Go ahead. Well, since Joe was sent up, I had to find work. A man Joe used to work for gave me a job in his club. Martin Cope? Yes. Do you know him? Mm, slightly. We're hating acquaintances. Mr. Cope has been very wonderful to me. I'm sure he has. I don't think I like that. Your husband doesn't either, huh? You're very blunt, aren't you? Like the front of a streetcar. I don't like your boss, and I don't like your husband. I think it's better that you know now before you make any investments and then have to fire me. You're the best private detective in New York. Only because I'm brilliant, shrewd, and loaded with talent. <laughs> and a little ridiculous. <laughs> oh, sure. Add that on and just think what you're getting for a lousy hundred a day in expenses. Even though you don't like Joe and Mr. Cope, you'll still take the job? Look, uh, Mrs. Connors, I I've been honest with you about your husband and Cope. I never let personalities interfere in my business. A job's a job. Besides, I'm starving to death. She gave me a slow smile, complete with a high fever, handed me a retainer, and swayed out of the office like Mata Hari leaving an atomic research stag party. We agreed to meet again at four o'clock, so I spent the next hour on the roof, relaxing in three feet of snow, and around four o'clock, walked my frozen blood pressure down to Martin Cope's nightclub, the only king-size safe decorated by Bergdorf Goodman, complete with an intellectual piano player, a $15 minimum, and enough intrigue to make a Senate investigation look like a taffy pole. The girl who had been to my office earlier was standing on the edge of the empty dance floor rehearsing a song while the piano player was trying his best to overdo the accompaniment. I grabbed a chair and sat down to listen. If you'd like to do a single, why don't you say so? You're unhappy? When you're playing for me, I would appreciate it if you just backed me up quietly, simply. Stop hating Art Tatum. Darling, I'd be happy to do anything you say except for one thing. Yes? You can't sing. Why, you anemic excuse for a musician. You couldn't get a song right if you ran it through a player piano. Temper, darling. You listen to me, Bernie. I've put up with you for a long time. You've put up with me? Yes, with you. Oh, I've let you mess me up night after night. You did that all by your little lonesome, honey. You just better remember who's paying your bills, honey. I get out here and break my neck to try and give a good show. Don't you get cute with me. You better wise up, Buster, or you're going to end up playing for your meals down on Skid Row. Oh, for Pete's sake, Marilyn. No, Bernie, I'm... They kept going round and round. And about the time the piano player looked like he might possibly throw caution to the wind and stamp his foot, a door opened at the other side of the room, and Martin Cope, big-time gambler and owner of the club, walked over to the piano. Look, if you two insist on raising the roof, take it to the back room where nobody can hear you. I'm sorry, Martin, but Bernie just won't... Mr. Cope, I can assure you that it wasn't... You I stay was... out of this. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, I'm sorry. You two can kick the walls in when I'm not in my office, but honey, when I've got work to it do... It won't happen again. What's the matter? Who's that? Who? Sitting over there. Well, I'm surprised, Cope. I thought you'd spot my blue eyes. Oh, it's Mr. Diamond. Diamond? Yes, he, he says you know each other. You mean Diamond, the private detective? Sure. 
You remember, Cope, all those times down at the precinct, playing 20 questions. What are you doing here? I got tired of talking to nice people. Beat it. I asked Mr. Diamond here, Martin. You did? Well, I know you're not worried about Joe, but I am. And you had this two-bit gum shoot? Temper, temper. Mr. Diamond's supposed to be the best private detective in the business. Says who? Well, I did mention it a few hundred times. Did Sloan put you up to this, honey? Martin, with Joe getting out this afternoon... I told I... you not to worry about Joe. Did Sloan tell you to hire yourself a bodyguard? He thought it would be a good idea. He did, huh? Everybody's got a good idea. Nobody thinks I know what I'm doing. I just happen to run the place. Sloan was thinking about you, Martin. Yeah, but I'll give him something to really think about. Now, Martin... No, I'm you... tired of the whole mess. Everybody's scared stiff of a two-bit punk who's getting out of stir. Hiring an ex-cop who couldn't protect an old lady from a boy scout. Have you been tested for rabies lately? Look, Diamond... Martin, I'm afraid of what Joe might do. Oh, but hiring a private cop and to top it off, you got to pick this one. Look, uh, uh, Mrs. Connors... I don't want to cause a lot of trouble. Well, you're trying real hard. Maybe you'd better just take your retainer and we'll forget the whole thing. That is the only bright thing you've ever come up with, Mr. Diamond. How about it, uh, Mrs. Connors? Well, you keep the retainer, Mr. Diamond, but maybe under the circumstances it would be better... Sure, we... keep the money, Diamond. Go buy yourself a new joke book. I don't want it, but I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll donate it to your restaurant's hospital fund, Cope. We haven't got one. <laughs> That's the trouble with you, Cope. No vision. You should always have a little insurance in case of a bad accident. I left the club with Martin Cope, stretched out on the dance floor, and Marilyn Connors looking too startled to say much. Bernie, the piano player, accompanied my exit with a fast course of the funeral march, and I headed for my quiet little apartment. I napped for the rest of the afternoon... And by 8 o'clock, I was appropriately dressed in my best blue suit. The other one being a casual sienna and suitable only for badminton and grunion hunting. I had paused to admire myself, surreptitiously humming a few bars of temptation when, uh... Yeah? Richard Diamond? Depends on who wants him. My name's Sloan, William Sloan. Oh, uh, I'm Diamond. What can I do for you? I'm here because Miss Marilyn Connors asked me to come by and talk to you. Well, come in. Thank you. I believe Martin Cope mentioned your name earlier this afternoon. In all probability, he did. I'm Mr. Cope's attorney. I have a seat. Thank you. Cope uh, seemed a little unhappy with you, Sloan. That was because I suggested that Marilyn hire herself a private detective. I gathered as much. I picked you because of your reputation. I had no way of knowing that Martin didn't like you. Why are you here, Mr. Sloan? To ask you to go back on the job. Protect Marilyn until we're sure that her husband is not going to cause trouble. I'd like to know something, Mr. Sloan. Why do you expect Marilyn's husband to cause trouble? Isn't it obvious? Maybe I'm a little dense. Why, but... Marilyn and Martin Cope have been in love since Joe Connors was sent to prison. You think that's enough to make Joe Connors try something? Well, it uh, goes a little deeper than that. How deep? Joe Connors used to work for Martin. Oh, yeah. Now, wait a minute. I'm beginning to remember... Joe Connors swore Cope had him framed. That's correct. He swore that when he got out, he'd get him. Well, it's a little tough under the circumstances. It'll just cause another argument between Cope and Marilyn if I show up again. Why don't you get yourself another boy? A lot of good private detectives in New York. Because you'd be about the only one who wouldn't be afraid of Martin. And uh, Marilyn has a great respect for you. Even after I belted her boyfriend? Well, I think that convinced her you were the one for the job. Hmm. Joe Connors got out this afternoon, didn't he? That's right, at 4.30. Where's Mrs. Connors? At the club. Well, if I go down there, there's going to be more trouble. Martin went out about an hour ago. That's why we want you to come down. Martin got a phone call. He seemed worried. Marilyn was in the office with him. She said that when he left, he didn't say where he was going, but uh, he took his gun with him. Sloan and I went downstairs, climbed into his car, and headed for Martin Cope's nightclub. When we went in, Marilyn Connors was on stage. So we went to the back of the building and sat down in her dressing room. About ten minutes later, Marilyn came in. She was wearing something thin enough to make a silkworm come into Harry Carey. Hello, William. Mr. Diamond, I'm so glad you reconsidered. I think we both reconsidered, didn't we? Has Martin come back yet? I'll go see. I'll be right back. I'm worried, Mr. Diamond. Uh, how long ago did Cope leave? About half an hour before I went on. If you'll excuse me, I have to take off my makeup. Oh, sure, go right ahead. He's back. Martin? Yes, and I'm sure something's happened. He's worried sick about something. I'll go see him. Uh, Mrs. Connors. Yes? 
Uh, do you want me to stay? No, no, I, I don't think that would be a good idea. Why don't you go over to my apartment and wait? It's 48 West 74th Street, number three. It's a walk-up. All right. Wait, you'll need a key. Here. She handed me her key and left with William Sloan. I walked out of the club, grabbed a cab, and 20 minutes later, I was walking upstairs to her apartment. The room was in darkness. I felt around for a light switch near the door. Then I froze. The room was still and quiet, but there was a smell in the air, a heavy pungent odor that a gun leaves after it's been fired. The smell was cordite. I flipped the switch on and looked down at the dead body of Joe Connors, lying on his back, shot through the head. Before we continue with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, here's an important question. How mild can a cigarette be? One sniff won't tell you. One puff won't tell you. It takes day in, day out smoking to judge the mildness of a cigarette, to see how well it gets along with your throat. Make the sensible cigarette test, the thorough cigarette test. Smoke only camels for 30 days, and you'll know how mild camels are. Pack after pack, week after week. Yes, for 30 days, enjoy the rich, full flavor of Camel's costly tobaccos and see just how mild a cigarette can be. In a coast-to-coast test of hundreds of people who smoked only Camel's for 30 days, noted throat specialists reported not one single case of throat irritation due to smoking Camel's. Make your own Camel 30-day test, the sensible test. And see for yourself why more people smoke camels than any other cigarette. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the camel 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke camels and see. And now back to Richard Diamond starring Dick Powell. Who is it? The police. Oh, goody. Otis. Yeah? You're standing on my foot. Oh, sorry, Lieutenant. Well, good evening, Lieutenant Levinson. Who's dead, Diamond? Right over there. Name's Joe Connors. Shot in the head, Lieutenant. Well, Otis is getting brighter. Who did it? How do I know? Whose apartment is this? Uh, Mrs. Marilyn Connors. Same name as the dead man. No, his name's Joe. Oh, I mean the last name. Look, meathead. Well, it is. Well, he's right, Walt. They were married. What are you doing here? Me? Well, I come with you. Oh, Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, what are you doing here, Diamond? Well, Marilyn Connors asked me to wait for her. And let's all wait. Walt, Walt, have you noticed all the windows are locked? So it's cold out. Well, let's not wait. Let's go over to Martin Cope's nightclub. What's Martin Cope got to do with it? Leave orders here until the coroner arrives. Put a tag on him so the coroner will be sure to get the right body, and I'll tell you about the whole thing on the way over to the club. Lieutenant Levinson to see you, Martin. Oh, hello, Lieutenant. Hi. What are you doing here, Diamond? He's with me, Cope. You own a gun? What is this? He said, do you own a gun? Yeah, so what? Mind if I look at it? Okay. It's loaded. Let's see. Hmm, been fired. You're nuts. Rick. Has been. What is this? I haven't fired that gun since I owned it. You took it out of here with you, didn't you? What's that to you, Diamond? You took it out tonight, didn't you? Don't answer that, Martin. Now look. Let's go down to the station. What for? Martin, you knew Joe Connors, didn't you? Yeah. Well, somebody shot him. You think I... Martin... Don't say any more. Well, I'm surprised it's you, Sloan. You were the one who told me Martin took the gun with him. You did? How the devil did I know Diamond would go to the police? What were you doing with Diamond anyway? Marilyn hired him. And fired him? She hired him again tonight. He was working for her. Anything I told him was in confidence. Murder just isn't confidential, Sloan. Look, uh... Wait a minute, Jim. 
Yeah, you're right. I, I went out to see Joe Connors. He, he phoned me. Martin. I didn't kill him, though. Yeah, I took my gun, but I didn't use it. He was dead when I got there. You went to Marilyn Connors' apartment? That's right. Well, let's all go down to the station and have ballistics check on this gun. And in the meantime, Cope, I'm holding you on suspicion of murder. <laughs> Well, here's the ballistics report, Rick. Cope's gun was the one that did the job. Slug they took out of Connor's match. Hmm. Now let's talk to Marilyn Connors and Sloan again. Why, we've got our boy. Just want to talk to them. Send in Miss Connors and Mr. Sloan. Now what have you got on your mind, Rick? Oh, I was just thinking about all the windows being locked. So what? You want to see us, Lieutenant? Mr. Diamond does. Have a chair. Mr. Diamond, I'm sorry things worked out this way. Well, so am I. Oh, uh, here's your apartment key. Thank you. How many people have a key to your apartment, Mrs. Connor? What? Martin has the only other one. Mm hmm. What time did Martin get that phone call? Oh, about 7 30, I guess. I got to the club about 7 15. Martin usually comes in about 7 30. I met him in his office and he got the call. And he took the gun and left right away? Uh, it's all right. Uh, Martin has already admitted taking the gun. Yes, he took the gun and left almost immediately. Mm -hmm. Where were you, Sloan? At home. I got to the club just after Martin left. Marilyn told me what had happened, and I came right over to you. Oh. Well, all right. Thank you very much. Hmm. That's all? Are you going to defend Mr. Cope? I doubt it. I don't think he wants me to. Well, thank you very much. We'll be talking to you. Goodbye, Lieutenant. Mr. Diamond. So long. Goodbye. Goodbye. Now, what was all that about? I want to talk to Martin Cope. Rick, now look. I we... want to talk to him. I want to find out how Joe Connors got into a locked apartment without a key. I don't want anything to do with you, Diamond. You better cooperate. Diamond's got an angle that's worth listening to. I didn't shoot Connors no matter what that ballistics report says. You have a key to Maryland's apartment. Yeah. Connors was dead when you got there. Yeah, I told you that. You left the club about a quarter of eight. That's right, about a quarter of eight. Connors had been dead about three hours when I found him, Walt. I found him about 9.30. By gosh, that's right. And that, uh, that part of your story stands up, Cope. He, he was dead when you got there. What about the gun? You always keep that gun in your desk, Cope? Yeah. Who was in the club with you? Oh, the usual people. Waiter, bartenders, busboys. Marilyn? Yeah. And now, wait a minute. Uh, who knew you kept the gun in the desk? Oh, half a dozen people, maybe. You think somebody lifted that gun, killed Connors, and put it back in the desk? You always come in about 7.30, don't you, Cobe? Yeah, every night. According to the death certificate, Connors had been dead about an hour before you came in. What time did you leave the club this afternoon? Right after you slugged me. Oh, you got up rather suddenly. It was about 4.30, wasn't it? Somebody could have gone into your office, taken that gun, killed Connors, put the gun back before you came in at 7.30. Then I'm cleared? No, 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 not a bit. You have a key to Marilyn's apartment. The killer had a key to let Connors in. Miss Connors said there were only two keys. Well, Walt, let's go talk to Mrs. Connors. Uh, Mrs. Connors, where were you around 7 this evening? 7? Where were you? Why, downtown. You weren't in your apartment? No. Did you come back from downtown before going to the club? No. Well, who was in your apartment? Why, no one that I know of. Have you ever given your key to anyone except Cope and, uh, oh, me, of course? Yes. Who and how long ago? My piano player, about a week ago. Hello, Bernie. Hello. Oh, hello. You're the nice man who slugged Mr. Cope this afternoon. Let me buy you a drink. Oh, uh, no, thanks, Bernie. This is Lieutenant Levinson. Lieutenant? Hi. Uh, what time did you get the club this evening, Bernie? Oh, about 7.30. Why? The cook says he saw you come in around 7.15. Mm, Fifteen minutes, one way or the other. Where were you at 7 o'clock, Bernie? My house, I guess. Mm, Bernie... Bernie, we checked with the state prison. They, uh, they censor letters up there. Do they? Mm-hmm. A man named Joe Connors got a letter two days ago telling him to meet someone at Mrs. Connors' apartment around 6.30 this evening. Hmm. What's this all about? 
Well, we'd like to have you come down to the station for a paraffin test, Bernie. A paraffin test? Yeah, we can determine if anyone has shot a gun in the last 48 hours. Oh. When did you take Mr. Cope's gun, Bernie? Right after he left this afternoon. You had a duplicate key made from the one Mrs. Connors gave you several days ago? Mm-hmm. Uh, the green hardware shop, I believe, over on 64th Street. Why'd you do it? Oh, love, hate, lots of reasons. What difference does it make? For a week now, I've heard him talking about Joe Connors and what he might do when he got out. I saw a chance to get rid of Martin Cope, so I had the key made, wrote Joe Connors a letter, and killed him with Mr. Cope's gun. After you killed Connors, you came back, put the gun back in the drawer, and when Martin Cope came in, you called him and said you were Connors. From that phone booth right over there. Were you in love with Marilyn Connors? That is an extremely earthy question that can do no good at all. Well, let's go, Lieutenant. I was getting tired of playing the piano anyway. It's too bad it didn't work. Think what Marilyn Connors in for when she marries Martin Cope. Oh, speaking of Marilyn Connors, you certainly did take a lot of pains describing her um, her attributes. Oh, really? Well, it wasn't painful at all. Was she really that pretty? Pretty, pretty. Well, I'm jealous. Well, don't be. She had one thing that was wrong. What was that? She had long blonde hair that hung all the way down to the floor. Well, that sounds beautiful. But it was her mustache. Uh, better sing something, huh? I think you'd better. Mm. What would you like? Anything that will make up for that last remark. I thought it was pretty clever. Just sing. Okay. How about this? Maybe I'm right And maybe I'm wrong Maybe I'm weak and maybe I'm strong, but nevertheless I'm in love with you. Maybe I'll win, and maybe I'll lose. Maybe I'm in for crying the blues, but nevertheless I'm in love. With you Somehow I know at a glance The terrible chances I'm taking Fine at the start But left with a heart that is breaking Maybe I live a life of regret And maybe I'll give Much more than I'll get But nevertheless I'm in love With you Oh, that's better mm, Thank you Rick hmm? I'll bet she really did have pretty hair Oh, I guess so But she kept it all rolled up on her head What's the matter with that? Well, I like yours better. I wear mine up. Yeah. But I've seen you with your hair down. <laughs> Rick. Come here. Rick? Dick Powell will return in just a minute. More people smoke camels than any other cigarette. Yes, more people smoke camels than any other cigarette. Among the millions of camel smokers, there are many stars whose voices are their fortunes. John Wayne, Reza Stevens, Martha Tilton are a few. They find that camels' cool, cool mildness gets along fine with their throats. Friends, make your own 30-day camel mildness test and see why more people smoke camels than any other cigarette. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the camel 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke camels and see. 
Here's Dick Powell with a special message. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, no one deserves the appreciation of the American people more than the men and women who have served in our armed forces. The Camel people send weekly gifts of cigarettes to those servicemen and veterans who are hospitalized. This week's Camels go to Veterans Hospital, Martinsburg, West Virginia, and Carl Gables, Florida. U.S. Army Station Hospital, Camp Hood, Texas. U.S. Naval Hospital, Chelsea, Massachusetts. Now, until next week, enjoy camels. I always do. Tonight's adventure of Richard Diamond, starring Dick Powell, was written by Blake Edwards. Our director is Helen Mack. Pipe smokers, enjoy the national joy smoke, Prince Albert. Yes, P.A. is made from choice tobacco, rich tobacco that's naturally flavorsome. Prince Albert is specially treated to ensure against tongue bite and crimped cut for smooth smoking. So get P.A. in the handy pocket tin or the pound size. It's America's largest selling smoking tobacco. Listen next week for another exciting transcribed adventure of Richard Diamond, starring Dick Powell. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the FBI, follows immediately. Stay tuned. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the American Broadcasting Company. Makers of Camel Cigarettes present Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. One puff won't tell you. One sniff won't tell you. It takes day in, day out smoking to find out how mild a cigarette is, how well it agrees with your throat. Make the sensible cigarette test, the 30-day camel mildness test, and see just how mild a cigarette can be. Yes, and you'll find out why more people smoke camels than any other cigarette. transcribed is Richard Diamond starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency, the Milton Burl of Homicide. Pretty bad. Oh, hi, Helen. What are you doing? Playing canasta. Who's there? Well, just me and that Japanese beetle I found hiding in my bills. Japanese beetle? Yeah. And you're playing canasta? Well, what do you expect us to do? I'm tired. He just finished giving me my judo lesson. Mm Mm-hmm. I don't think you believe me. Oh, sure I do. Who's winning? I am. He can't speak English. Besides, I make up the rules. Mm Mm-hmm. Am I going to see you tonight? Well, I... You what? I don't know. Something just came into my office. Client? I don't know. Here comes another one. One what? Beats me, but they're pretty strange. Hey, uh, where'd you leave your saucer, fellas? Maybe they're shills for the beetle. I'll call you back. Bye. Bye. Well, uh, what can I do for it? Hey, wait a minute. I don't want I should break his jaw by accident. Mm. Ah, such a nice man. You are so considerate. Mm. I would be happy to hold your nooks for yourself, though. 
Diamond. 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 He is very out. Well, here, Salvador, try this pitch of water. Oh, wait, I'll remove the gladiolus. <laughs> I felt as if I was lying in the middle of a crowded sink and someone had piled all the dishes on my head. They turned on the faucet and I floated up with a dirty coffee cup and took a look around. I treaded water and squinted through my dewy eyelids at two of the ugliest dishwashers I had ever seen. Look! He's twitching! Mm, oh. <laughs> you see, Salvador, is just a little lazy. How do you feel, Diamond? Oh, let us know when things start making sense. Oh, oh, not, uh, what's going on? What happened? He's confused. Yeah. Uh, I think maybe you sapped him too hard. Oh. Yuki, I take that as an insult. You know how careful I am. I apologize, Salvador. Thank you. Hey, hey uh, how, how'd you monkeys get in here anyway? Well, it sounds like he's collected most of his marbles. <laughs> Looks like a complete recovery, Yuki. I want to know what this is all about. Oblige the man, Salvador. Sure. But keep him with us. <laughs> Naturally. Hey, now, wait a minute. Oh. That's enough, Salvador. That's enough. <laughs> Can you hear me, Diamond? Eh, it's going to be obstinate. I don't think he likes it. Belt him across the ears. He'll listen. Can you hear me now, Diamond? He's nodding his head. I guess he don't want to open his mouth and let the blood out. Oh, that's fine. Now, listen, Diamond. In a while, you'll get a call from a Mr. Wharton. He'll offer you a job, but you will not take it. Do you understand? Salvador, please, see if he understands. <laughs> He says, yeah, he mm. understands. But now he's got a sore arm. Uh, remember, Mr. Wharton, you don't want to work for him. I think he understands, Yuki. Yeah. But he looks tired from the strain. He certainly does. Look at those dark circles under his eyes. Well, put the man asleep, Salvador. Certainly. Night. <laughs> Mr. Diamond? Mr. Diamond, can you hear me, Mr. Diamond? Oh, 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 this can get monotonous. Go away, will you? Should I call the police, Mr. Diamond? What? Oh, oh I was expecting uglier company. Can you sit up? Oh, I'll take a crack at it. <clears throat> oh, I, uh, I'll bet your name's Wharton. Oh, that's right. How did you know? Get out of here. Well, I want to talk to you. Well, I just had one long conversation. It was too one-sided. Now, go on. My health is doubtful, but it's fun to have it around for company. Maybe $500 would pick you up. Yeah, it might for a while, but I don't like to waste that kind of money on funerals. Seven fifty. dollars yeah, so they line the coffin with velvet. A thousand. Well, you're beginning to make a short life sound practical. If you do the job successfully, there'll be another thousand. You just bought yourself a corpse. Let me wash up. Uh, talk some more. I, I can hear you. Well, it's my son, Roger. He thinks he killed a man. He, he thinks? What do you want me to do? Find out for sure so he can brag about it? Ever heard of a John Alter? Oh, sure. Walt Levinson sent him up five years ago on a manslaughter rap. Well, he doesn't like it up there, and he'd like to get out. I don't blame him. What's this got to do with your son? I'm chairman of the parole board. Yeah. You look much better now, Mr. Diamond. So you're chairman of the parole board. Yes. Some of Alter's friends promised to keep quiet about my son if I let Alter go free when he comes up before the board next week. Uh huh. You think maybe your son was framed? Yes. About a month ago, he met a girl in Florida. Her name is Lenore Brown, and she's a friend of Alter's. When Roger went to pick up the Lenore girl at her apartment, he found her struggling with some man. Mm, that happens. It looked like he was trying to kill her. There was a gun on the floor, and she called to Roger for help. He picked up the gun and shot the man. She told Roger he'd killed him and that he must get out. 
When we went back, they were both gone. About a month later, some of Alter's friends got in touch with me. They forget about the killing if you let Alter out of Sing Sing, huh? That's right. Hmm. Well, I don't remember reading anything about it in the papers. You're the first one outside of Alter and his friends who knows anything about it. You see, they say they're hiding the corpus delecti, so there was no report of the murder. Now, you think maybe they staged the killing, put blanks in the gun, and after your son beat it, the dead man walked out under his own steam? Well, that's what I want you to find out. Uh-huh. The man your son thought he killed, uh, what did he look like? Dark man with a scar from his nose to his chin. Mm -hmm. If my son is innocent, I want you to bring the parties responsible to justice. Amen. Well, here's a check for $1,000. Thank you. If you find the girl and prove my son innocent, there'll be another 1000 in your pocket. Well, I'll sew up the holes. Thanks, Mr. Warden. I'll start right away. Goodbye, Mr. Diamond. You can reach me at the Wentworth Hotel. I'm staying there until this matter gets cleared up. Well, I won't get in touch with you unless I find something. The guys who worked me over are pretty set in their ways, and there's no sense in you tripping over a lot of dead bodies. I grabbed a pack of camels, looked at the $1,000 check, thought about the warning the two bruise artists had given me, and decided it was a toss-up. If I spent the thousand like I knew I would, I'd wish it was dead anyway. So I left the building, grabbed a cab for the 5th Precinct. Ten minutes later, I walked into the squad room and spotted Sergeant Otis, looking like an advertisement for a sour stomach. Well, Richard Diamond, Private Sloot. Well, Sergeant Otis, Private Sloth. Huh? Well, look it up. S-L-O-T-H. I will. Under S. I know. The three-toed variety. And get your uniform press, won't you? Looks like you've been hanging it in a taffy machine. Oh. Well, hello, Rick. I... Hey, you must get tired changing your face every day. Somebody shove you around again? Oh, I've been catching up on my patty cake. Tell me, Walter, do you ever know a girl named Lenore Brown? Yeah, sure. John Alter's expense account. They used to hold hands before I sent him up. Know where I can find her? Alter's still got her staked out. When he gets out, he's going to come back and dig up the claim. You better forget about it. She's got the antidote for lonely nights, but some of Alta's boys are protecting it. I know, I know. They gave me a pep talk this afternoon. Then listen to him. It's better watching the game from the bench. Oh, uh, you never can tell. I might make a score. Well, you're outweighed, outclassed, and liable to be outlived. But she used to work at the Black Swan in Florida. We heard Alder was trying to get a parole, and she came to New York to be close to him. Any line on her here in town? No, but if she's seeing Alter, you might spot her on a visitor's day. Well, Rick, how are you? It's been a long time. I know a lot of people wouldn't like to hear that, Warden. <laughs> how are you? Oh, fine, fine. What's on your mind? Well, I hear Johnny Alter's been having company. I'd like to take a look at her. Oh, Miss Brown. Mm-hmm. Well, I can't blame you. <laughs> well, I just want to spot her and see where she goes. <laughs> you can't miss. If she walked through the yard, there'd be a jailbreak tomorrow. What time are visiting hours? Well, if she's seeing Alter today, she should be downstairs right now. Like to take a look? Uh-huh. I'll have a guard take you down. Good. Well, well on uh, second thought, I'll go myself. She is, sitting at the end table, talking to Alder. Hmm. Well, now I know why Alder needs a lot of money. She's wearing enough mink to carpet Radio City. <laughs> you should get a load of her on a warm day. Huh? Well, the coat doesn't stop me. She'd show up, she was wearing a tent. How long has she got with Alder? Mm, about another five minutes. Warden, you know, uh, maybe I'll let you put me away for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. With something like that to look forward to on Visitor's Day, I might go for the change. <laughs> You'd get tired of just talking. I hung around by the big gray buildings until she came out. She walked over to a long white convertible and got in. I decided to let her buy me a new fuse, so I walked over to the car. Uh, going into town? Oh. Back up three feet and I'll let you know. Oh. Three. Okay. Mm-hmm. 
Your tailor couldn't do all of that. Get in. Visiting? Oh, yeah, the, uh, the warden's an old friend. How many years did you know him? Uh-uh, baby. I've been going home every night all my life. Every night? Well, uh, almost. What do you do with the, uh, almost? It depends. Everybody likes something different. You must get tired thinking up new ideas. Oh, I don't think much. It's more fun being surprised. Hey, what's the idea? Surprise. Oh, yeah. And a nickel-plated one. Look, baby, you don't have to pull a gun. If I'm getting fresh, I'll get out and walk. You'll sit right there, Diamond. Name dropper? Mm-hmm. Expecting company? Mm-hmm. And you've met them before, honey. Well, it's nice. I wouldn't want you to get stuck with the introduction. Hey, uh, those your friends driving up? It should be. Now you hold real still. They'll only shoot you this time. When a gal's got a gun, you don't stand much of a chance unless she's got her mind on something else. This one did. And when she looked up in the rearview mirror to make sure it was her boys, I tagged her. My two playmates were just pulling up and I jumped out of the car. There he is, Yuki! He's struggling off. She's out cold. Well, shoot him, Salvador. Shoot him! Before we continue with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, here are a few words about smoking enjoyment. More people smoke camels than any other cigarette. Yes, more people smoke camels than any other cigarette. One reason is flavor. Camels' costly tobaccos have a rich, full flavor you won't find in any other cigarette. Another reason is mildness, proven mildness. In a coast-to-coast -coast test of hundreds of people who smoked only camels for 30 days, noted throat specialists reported not one single case of throat irritation due to smoking camels. Make your own camel 30-day test. The sensible, thorough test. Not just a sniff of the tobacco. Not just a puff of smoke. Only by day-in, day-out smoking can you discover how well a cigarette agrees with your throat. Smoke camels for 30 days and see how mild camels are pack after pack, week after week. See why more people smoke camels than any other cigarette. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the camel 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke camels and see. And now, back to Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. There he goes! Get him, Salvador! I was running through the trees then, and I could hear Salvador somewhere behind me, falling all over himself. I pulled my gun and thought about waiting for him. But I had another idea. I stopped and listened. He's around here somewhere, Suki. Well, come on, we're spread out, Salvador. They were somewhere behind me, and both of them were looking now. So I cut off to my left and headed back to the highway. The cars were about 100 yards down the road, and I used my last lung getting there. Lenore was still unconscious, so I climbed in the white convertible with the unconscious nylons and drove off. <laughs> I'd been driving for about 15 minutes when I noticed something lying on the seat beside the still-sleeping Lenore. It was her purse, and she didn't wake up when I grabbed it. Doing a rummage job at 80 miles an hour isn't easy, but there wasn't much of interest anyway, just a little black book. I needed a gimmick, so I stuck it in my pocket. I put the purse back on the seat just as she started coming around. Well, now that's it, baby. Sit up and look at the scenery. How did you get here? Where's Yuki and Salvador? Playing Peter Pan. Jaw hurt? Yes. You heal. Well, play rough and you get hurt. Where do I take you? My apartment, I guess. I drove her to her place on East 51st and walked her to the door. 
She looked at me like a fat woman eyeing a French pastry, and her mouth slipped down to her shoelaces when I gave her a peck on the cheek and left her standing with an old front doorknob in her hand. I went back to the office and took out her little black book. There were a lot of names, and some of them I knew. Yuki, and after it, likes his work. And Salvador, and after his name, has own gun. And oh yes, yes, Richard Diamond, too. I never did figure out what the three stars were for, but three other names and addresses put me in second gear. One was in the village, another down by the East River, and the last was somewhere in Chinatown. All of them were a setup for a dead man who wanted to make himself scarce. I wanted to talk with Wharton to, before I started hunting, so I called him at the Wentworth. Did you find out anything yet, Diamond? Uh, not yet. Look, Mr. Wharton, you said the man I was looking for was... Was dark with a scar, hmm? Yes, from his nose to his chin. Well, thanks. Maybe I'll call you tomorrow. I hope you clear this thing up in a hurry. Well, so do I. I want to get my nerves untangled. I took the easy address first, grabbed a cab, and 30 minutes later, I was walking down the steps of a shabby little dive on the east side of Greenwich Village. You want something, Mac? Yeah, a pound of egg noodles. Just sweep them up off the floor. Hey, uh, you know anyone around named Lenore? Sure, Lenore Brown. She comes in here about once a week, listens to the kid at the piano. And why would a classy dame like that go out with him? He don't play the piano so good. You ever see a guy with her? A man with a scar from his nose to his chin? No, she always does a single. Oh, well, thanks. You've been swell. <laughs> I walked out, got back in the cab, and marked off Greenwich Village in the little black book. The second address, down by the East River. The night was black, and the fog had rolled in, staked out a claim all the way to the Hudson. I stopped cold, looked down at two gleaming eyes like two pieces of polished glass shining in the glare of the dim street lamp. Steady, boy, steady. Steady. Hold it, Lucifer. Yeah. Yeah, hold it, Lucifer. He won't hurt you, mister, unless I tell him to. Well, think about it for a while, will you? I'm a poor substitute for horse meat. What do you want? Do you know a Lenore Brown? You a cop? Shamus. Beat it, Lucifer. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, pal. I couldn't hold my breath much longer. You can come on up on the porch. You're looking for Lenore Brown, huh? Yeah, you know her? I met her. My wife works for her. Is your wife in? Yeah. Esther, come here. Some private dick wants to talk to you. She's Miss Brown's private maid. Yes? Uh, your husband tells me you work for Miss Brown. Yeah, what's she done? She got many friends. Man friends? Yeah. Oh, uh, you know a man with a scar? Sure, I know lots of them. What are you talking about, woman? I met someone who Miss Brown knows. What did you mean by that, mister? Look, I really don't know anybody with a scar now. You better beat it. Yeah, get moving. And I want to talk to you, woman. Get in there. Yes, honey. I knew she was going to get bruised, but he looked rough enough to cut my windpipe, and I wanted some place to pour my coffee down in the morning. So I got out of there fast and headed for the last address in the little black book. The place was on one of those narrow, dark streets that looked like the inside of a grave. The sign above the door read Tangy, so I pushed open the door and went in. If I didn't find the man with the scar here, I was out on two strikes. It was a little restaurant on the bottom floor of a two-story building. A quiet waiter slipped up and showed me to a booth. He shoved a menu in my hand and disappeared before I could ask him anything. The place was empty except for an old couple sitting near the door. The waiter said something to them, and they looked quickly over at me, and then they left in a hurry. The room was completely empty now. Even the waiter had disappeared. I looked up at a flight of stairs at the far end of the room. A pair of very healthy ankles came into view, and they were holding up a pair of legs that ran my blood pressure up to 190 again. I eased my gun out and held it under the table. She turned the corner and started down toward my booth like a loose snake in a rabbit pen. Mind if I sit down? Well, it's, uh, it's your party. 
Shame on you. Don't you know it's not nice to pilfer a lady's handbag? Now Lenore will have to spank. Looks like the last address paid off. If you're buying shrouds, it did. Where's the guy that young Wharton was supposed to have killed? Upstairs. But he's very unsociable. Hates long conversations. I only need a couple of lines. <laughs> he can't even do that. He likes to keep on breathing. The old man figures Alter framed his son. He's not going to let your boyfriend out of Sing Sing until he finds the man with a scar. Think he can do it better than you did? I found him. Was it worth dying for? I don't know. I can tell you better after I talk to him. Mama's going to have to spank sooner than she expected. Come on in, boys. Well, 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 look who's here. Are Mama's two big idiots out collecting blood? Where are your buckets? He's bitter, Yuki. A peasant. <laughs> You've met Yuki and Salvador before, haven't you? Yeah, on the end of a fist. They want to show you the town. I know the beat. Well, I'll bet you've never seen it from the bottom of the East River. No, but if you'll put on a bathing suit, I might buy the idea. It's too bad we'll never make the beach together. I'd like to show you the sights. Boys, you'd better help Mr. Diamond out of the booth. I think he's stuck. You know how it is. Boys like to keep moving. Sure. And so do I. <laughs> I shot once and caught Yuki in the stomach, and I dumped the table over on Salvador. He grabbed like he was going to waltz with it and went down on his back. I didn't have to get up. I just shot him through the table. Lenore was out of the booth fast and running for the stairs. Look out, Tony! Tony, look out! I caught up with her at the foot of the stairs, and she started up. I saw him standing on the upper landing, scar and all. All meaning gun in his hand. He missed me, but nailed her halfway up. She spun around and fell all over me. With both of us down, he was in a good spot to finish the job, but my arm hit the lower post of the staircase and swung me right into line. I just rested my elbow on the banister and let him have it. You should have kept your nose up, mister. A bad landing washes you out. Tell me, did Wharton's son identify the man with the scar? Yeah, he was the one he thought he killed. Mm -hmm. But the old man's feeling pretty good. Yeah, just left. He's happier than Otis on payday. Mm. Who was the guy with the scar? A uh, cheap hood. Record. Name of Lucio. Mm. The girl in Alter had him hidden out in that place so he wouldn't be seen. And I... I, I don't think you're funny, Diamond. Mm, what's the matter, Otis? Yeah, what do you want, meathead? I looked it up. The three-toed variety. Uh oh what are you talking about? Oh, I uh, called him a sloth. Yeah, a sloth. You should see the picture in the dictionary. It's an animal. Well? It's funny looking with three toes on each foot. Well? And it's noted for its laziness. Okay, Lieutenant. Just forget it. Dick Powell will return in just a minute. What cigarette do you smoke, doctor? That question was asked of doctors in every branch of medicine, doctors in all parts of the country. What cigarette do you smoke, doctor? The brand name most was Camel. Yes, according to this recent nationwide survey, more doctors smoke Camels than any other cigarette. Friends, buy your Camels the handy, thrifty way by the carton. That way you always have camels when you want them. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the camel 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke camels and see. Here's Dick Powell with a special message. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the makers of camels deem it a privilege to send free cigarettes each week to hospitalized servicemen and veterans. This week's camels go to Veterans Hospitals, Topeka, Kansas, and Oakland, California. U.S. Army Percy Jones General Hospital, Battle Creek, Michigan. U.S. Naval Hospital, Portsmouth, Virginia. More than 194 million camels have now been sent to servicemen, servicewomen, and veterans. Now, until next week, enjoy camels. I always do. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the camel 30-day test.
dust and you'll see Smoke camels and see Tonight's adventure of Richard Diamond, starring Dick Powell, was written by Blake Edwards. Our director is Helen Mack. Then, for pipe smoking pleasure, get Prince Albert, the national joy smoke. Prince Albert's choice tobacco is rich and flavorsome. It's crimped cut for smooth, even burning, and specially treated to ensure against tongue bite. Yes, P.A. is America's largest selling smoking tobacco. Listen next week for another exciting transcribed adventure of Richard Diamond, starring Dick Powell. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the FBI, follows immediately. Stay tuned. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the American Broadcasting Company.